it just turned. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, today is Tuesday, May 24th, and you're at the Board of Supervisors meeting. We'll start this morning with a flag salute by Supervisor Wygant. States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Appreciate those of you in attendance today. Thanks for being with us. And I'm sure we have some on Zoom as well that I don't see. Um, we'll start with our consent agenda this morning, and do any of my colleagues want to remove any items from consent? Not seeing any here. Are there any public comments on a consent calendar item? Anybody on Zoom? On Zoom. Okay. Andrea, did you wish to pull a item from consent? I did not want to make a public comment. Is that where I, is this the area that I speak? Um, no, that'll be coming up in just a minute. We're just handling our consent calendar items and then right after that we'll go to our public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Any others, Megan? Okay, uh, then I would accept a motion to approve our consent calendar. I'll second. Okay, motion Holmes, second Gore. And this is a roll call. Gore? Aye. Wygant? Yes. Holmes? Yes. Jones? Yes. Gustafson? Aye. Okay, now we will move to public comment. Um, this is in time on our uh, agenda that we offer for the public to address us on anything related to our county business. Uh, we will allow it, uh, approximately 15 minutes this morning at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, and then we will, uh, if we have additional comment, go toward the end of the meeting and set another time. Um, so with that, uh, please understand we cannot take items, uh, take any action on the items, but we want to hear from our public. So Jen, you're here with us. Go ahead and start. And then after you, I'd like to ask oh. a council member. That's okay. You can, you stood up first. Okay. You go first. All right. Hi, my name is Jennifer, and I just wanted to kind of give a recap of things that are happening in our world today. Um, we have a diesel shortage coming up possibly. We have gas prices coming up. We probably have a new disease coming out called monkeypox that will make its way through here. Uh, food shortages are possibly gonna be coming up. Our food distribution centers are being torched and mysteriously disappearing in these extreme fires. Um, we're also fighting a war in Ukraine to protect the sex trafficking capital of our world for some reason. And all of our wheats and um, other agricultural fertilizers are being held up there, starving Europe as well as gas not getting there. So people are coming into some very serious times. So. The cool thing is, this isn't a movie. This is actually happening in real time. And here in Placer County, we have a really unique opportunity to mitigate some of these costs because we have a very large agricultural area here. So my question to the board is, what are we doing to support our agricultural people, our ag county here? Because we have the potential to feed our citizens here. Are we checking with them to make sure they have enough fertilizer? Are we making sure the canals are clean to make sure the water is going to them? What are we doing to support them? And, you know, because we have all these people here who can grow food, who have cattle, who have chickens, oh yeah, don't forget the impending bird flu coming. What are we gonna do to keep people so we're not calling millions of chickens and livestock like they're doing all over the world because they are using a faulty PCR test at this time. The PCR test they're using to establish this bird flu 
is probably just as faulty as the one that we've been using for COVID. In fact, it probably is. So I'd like also for everyone on the board to think about how they're going to handle a possible new outbreak because we saw how mismanaged this last one was. And if we're gonna continue on with this narrative, or are we gonna say no and not consent to it and move forward and live our lives? Because for some reason we wanna send money to Ukraine and not support our small businesses here in the United States. I don't understand what's happening, but I really consider and hope you consider to look past things and let us live our free lives. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Please. Good morning. Good morning. It has been a while since I had the opportunity to visit these beautiful domes. Boy, are they unique. Uh, Jill Gialdo, Rockland City Council member, and thank you for allowing me a few moments this morning. Um, I have Mayor Bill Halden is on Zoom in case there's anything I forget, he will reach from above and, and remind me and if you have any questions. Um, we are both really pleased that we are members of the ad hoc committee working to address the homeless issues that we have in Placer County and we appreciate so much having that venue so that we can share our concerns and, and ideas and get educated quite honestly. Uh, Rockland is, is fortunate that we have the lowest numbers of homeless in the county and we and uh, we always have I, I my, as you know my husband's family's been in Rockland for a little over a hundred years and um, grew up with the railroad tracks in his backyard and we had a restaurant in the laundromat so certainly we've had exposure and we've worked with our homeless community for a long time and we look forward to finding positive ways to address that I, I want to reach out to you today because we have been getting calls. Um, we have several different types of homes in Rockland that service some challenged groups. Um, in particular, though, we continually get calls on the one in Yankee Hill Estates, conveniently list, uh, directed across the street uh, from Gialdo Park. So I get to be that first name that people call because it's awful easy to remember. Um, we have had some challenges and I want to reach out to you guys today and let you know that we have met with the group and asked them that as opposed to the entire group coming here and speaking with our supervisors if um, you, they'd let us be the spokespeople and give us an opportunity to work with the county so that we can make improvements. Uh, we've had several challenging issues recently with some criminal activity. We have increased patrols from Rockland PD, especially in the mornings for when the school bus stops are out there. There's three times a day that this is service for middle, high school, and elementary. Um, we've had significant calls, so I think it's something we need to address. And what I know is that we didn't know always, and I know that you don't always get this feedback too. There's multiple jurisdictions that have, have had issues in there, and so there's not a one-stop shop. Mm -hmm. So I think um, most importantly, supervision I think needs to be addressed as quickly as we could so that we can make sure we don't have any other issues while we work on a way to make this better. So I would ask if you can make those efforts to get increased supervision on the on the home there. And then also we'd like to set up a two by two. So if we could get to, and, and I want to thank, we had our first community meeting. It, it was intended to be just a couple residents and it got a little bit larger um, as people started inviting other people. So thank you to Supervisor Holmes for coming and giving that uh, reassurance that we're on it, that we'll take care of this. So um, if we could set something up so we could have a two by two with the county um, and I think time is of the essence here I would really appreciate we could get that I think our county uh, excuse me my city manager has reached out and uh, with that I will uh, leave you to it but most importantly if we could get something said as quickly as possible I appreciate that well thank, thank you, you for, for your, your comments time. and also thank you for your service yeah we really appreciate that and uh, if Bill is on Zoom and would like to speak right now it might be a good time to take any co additional comments he has Okay, thank Mayor, Mayor Halton. Yeah, thank you, Supervisor Gustafson. Um, I, I don't have too much to add to uh, Council Member Gallaldo's comments. Um, we, we, we are, as a city, uh, concerned about, uh, about what has uh, transpired at this location, and it, uh, it has been an ongoing uh, issue. And I would, uh, we would certainly appreciate the opportunity to sit down uh, with the county to to explore that issue and uh, and solutions for it uh, at uh, your earliest convenience. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate both of your service. Thanks for being here. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. 
My name is Richard. Um, I never miss the opportunity to uh, mention that the Kool-Aid drinkers don't have the mental capacity to comprehend the concept of liberty. Uh, I submitted in August the Second Amendment Sanctuary County Resolution and I'm kind of disappointed you folks haven't voted on it yet. I mean, you can vote no if you don't like it. Um, there's uh, various red flag laws. I'm intentionally not going to elaborate here so the Kool-Aid drinkers don't get an incentive to pursue that. Um, I have a copy here. Um, of the uh, constitutional carry uh, that uh, I think is uh, important. Um, this actually probably needs to be addressed at the state level, but I just want to make you folks aware of it. Um, there's a full copy here for uh, Chairman Gustafson, and I have uh, summaries for the various other members. And so, I'd appreciate it if you would take a look at it. And I'm available to talk about anything you want to talk about. Yeah. So could I give that to you? Yes. OK, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate your comments. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Jane Haproff from Placer People of Faith Together. And I'm also here to talk about the homeless um, situation. Um, after we uh, all, after the ordinance was changed, um, we left this room feeling somewhat relieved that the issues of health and safety that were being of concern in the DeWitt campment. Um, were going to be addressed in some way in the new um, encampment that they would they would be moved to, but several issues came up, and I'm not sure where the fault lies. Whether it was poor planning or poor enactment, but we find ourselves in a situation now where the health and safety concerns are worse in the new encampment. Um, there is no potable water. There is no parking access so that um, organizations that want to deliver food, such as What Would Jesus Do, have no place to park, um, no place to deliver the services that they would like to. Um, there is also no, um, uh, only one egress from that place, uh, that the, the new encampment. And that is a, a danger if there were any kind of um, crisis, fire, anything like that. There's only one way to get out. So that needs to be addressed. Also, there, um, the porta potties, some of them do have hand sanitizers inside, but not all. And so there's a need for hand washing stations. But I think one of the biggest concerns is uh, the issue of shade. I was at the camp on Friday, and I was there at about 11.30 in the morning. It was a lovely, warm day, not exceedingly, excuse me, not exceedingly hot. And people were crowded around the one tree outside of the encampment for shade. Um, so there are several issues that are health and safety issues that are now worse than what they were at the old encampment. And we sort of looked to you as leaders of the county to address these issues, and we sort of trusted you to make this a better situation as far as health and safety are concerned. So it's with great dismay that I find myself here this morning asking what happened. How did this happen? Um, there are several other issues I'd like to bring up, including the lack of uh, storage space that was promised and has, was, has not been provided. 
Um, people have lost a lot of their own private property to this um, displacement. And so I'm asking you to look at the compassion that you promised and take a look at the camp and see what the situation is there now. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. I'm Heather Ireland, and I've been up speaking to you before. I've worked with the homeless for at least 15 years. Prior to that, I was an animal advocate, welfare advocate, and rescuer for 40 years. And the reason I bring that up is because I, too, have visited the camp on numerous occasions. And I was present the day of the move. And I saw the chaos. I saw the people who were confused about when they were to be out, where they were to go. There were people that didn't even know ahead of time where this camp was. There was nothing that was specifically posted. But what I wanted to bring up was I was at the camp again yesterday. Again, a warm day, but not an exceedingly hot day. I was there to bring much needed supplies, water, a few other things that they needed because of the unavailability of this. And what I found were, were conditions that would be considered conditions that we won't even allow for animals because there are animal welfare laws that state that animals must have access to water 24 hours a day. They must have access to shade. It is illegal to leave an animal out in the sun without access to shade or some kind of shelter and food. And yet these people have no access to water. There are people that are physically debilitated that do not have the ability to go and, you know, just walk into town and purchase water and carry the supplies back. And, um, and even for those that do have that ability, it's very difficult for them. And in the short time that I was there, I was, I was there for, oh, I'd say about an, an less, about a half an hour. I was threatened with a parking ticket simply for parking in the only place that I could find to park that wasn't, you know, down on the next block because I had heavy boxes that I had to carry myself and I'm not a very big, strong woman. So I parked there for a few minutes so I could carry the boxes in and distribute the water that is much needed and a sheriff deputy pulled up behind my car and I was threatened that if I didn't move my car immediately I would be subjected to a ticket. Now that same sheriff deputy cited the reason was that there was a fire uh, lane and yet he parked his vehicle there and he roamed around in the camp and he stayed even longer than I did. When I left I was so overcome with heat exhaustion that I couldn't even walk the block to my car. I felt so faint that I actually had to hand my keys over to one of the homeless people that I knew and said, please go get my car for me, while I sat on the sidewalk with my head down. Um, and so I just wanted to say the conditions are deplorable. I want to say shame on those that, that brought about, that did not go beyond these conditions and do not see these people as human beings because they are living worse than animals. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Heather. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Mary Lou Bailey and I'm with um, the uh, Unitarian Universalist Church in Auburn as well as People of Faith Together, or we call us PPOFT. Um, and I'm going to repeat some things, but I don't think that's a problem today. Um, after my 40 years in the nursing profession, I look at what something is doing to a person's health, whether it's improving, uh, staying the same or deteriorating. And so that's my perspective on what I have to say. Um, heat is one of the leading, and this is 
uh, material that I got this morning from the National Weather Service website. He is one of the leading weather-related killers in the United States, resulting in hundreds of fatalities each year. He can be very taxing on the body. Even a short period of exposure to heat can cause irreparable damage. Now, I know that you didn't ask for this problem of the homeless. Who would ask for that? But, but it is your responsibility. And I would have hoped to see that responsibility carried out in a way that would at least be protective of the lives that, have, that are entrusted to you, again, whether you want them or not. They're your responsibility. And we haven't seen any of that. And it's, it's very distressing. Okay, so some of the people that are um, compromised the most by heat is uh, older adults. I don't know the ages of our people out there, but more likely it's people with chronic medical conditions. And I can tell you as a nurse that probably the majority of the people that are living in that encampment have chronic medical conditions because they don't take care of their uh, own medical situations. Again, they're your responsibility. Can I say a couple more words? I know I'm, I'm used up my time already. But let me just say, um, I'll just say that um, uh, dehydration, which is what results from not having enough water and getting too hot. I'm surprised it's not, and it may be happening already with these folks. It would happen to you if you were living like that. Um, so it can result in heat exhaustion, heat cramps. This is kind of a, a list of how things occur. Heat stroke, seizures uh, due to electrolyte loss, low blood volume, kidney failure, coma, and death. That's not an unlikely thing to happen. And I think everybody would be very, very upset should that occur. And we could have more than one death. And if not going clear to death, we're going to have a lot of sick people. So I hope that we'll see that change. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Victoria Connolly. No water, no shade, no secondary egress, parking, hand or hand washing stations. So several other things concern me regarding this that no one has mentioned. I'll go into them as fast as I can. My background is in Adult Protective Services Administration. The county absolutely, by law, has a duty of care to all its citizens, especially the elderly and dependent adults in this case. Welfare and Institutions Code 10,000 states the purpose is to provide protection, care, and assistance to the people of the state in need and promote the welfare by providing appropriate aid and services to all its needing and distressed. The HLE administered and services provided promptly and humanely. I saw, if I saw the lack of services in an organization providing unsafe camping to dependent and elder adults, I would be reporting it to Adult Protective Services. If you think, I think that you should revisit the legal definition of care custodian, which concerns a person, which includes a person of trust, that is all county personnel serving this population. Also take a look at Penal Code 368, which reads in part, any person who knows or reasonably should know an elder or dependent adult and who allows the, a person is an elder or dependent adult and allows 
them to be injured or willfully permits them to be placed in a situation in which their health may be endangered is guilty of a misdemeanor. And that can increase to a felony if there is serious injury or death. Caretaker means a person who has custody or control or stands in a position of trust. Um, Jim Holmes rather poignantly at a prior meeting said he was present for the first clearance and noted that although campers had due warning, most were unable to negotiate moving out of their space. Noted it was interesting they were in the grounds of a mental hospital. The further clearances should have taken that into account rather than the manner in which it was done, which seems to me in my professional assessment as emotional abuse. So reasonable people are telling you that there are unsafe conditions likely to produce physical harm to elder and dependent adults. I also have to ask, why is the point person dealing with this an official that has no affiliation with social services? I can tell you that if I was in social services right now, and my county was conducting this exercise, there would be a lot of talk around the water cooler and a lot of marching in to the administrator's offices to discuss what could be done. I suspect Dr. Oldham and Ms. Ellis are receiving these visits. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Um, and I know I said I'd allot 15 minutes for public comment. How many more in the audience here physically would like to make a public comment this morning? I'm not seeing others, so this will be our last um, uh, live person. I think we have three or four on Zoom. Is that, is, is that correct, Megan? Four. And so then we'll, uh, if there's other additional public comment, we will come back at the end of the day and take more public comment. So go ahead, Reverend. Hi. Um, this is Reverend Alex da Silva Soto. I serve with the awesome people of Sierra Foothills Unitarian Universalist Church just downtown Auburn. My pronouns are they, them, and theirs. And um, I will come and celebrate you and your labor every time your actions will produce health and blessings upon our community. But I'm also committed and vow to hold you accountable as elected officials when your actions produce more suffering and more trauma upon our community. We were made promises that this ordinance, the new camping ordinance, was about health and safety for everyone in our county, instead of favoring the powerful, privileged, and the comfortable. There were two clean and clear actions taken without as many as incidents as the third one, and this third one happened a few days ago. It displaced our neighbors and re-traumatized them. Many of them that have already gone through many, many traumas, including and especially the trauma of being evicted and belongings taken away from them. Instead of showing up with trucks and assistance, you showed up with police officers ready to arrest, and they did. You could have mobilized us because every time we come and hold you accountable, we also offer you our help. We could have been there and assisted our neighbors. Personal property was thrown in dumps and locked up before our neighbors were able to assist the ones amongst them with less ability. It was locked up and they were not able to retrieve it. Urgent life-saving actions cannot wait for bureaucratic processes. And I'm glad to hear that there is a meeting to be scheduled, hopefully by June 1st, but our neighbors cannot wait until then for their human rights to be tended to. And some of them have already been listed, and I'm going to list them again for the record. Potable water, as it was promised during our deliberation, 
for the passing of this ordinance. Hand washing stations, shading to avoid heat stroke, legal parking. You already heard that we have been threatened with fines for doing the work that is our collective responsibility and ultimately your responsibility, which is potable water, shade, and all. In conclusion, I want to be respectful of your time and everyone's time. I will rely on indigenous wisdom, recalling the story about the two wolves that we all have inside. One being the wolf of fear, greed, and hatred, and the other wolf being of love, peace, and justice. So which one are you going to feed? Because many of us continue to hold each other accountable about the ones we are called to feed. And to wrap up with a quoting from a brown houseless refugee, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. Please count on us and let's do what is right. Thank, Thank you, you, Reverend. Okay, we'll go to Zoom for additional public comments. Gina, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Hi, good morning. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, um, I'll keep my comments brief. Much of what I was going to say has already been said, um, but as Reverend Alex said, for the record, um, I'd like to call on um, the Board of Supervisors to instruct your staff to prevent a humanitarian crisis at the new location um, that uh, our unhoused neighbors have been forced to move to. Um, you've heard already, they need a second means of aggress. They need potable water, they need hand washing, they need shade, and for goodness sake, there needs to be somewhere to park. Um, if any of them have cars, um, which is important, an important step toward um, keeping a job or improving the, their life situation, they have no place to park um, when they're forced to move to this place. I, I um, would also like to say that I'm disappointed at how this has played out. Um, feel like there was duplicitousness. Um, clear and clean, the clean and clear um, was supposed to be temporary. In fact, the signages said that the residents there would have to move for up to 72 hours, but then of course they were not allowed back into many of their areas. And then as we all know, finally, they were completely displaced from um, the area around the DeWitt Center. Um, so in my opinion, if they're going to be, if residents are going to be asked to stay in a certain area and or risk fining or arrest, then for goodness sake, that area has got to be <laughs> habitable, um, the bare minimum. So please provide that post haste yesterday. It is your duty, it is all of our duty to take care of the residents of our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gina. And for the following speakers, if um, people have already made your points, uh, Please try not to be redundant and uh, make new points to the board uh, that you'd like us to consider. Thank you. Michelle, please unmute your mic and give your comments. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Michelle, and I am part of an advocacy group seeking justice for Anthony Williams. I am asking today for Todd Leopold to respectfully step down from his high profile position as he was the driver behind the wheel that killed Anthony Williams on March 19th. Since this tragic accident took the life 
of such a young and promising man, there has been absolutely no government accountability. I was appalled to see Todd Leopold, the CEO of Placer County, in attendance at the last Board of Supervisors meeting on May 10th, as well as attending a capital to capital event in Washington, D.C. while we were grieving the life of Anthony Williams. This outraged many in this community. How could someone go about their life as if nothing happened? Advocates seeking justice for Anthony attended the Rockland City Council meeting that day and expressed concerns of accountability, transparency, and just simple respect for the victim. Todd Leopold has no conscience. He has lacked the ability to lead in his role as an honest and law-abiding public servant. His actions has not only raised doubts in his credibility, but it has a lifelong impact on the many young youth in our community who are sitting front row seat to this Todd Leopold slew of mistakes, and yet they are supposed to trust in this government? He is sending a message that government accountability does not apply to him. It is my hope today that you all stand with us to make sure that Todd Leopold, who has been confirmed as a driver, that killed Anthony Williams is held to a higher degree of professional standards, just like any other public servant. I am questioning the reason behind Todd Leopold's return to work after the accident, as opposed to placing him on administrative leave until the investigation was complete. Why is Todd Leopold approved to attend conferences out of state? Did each of you board of supervisors here today thought that was really a good idea? The most disturbing, unsettling part of these efforts is how Rockland PD all of a sudden had a police report after the family and attorney and seeking justice for Anthony attended Rockland City Council. Todd Leopold's true character emerges with his speeding tickets, DUI, misappropriation of funds from Adams County, County in Colorado, and yet you all hired him. Todd's lame, poor, unsympathetic, ingenuous apology through a press release is embarrassing. An excuse, an excuse for him not to hold up the investigation is absurd. What's really to investigate? He was the cooperating driver and he killed an innocent man. The narrative behind the story does not exist. Todd should own it. He got himself in another bucket of water. As far as I'm concerned, you all control the temperature. Like I said, I am concerned about the youth that have impacted by, that are impacted by all of this. Friends of Anthony have been judged, snide comments have been made, inappropriate social media is out there. I mention this to you all because as an adult, along the side of others seeking justice for Anthony, have also had to deal with the same exact thing, but I'm an adult. If our distinguished Board of Supervisors cannot stand up and help this community heal for high school students, who have seen the worst adult behavior in Todd Leopold, then who will? Seeking justice for Anthony is, hope, is hopeful that the District Attorney's Office of Placer County will move forward and pursue charges against Todd Leopold in order to regain and restore government accountability. Again, I am here as a friend of Anthony. I am seeking justice for Anthony. I am asking for Todd Leopold to respectfully step down from his high profiled position. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you for your comments, Michelle. Sil Sylvia, unmute your mic and give your comments. Sylvia, can you unmute your mic? Oh, she has a, let's move her over as a panelist. We can go to the next speaker and come back to Sylvia. Is there another, I think there were one or two more. Mm -hmm. Sylvia, if you can continue to hold and we'll see if we can get someone else to speak at this moment. Alma, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. 
Good morning, um, Board of Supervisors and everyone in attendance. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you, Alma. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Alma. I am a Placer People of Faith Together's community organizer. Um, I am a longtime resident, a former longtime resident of uh, Roseville. And um, even before my work with uh, Placer People of Faith Together, I have been a homeless advocate um, in the region. I am speaking to you today um, and uh, following your instructions, uh, Supervisor, to not repeat the same points that other speakers have done, I will uh, just say that those same five points are uh, the immediate reason for why I wanted to speak to you all today. Um, now, with that being said, I want to really make the point that um, I I am speaking to you today, right? Rather than visiting with other friends and so on and so forth. And as other folks have mentioned, you have, um, because you have a responsibility um, that is different to than it is for uh, the general community, even though we all have collective responsibility. Um, but very few folks have mentioned why, right? And it is because you have power that um, a lot of us don't, even though we all have power. Um, and it is from that place, it comes from a place of respect and it is from a place of acknowledgement um, of the different things that you have accomplished with your um, position and your actions in this position that you're in, that we're coming to you. It is not to blame and shame, it is still to collectively pull in so that we can move together. Um, and the other piece of what I wanted to really highlight uh, really comes to why um, I know that there is a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of um, slow movement where a lot of pieces have to be integrated. I'm not naive to the process, right, of policy making and implementation. Um, but I definitely, I, I want to remind you all and or share with you rather something that my grandpa uh, really, uh, you know, shared with me that, um, you know, I didn't know we were poor when we were growing up, but I remember wanting stuff that I was told we couldn't have because there was no money. And yeah, my grandma and my grandpa would sometimes give money to folks who were, you know, on the side of the street asking for, for um, some help. I would always be thinking to myself as a child, we do have money. Obviously there is stuff. And it wasn't until later on when I grew up that I remember the words that my grandpa used to say, like, Things like, we don't ever deny water, even to our worst enemy. You don't deny them a, a glass of water. If they've hurt you, if it doesn't matter what they've done. Because if you fail to recognize the humanity, the human needs that you yourself have in others, then you are the one that has become the monster. And while I know that you have a lot of different reasons to, um, you know, realities to uh, be um, moving carefully, I want to encourage you to not um, let some of those things that see government and which are the reason for why so many folks unfortunately do not trust government or engage with government officials. Please break through that by remembering those principles. I'm not asking just for compassion in the form of charity, but I'm asking for your compassion in the form of solidarity with other human beings who are currently facing situations that if your neighbor or your children or yourself are facing, you will feel very, very strongly want to move quickly on that. Thank you so much for your time. And again, as, far as Reverend Alex mentioned, we are here to serve and to continue to move in good faith conversations to help the coordination of efforts with the folks, on house folks in the region of Placer County. Thank you. Thank you, Alma. Can we get Sylvia back? Sylvia, can you unmute your mic and give your comments? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, today, I wanted to call in to talk about the the press release that was just sent out um, and the misuse of the county resources by the two captains. Um, we have Under Sheriff Wayne Wu and Sergeant Brandon Bean both running for sheriff for Placer County. Um, the press release by Mr. Bean this morning. Um, talks about the misuse of county resources 
by the two captains and Wayne Wu campaign and then go we, we have a, a, a town hall that is coming up um, they've both been invited to speak and both parties whether they support uh, Mr. Wu or Mr. Bean would like to hear both these gentlemen speak so we can make a decision for ourselves uh, so I encourage all the Board of Supervisors who have endorsed Mr. Wu to get in contact and please encourage him to attend this town hall so that the people in the community are able to make a decision and hear from both of these gentlemen. Um, for the first time since 1978, the residents of Placer County will have the chance to see two candidates running for sheriff on their ballots. So it is extremely important that we will all be able to hear from each candidate in a town hall type of manner. This will give the residents of Placer County the ability to ask questions that are concerning to them. I hope that everybody can make it out to this and the Board of Supervisors once again will encourage Mr. Wu to show up. This has not happened in 40 years. This town hall will happen and be held at the Auburn Grace Church at 3126 Olympic Way in Auburn from 6.30 to 8 p.m. tomorrow, May the 25th from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. No further comments. No further public comment. And as we've stated previously, we, can, we are uh, not able to take action on any items that come to us under public comment. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Oh, that's okay. Andrea has raised her hand. She was the one under Oh, okay. Consent. We'll take one more, and then we're going to be done with public comment and move to business items. Andrea, go ahead and give your comments. Hi, I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Andrea. Great. Thank you for taking me. Um, I'll make it short. Um, I'm going to be echoing a lot of what the advocacy group um, has mentioned. Um, I am a resident of Rockland, California, and I'm speaking here today because I am hopeful that we're getting closer to the truth of unveiling uh, Todd Leopold, our current CEO of Placer County and the Rockland Police Department, who in my opinion has been mishandling the investigation and covering up for a high profile leader in our community, Todd Leopold. It, you know, what, what makes me sad is that it wasn't until the grassroots effort, the advocacy group, group pulled together and successfully found a lot of missing pieces, a lot of which I hope will get revealed in due time. I hope that justice for Anthony does win um, I am just sad to see um, the social media uh, spread a lot of rumors that are untrue. I'm trying to correct as many as I can, um, but I can't do it if I don't get the support of the community. Um, you know, as a parent, it just makes me sad to know that this is happening, right? And when I think back of the trail of events that took place when when we were told about the accident, it, the, the media leaked it. And it was a first responder who sent a text message. The, all the high school students knew before their own family. That's, that, that's not good. Not only that, um, when he got to go home to his family, the family, the Williams family was left with a lot of unanswered questions. They were given the runaround constantly. When we were, uh, Planning the services, I was helping take part in that. Todd Leopold was in DC lobbying, taking pictures on Instagram, smiling. When we put him to rest on April 21st, about four days after his birthday, Todd Leopold was still hiding, not sharing. This breaks my heart. Thursday, May 26th, was when Anthony was supposed to graduate from Intercom High School. His, his cap and gown, is gonna remain in its bag, which makes me hurt. I have a daughter who's a senior. All these seniors are hurting that were close to him. Please help me find the truth. Join us and, and find the real activity that's happening behind closed doors. Stop, stop saying it's not happening, it's not true. It's happening, it's real. I'm from here, I witnessed this day in, day out. Please help us find why did he leave the scene? Why are the cameras not working on Lone Tree? Why are there no skid marks? 
that would suggest that he would have at least attempted to break. Why, when the, when the um, family went to pick up his things, you're missing a shoe, you're missing his headphones, you can't find his phone. I hope they're doing the right thing, but my instinct is saying another. I need you guys to help us get to the truth. We need to do the right thing. Todd Leopold, wherever you're hiding, do the right thing. All these church troops come out and we help the community. You should know better. That's all I have to say. I thank you for letting me have some talk time. I wish you all a, a great day. Thank you, Andrea, I appreciate it. As I was just wrapping up our public comment, I just wanted to make sure folks are aware that we can't take action on any items we've heard about. Um, but I did want to ask our, uh, under our next item, uh, which is board member reports and, and uh, county executive reports, um, I was going to ask Jane Christensen to respond um, regarding the homeless encampment at DeWitt and some of the actions that were taken. Um, if you wouldn't mind. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Over there. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, and, and thank you to all of you who've come this morning, who've emailed, and who've called in with your comments. Uh, we welcome the public comment as we work together on these critical community issues. We are learning, as we said when we adopted the ordinance, and uh, how better to implement as we continue to go forward. And a community meeting has been organized, and I understand confirmed with many of you for June 1st to continue this dialogue on these important issues. Okay, thank you, Jane. Were there any other uh, executive reports? Not at this time. Okay, then I'll look to board members. Did you have any reports for the community? Okay, great. Then we're going to move on on our agenda. And before we move to our business items, um, 17A, for those of you who might be here for item 17A, we will be tabling that uh, item. Uh, we're going to move on to 1A now, and then we're going to take one of our supplemental items uh, right after this item. So let's start with 1A, Public Works, and this is the Ninth Amendment to Solid Waste Handling Agreement with Placer County Eastern Regional Landfill, Inc. And Brandon, and let's see, is Brandon here? No? Yeah. So you all are stepping in. Thank you. Yes. Uh Good morning, Chair Gustafson, board members, Jared Deck, program manager for environmental engineering. Um, unfortunately, Brandon Thurber was not able to make it today, so in his place, Mr. Tony Rivers is going to step in and introduce this item before you. So with that, I'll turn it over to him. Uh, good morning, Chair Gustafson, uh, board members, county council. Um, my name's Tony Rivers, and I'm here to uh, present the uh, Ninth Amendment uh, to Solid Waste Handling Agreement for the Placid County Eastern Regional Landfill and Tahoe Truckee Disposal Incorporated. So one year extension to the agreement and modification to tipping fees, processing fees, and the garbage collection fees. A little background on this is uh, since, uh, since 2015, the county has contracted with Placer County Eastern Regional Landfill, ERL Inc., and Tahoe Truckee Disposal Incorporated, TTD, for the collection, transportation, processing, and recycling, and disposal of solid waste in the eastern portion of Placer County including franchise areas two and three, east of uh, the city of Colfax to the Nevada state line. Uh, that's on the, uh, uh, the solid waste franchise area attachment. Under the solid waste handling services agreement, uh, garbage collected by TTD is processed by ERL Inc. at the uh, Eastern Regional Manage uh, Material Recovery Facility, where recycling material is removed and the uh, residual waste is transported to the landfill at the Lockwood landfill in Nevada. The term of the uh, current agreement is set to terminate on June 30th, 2022. Uh, the county staff has been actively involved in discussions with the ERL slash TTD and have been working together uh, towards putting together draft deal points for a potential longer term extension for your board to consider. The implementation of SB 1383 has hindered the ability of the county and ERL slash TTD to draft the potential deal points. The county is a consultant on contract to conduct a waste characterization study at the AirMurf to address SB 1383 organics diversion requirements. The data from this study will be used to determine whether the county shall implement changes to the AirMurf to meet organics high diversion requirements. 
or if changes at the collection level should be considered. This decision directly impacts the services that both ERL and TTD would, be, uh, would need to be incorporated into potential deal points. For this reason, county staff are recommending uh, that the board extend the current agreement by one year to expire on June 30th, 2023. This will allow the county to implement the study for SB 1383 compliance and then work with ERL slash TTD to draft potential deal points for the required services. Under this one year extension, ERL, TTD, have requested that a one-time modification to the cost of living adjustment methodology be implemented to help offset rising operational costs such as labor, equipment, and fuel. They are specifically requesting that the 4% cap on the ERL incorporated processing fee COLA not be imposed and that the TTD service fee COLA be calculated using the garbage and trash collection CPI rolling 12-month average which is more representative of the industry. The county staff have re reviewed these requests and agrees that they are reasonable they are reasonable request and recommends the board approve these one-time modifications under the one-year extension. Under the agreement, ERL is entitled to a COLA for processing fees. That adjustment, in addition to increased maintenance costs to the county, results in a need for increased tipping fees at the IRMRF. Because a component of the garbage collection fees are passed through payment of tipping fees, the collection fees must also increase to maintain sufficient operating revenue. Each of these fees is described in the memo uh, before you. One particular item uh, that I'd like to uh, mention is the special fee. This uh, portion of the fee funds the county's solid waste management program, which includes monitoring and maintenance at the closed county landfill sites, many of the outreach and education programs, and oversight of garbage collection services. The county is proposing increasing this fee from 4% up to 5% to assist with the additional cost of, of SB 1383 implementation. The county has not made changes to this fee since 2009. Therefore, staff recommends amending the agreement, uh, one, extend the term by one year to expire on June 30th, 2022, and two, use the calculated COLA for the contractually required increase in ERL Inc. processing fees and monthly license payment and three, to increase the tipping fees to ensure adequate revenue for the increased processing fees and ongoing maintenance of the facilities. And four, to increase the collection fees based on the garbage and trash collection CPI rolling 12-month average COLA, pass through cost of the increased tipping fees and the increased county franchise fee to address SB 1383 regulations. Great. Do you all have any questions? Great. Thank you, Tony, and thanks for stepping in. You're welcome. Uh, well done. Um, any questions, board members? Okay. Then uh, this is a public hearing to consider all protests and tabulate ballots on proposed garbage collection fee adjustments in Franchise Area 3, which includes unincorporated Placer County from Donner Lake to the Nevada State Line. So with that, we'll open the public hearing. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to this issue? Not seeing anybody jump up here in the room and nobody on Zoom. So, clerk, can you tabulate the ballots we've received? The clerk's office received 384 valid protests. This would have required 8,633 in order for this to have been a successful protest. Therefore, we did not receive a majority and the protest is not successful. Thank you. So we'll close the public hearing and now look for a motion on the uh, action to approve and authorize the chair to execute the amendment. So moved. Do I have a second? Okay. I have Weigand on the motion and Holmes on the second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? With that, we've passed. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, board. Okay, and we're going to move to an item uh, that was on our supplemental agenda now with our district attorney. Uh, he's been waiting patiently in the room. This is item 19.1 on our supplemental agenda. And this is the digital evidence management approval of a five-year lease with Exxon Enterprise. 
Thank you, Morgan. Welcome this morning. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, fellow board members. Jane, Karen, Megan, good to see you. Uh, yes, I'm here. I will be brief, but we are requesting authorization to enter into a contract with Axon Enterprises uh, and a corresponding budget amendment um, for that contract. Uh, Axon Enterprises maintains and hosts a digital uh, evidence uh, storage service, um, typically referred to as evidence.com. Um, and it is a series of software programs that allow us to receive, house, manage, and disseminate digital storage. Um, as we discussed when the body-worn camera issue was before this board, uh, we talked about what would be a need for us to sort of streamline our digital uh, storage of all of our evidence. It is increasing. Our current case management system, eProsecutor, which we went live with two years ago, um, is not equipped to do that. Um, we are currently housing our digital storage in there. We pay $4,000 a year per terabyte of data. And just to put it in perspective, when we went live, we immediately uploaded six terabytes of data into the system. And in the last two years since we went live, we've added six more. And as soon as the sheriff comes online uh, with their body cameras as well, we'll be increasing uh, digital evidence at an alarming and increasing rate, which will increase those costs. This has included in the uh, contract unlimited cloud storage. It has tracking and auditing to allow us to com be compliant with our chain of custody. It allows us to uh, process and manage that data within minutes of its upload from our partner agencies. And one of the, I, I hate to say cool features because this is pretty nerdy here, but one of the cool features is our ability to disseminate that information almost instantly to our defense bar. Um, we can send them a link that allows them direct access to that digital information. Currently, the way we transfer that now is we put a whole lot of files and photographs onto thumb drives and flash drives and have to give them the defense, and it's frankly a very clunky and inefficient system. Um, our lawyers have trained on this. We've had the representatives from evidence.com come up uh, to show us. It includes features like automatic transcription, which will reduce costs of having to transcribe a lot of our videos. Uh, but, but digital evidence is what make our cases now. Things that weren't digital before now are, and not just body-worn camera footage, but all of our cell phone information, all of our um, surveillance photos. Um, so this really streamlines it and, and turns it into a workable uh, system that propels our office into um, even more sort of state-of-the-art technology. Um, and we were able to fund this through right-sizing our budget, finding the money, and with the help of Amanda Flo from the CEO's office, we were able to, to build this into our budget using our 21-22 fiscal year um, funding and to be able to use some of our, our uh, surplus this year to fund that over the course of the contract of the next five years. So I'm happy to answer any questions. If you have any, I, I hate to say this is exciting, but for us lawyers, it really is because um, when the lawyers were training on this, they said, can we please, please get this because this will solve a lot of our problems. Right now, our digital information is put into our case management system and on a case with let's say 400 photographs, they are all listed simply by JPEG file number and you have to click in and click out and it takes a lot of time both on the lawyer side and the administrative side to try and organize those and it's, it's really inefficient and this will sort of revolutionize the way we can organize all of that, which is uh, more efficient and cost effective uh, operations for our office. So I will stop talking about things that are somewhat boring but happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I will just ask for the approval on, uh, on the contract and the corresponding budget amendment. Thank you very much. And, you know, we're always glad when we don't confuse attorneys with having to look through a lot of documents <laughs> on that. Anyway, with that, board members, any questions? I don't think you see any questions. I'll uh, look for any public comment on this item. I'm not seeing any. And this is, uh, I need a motion and a roll call vote on this. I enthusiastically move approval. I'll second. Great. Motion Holmes, second Gore. All those in, oh, I'm sorry. Roll call vote. Gore? Aye. Wygant? Yeah. Holmes? Yes. Jones? Yes. Gustafson? Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you Thanks very much. Nice to see you. for patiently waiting. Thank you. <laughs> okay, now we'll go back to our timed items list. Uh, we completed our 920 time item. Now we'll move to our 930 timed item. So for those of you watching uh, and waiting, uh, we are running a bit behind. We'll try to catch up here in a little bit, but we'll go to 930 and Mr. Will Garner on Public Works Assessment and Fee Report. Good morning. Uh, 
uh, Good morning. Supervisor Chair and Board of Supervisors. <clears throat> so every year we bring to you a, uh, this list of um, all of the assessments, the zones of benefit, permanent road divisions, um, and assessment districts for you to approve the upcoming year's uh, assessments for, for all of them. There's 155 zones, and within that, there's 185 different assessments. Um, and um, um, so each one of them has a, well, there's a, an increase based on the CPI. So 73 of them, of these 185, will increase, are being asked to be increased by 4.2%, which is the CPI for the last calendar year. Um, 97 of them, the older ones, have no increase because when they were established, there was no increase uh, put into the, uh, the establishment documents. And 15 of them have varying different CPIs that were established, like 2.5% or 3%. And if you read through the list, you'll see all of those different assessment numbers and the resulting dollar amounts. I do want to make a comment here. Um, we have a couple of items today involving um, Morgan Place, where a new zone of benefit and an annexation of Morgan Place into an existing zone would um, change, would add one more assessment and one more zone, and would change the assessment amount for Dry Creek 169. Those aren't on this list yet because they're not yet approved, but they're being that they're in today's meeting and if, if approved, um, those would also be added to um, the tax roll as well because the timing would allow. Um, so with that, uh, we are asking you, your board, to conduct a public hearing to consider the fiscal year 22-23 assessment and fee report for county service areas, assessment district, permanent road divisions, and two, adopt a resolution to confirm fiscal year 22-23 assessments and approve the charges to be on the fiscal year 22-23 county tax roll. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, board members, any questions for Will? Okay, I'll open up the public hearing on this item. Do we have any public comment? Okay, uh, then I'd look for a motion to adopt a resolution to confirm these assessments. So moved. Okay, I have a motion, Wygant, and a second, Jones. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? No. Thank you, Will. We'll move to our 940 time to item. This is item number three on our agenda, page 23 of our packet, and this is our adjusted agricultural commissioner, sealer of weights and measures. Conduct a public hearing on those increases. Gina, thank you for being here today. More fees, sorry. Yes, more fees. <laughs> So good morning, I'll try and keep this brief. Chair Gustafson, members of the board, my name is Gina Olivares uh, with the CEO's office here in Placer County. So the item before you today is, was continued from uh, April 19th. Um, this is a public hearing regarding price, well, you just said it, price uh, index adjustment uh, for agricultural commissioner, sealer of weights and measures, community development resource agency, also known as CEDRA, and health and human service fees for fiscal year 22-23. Um, these adjustments are brought to your board every year and based on the most recent calculations in accordance with Placer County Code and various indexes included, um, including, I'm sorry, the Consumer Price Index and Construction Cost Index, amongst others, which you just heard about. <laughs> and as you know, fees this year are high due to record inflation uh, across the country, and as such, we have reached out to various stakeholders to inform them um, of these proposed adjustments. Should you have any questions, myself and others are available to respond, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Gina, and uh, again, thank you for being more clear on the title of all the actions <laughs> we were taking today on these than I was. Uh, so, board members, any questions? Yes, Bonnie. Yes, thank you, Gina, appreciate mm -hmm. it. You know, as I was looking through this, one of the challenges reading it is that some of the reports have the increases, and other reports just have the new amount. and and particularly I think the planning, building, engineering, surveying, plan check, those just have the amounts. And so um, I think in the future would be really helpful is to see what um, current rates are and what future rates are. Because I, 
you know, I can't yes. differentiate. And um, just being able to see that. Mm -hmm. And when you see a very large percentage increase, yes. you know, we're not, you know, some of them are 7.39. Others are the 24.52, but I don't know which one those are. Correct. And that makes it really challenging just as I'm looking at it and knowing who's going to be most impacted. Right. Um, so I would ask um, that we're able to see in the future, you know, where those changes are. And I know that, you know, we've been doing reports the same way and each department does it differently and that's fine, but knowing which fees are increased by how much and what the new fees are would make it a lot simpler to review the reports in the future. Yeah, no, I appreciate the feedback and I'll definitely take that back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good comments. I would agree on that one. It was difficult reading, especially late at night. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any other board member questions or comments? Then I'd open up the public hearing. Do we have any public comment on this item? Okay. Then I would look for an action to adopt the resolution with these uh, current fee schedules and services. S Supervisor Holmes, Supervisor Wygant on the second. And all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, Gina. Thank you. Okay, we'll move to our 945 timed item. This is page 65 of our board packet, and this is Parks and Open Space, Morgan Place Subdivision Annexation. I believe that Ted is going to zoom in to tell it, to present this report. Is that correct? Okay. Good morning, Madam Chair. Ted Rell with uh, Parks and Open Space. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can, Ted. Thank you very much for joining us today. Yes, thank you. I'm Ted Rell with Department of Parks and Open Space, and I'm here this morning to present the annexation of the Morgan Place subdivision into Zone of Benefit 169, uh, considering that there are no protests to this action. The Morgan Place subdivision is located on the southwest corner of Willerga Road and PFD and will add an additional 79 parcels to this Zone of Benefit. Uh, as Mr. Gardner was saying about uh, Zone 169, uh, the current assessment is $678.90, and there have been three previous annex annexations during the 21-22 fiscal year. We had Winding Creek, Morgan Knowles, and the Brookwood subdivisions, adding a collective 94 parcels to the zone of benefit. So the total savings by these three annexations will bring the current assessment down from $678 to $604. And we, we still have one additional annexation, Cabral Ranch, that you'll be seeing on June 14th. So what does this pay for? Well, this zone of benefit provides maintenance funding for the Dry Creek Park area, which includes Dry Creek Community Park on the east side of Alerga and Doyle Ranch Park on the, on the uh, west side. So these parks provide playing fields for soccer, lacrosse, baseball, including basketball and tennis courts. There are also picnic areas, bathrooms, large play structures with slides and swings, and shade covers over the play areas that were installed in 2020. Additional recreation amenities include new artificial turf fall protection under the playground equipment and four multi-stage exercise equipment stations that are adjacent to the paved multi-use trail. And this class one paved multi-use trail extends from Watt Avenue to Cook Riolo. And eventually in the future, it'll uh, hook up to the Roseville's trail and, and hopefully we can get all the way to Folsom Lake one day. So with the additional paved trail um, mileage north of, of the corridor, which eventually also connect into the Placer Vineyards community currently under construction. So the recent completion of the Willerga Bridge project also provides bicycle and pedestrian access to the paved trail system and routes users under the bridge and providing a much safer solution to crossing the road topside. The Morgan Place subdivision will add to the multi-use trail mileage with trails along the property frontage on PFB and Willerga. And these trails will connect to the trail network at both parks. Dry Creek Community Park Phase 3 project will also add playing fields and other recreation amenities here in the near future. So if approved today, the addition of this project into County Service Area 28, Zone of Benefit 169 will contribute to maintain these existing future and future recreation amenities for all to enjoy. 
I'd be happy to answer any questions your board may have. Thank you very much, Ted. Are there any questions for Ted? I'm not seeing any. Any public comment on this item? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we're conducting a public hearing, so we've officially opened the public hearing. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Reed Onyate. I'm with Tim Lewis Communities, and um, we're pleased to see this on your agenda. I just wanted to highlight that um, we just got an email recently that uh, the next agenda item, uh, 5A and also uh, 7A, regarding the final map to the subdivision for Morgan Place has been postponed, and, and uh, these are all related to, to that and securing that final map. We had to get an extension on that final map, which I believe... Um, and I'd like to maybe confirm it if possible if, if staff is available <clears throat> to I think it uh, got extended from June 5th another 60 days and I just wanted to um, I guess there was some paperwork issues with the next item 5a with the um, county service district area 28 benefit uh, 173 okay. and uh, just want to make sure we made those dates so we didn't um, go beyond the expiration of the tentative map on Morgan Place thank you Great, thank you. And and uh, th those are comments relative to item 5A, and we're just about there. So I know we're going to continue it. Uh, we can talk about it then. Thank you. So no other comments on this uh, part of the public hearing. No, we appreciate okay. you on the agenda. Great. Thank you. Thank so, you. May I clarify? Uh -huh. um, because these are all Morgan Place, but it's really, it's not pertinent to 4A, but it is to the others. Yes. So no. um, I, I suggest we dispense with four, and I can explain why five has to be continued to the next agenda. Okay, so we can move ahead with four. So I will mm -hmm. move item uh, 4A. And, and I just want to make a comment that Ted did announce there were no protests, but I, Megan needs to make that comment. The clerk's office officially received no protests on this item. Okay, now I'll accept the motion. Thanks, right. Bonnie. You're welcome. <laughs> and is there a second? Okay, thank you. Um, and then all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, now we'll move on to item 5A. And uh, we are planning to continue this to June 14th. Um, and we will need a motion on that, but I know Karen wants to address the comments that were heard. Yes, Madam Chair, the reason we have to continue this is the resolution uh, was incorrect. The resolution that was attached to this item was for parks not for sewer and as a result we have a problem with the brown act and going forward with this so this one has to be continued okay so i will move that we continue item 5a to Second. sorry I, I just want to want to confirm because this is a notice public hearing we want to continue this item to june 14th at 9 a.m or as soon thereafter as may be heard that's my um proposal Second. That sounded like an excellent motion, Supervisor Gore. And Supervisor Holmes seconded. Yep. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. <laughs> okay. Now we'll move on to item 6A, Public Works. Uh, again, Morgan Place Subdivision, uh, Fee for Services. Will Garner. Morning again, Chair Gustafson and board members. Um, so again, this is Morgan Place, same subdivision, 79 units, um, southeast side of PFE and Willerga Road, right on the county line. Um, as, um, as we noted, uh, the final map is now moving forward for June, June 14th, and one of the items required is to establish a zone of benefit for road maintenance, uh, street light maintenance, and storm drain maintenance. In this case, there are no street lights that are being added, but we do have um, 0.43 miles of new roadway and 1,515 linear feet of storm drain pipe that's being added that will be maintained by the county. And an assessment um, calculated uh, a, to be $218 per lot would pay for the ongoing maintenance of those items um, in this area. Um, I do need to mention that uh, when we brought this resolution of intent forward on April 19th, in that staff report, I noted that the per lot charge was $208. Um, 
in, in the meantime, there was a calculation of the square footage of the road that was recalculated and it added $10 per lot to make it $218. All of the public notice was went out with the $218. It was just the, um, the early time frame that, to get the April 19th uh, board packet together, it was still $208. But public notice has said $218, and that's what the uh, calculation is, and that is what we, we put in the resolution for today. Um, so with that, um, I, I probably won't read the entire action, but they are noted in the staff report. Conduct a public hearing to hear and consider protests, if any, to the creation of um, County Service Area 28, Zone of Benefit Number 217, and adopt a resolution creating County Service Area Number 28, Zone of Benefit 217 at $218 per parcel. Great, thank you. Any questions, board members? Okay, then we'll open the public hearing. Are there any members of the public that would like to do, address the board on this item? Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing. And clerk, uh, Megan, will you? We received no protests on this and we did receive one ballot in favor. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll accept a motion to adopt the resolution creating county service area number 28, zone of benefit 217. Okay, motion Gore, second Holmes. All those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, with that, we'll move on to our 10 a.m. timed item. This is item 7A, Community Development Resource Agency, Morgan Place Subdivision Final Map. Chair, if I could take this one really quickly. So we are also asking for this to be continued to June 14th at 9 a.m. or as soon thereafter. I wanted to speak to the gentleman's comments that, and verify on record that the entitlement is good till August 4th. So hearing this within June 14th will meet the time frame needed. And Madam Chair, the reason we have to continue is all of these annexations are conditions precedent to uh, funneling the map. So as a result, we had to move this item as well. Right. Any questions? Okay, then um, do we need to take a motion uh, to continue this? Thank you. Supervisor Gore, Supervisor Jones on this one. Um, okay. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. We're catching up. Thank you for, you know, two items down, and that helps catch us up. So appreciate that. Sorry you have to come back, sir. <laughs> uh huh. Okay, now we'll move on to our 10.05 timed item. Uh, this is item eight on our agenda, Parks and Open Space, Granite Bay Parks, Trails and Open Space Maintenance and Recreation Improvement District. The uh, fiscal year 22-23 assessment, and Andy Fisher is here to report on this. Hi, Andy. Good morning, Madam Good morning. Chair, members of the board. I'm gonna take this one from Ted. He was so involved in uh, all of the annexations in the last one, it was helpful to have him take that one, but. I'll take this one in person since I'm here. Andy Fisher with Parks and Open Space. Uh, the item before you is to conduct a public hearing and adopt a resolution confirming the assessment diagram and assessment and ordering levy of assessments for fiscal year 22-23 for the Granite Bay Parks, Trails, and Open Space Maintenance and Recreation Improvement District. Uh, what we call for short the Granite Bay Lighting and Landscape or LNL District is a um, assessment district very similar to the ones that you've addressed earlier today uh, in the form of zones of benefit with COLA adjustments. This particular one though was formed under the Streets and Highways Code and so it has, it's the only one we have in Placer County and it follows its own um, administrative path every year which includes three uh, approvals from your board. The first one begins in January, February to um, to um, approve the engineer of record for the engineer's report that's done every year. The second one uh, discloses the engineer's report, takes a look at it and approves it. And this final one would uh, take the recommended COLA adjustment for the next year. The Granite Bay Lighting and Landscape District includes about 8,000 parcels in the, uh, the generally consistent with the Granite Bay Community Plan area. Uh, it is for operations and maintenance of eight public parks that already exist and also for uh, construction. It, originally it helped fund the construction of parks. Now it's helping to fund construction and maintenance and operations of trails. It envisions a 30 mile 
a multi-purpose trail system, 20 miles of bikeways, about a third of those are built. And we're chipping away with those trails in the Granite Bay uh, Loomis area as we speak. Uh, we're just finishing up a segment on Barton Road right now uh, to get kids off the trail so they can get to school or off the road without having to be on the, uh, on the road. Another one through the Los Lagos neighborhood connecting Auburn Folsom to the Folsom Lake State Rec area. So we're working on trails in that area and those will be paid for through this Granite Bay Lighting and Landscape District on an ongoing basis. That includes uh, funding about $60,000 set aside for capital replacement. Um, so this COLA, the, the uh, formation of the district in November of 2001 allowed for a maximum COLA increase according to the Bay Area Consumer Price Index of 3%. This year's calculated increase was 4.24%, so we're recommending the maximum 3% uh, increase uh, that would bring the new assessment for 22-23 to $94.44 per benefit unit. That's a total budget of $908,000, and that includes 13% uh, general fund that augments those fees uh, that represent the general benefit uh, of those facilities to the public in that district. Uh, so with that, um, I will turn it back to your board to conduct the public hearing and uh, look at the resolution. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate that. Are there any questions for Andy? Yes. To get into the weeds, but I'm sort of curious about this reserve and how that works, um, just so that I better understand it. Um, that I'm on the right one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just so that I better understand, because the increase is 3%, but the residents will only see a 1.24% increase oh, in that assessment, correct? Thank you. And so can you ex just explain to me what that reserve is so I better understand? Certainly. Thank you. Um, we are allowed, so, the, so on any given year, there's a maximum 3% increase according to the formation documents. But it also allows in years where uh, inflation is lower, let's say it was a 1% inflation, you're calculated at 1%, we can catalog and keep track of that additional 1.24%, and you'll have the option in future years to apply that. So if we have a 1% year, you could at your discretion make that a 2.24%. All we're doing here, though, is keeping that calculation. It's just the, the legal ability to keep that calculation. Anything calculated over 3%, we keep track of. Doesn't ever have to be applied, but it is a piece of information we have um, that can be applied in future years. It would come before your board in future years with full disclosure. Doesn't ever have to be applied. We just keep track of that overage. And, and following up on that, um, so you can't go back retroactively and look at those years in which the CPI was less than 3%. Correct. It's only a calculus for moving forward, forward. at your discretion. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Then I'll open up the public hearing on this item. Is there anyone here to speak to this item? Anybody on Zoom? Okay. Not having any, uh, we'll close the public hearing. And then I would entertain a motion to adopt the resolution. So Supervisor Jones had the motion. Second. Supervisor Wygant with a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Okay, we'll move to item 1010 on our agenda. Um, and who's going to make the announcement on this one? I can do yes, it. okay. So we've received a request from Executive Director Mike Lucan to continue this item off calendar and we will work with them to get it rescheduled. And then do we need a motion on this, Megan? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Holmes and Gore on the motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, we'll move then to item uh, 10 on our agenda. This is our 10.30 timed item. Oh my gosh, we've We're caught up. Early. We're two We're minutes early. early. <laughs> so. We don't have a two minute department item? Oh, okay. So we're gonna hold. Or not. <laughs> <laughs>
Members of the board, Daniel Chatney with the County Executive Office, and I'm pleased to be here this morning to provide you the fiscal year 21-22 third quarter fiscal update. Placer County share of pooled sales tax and post-COVID sales tax um, due to uh, inflationary price increases are driving a new budget or forecasted amount for fiscal year 21-22 of $20.7 million in general fund sales tax revenue. That's about consistent with fiscal year 2021 actuals and up from our budgeted amount of $18.5 million. Public safety sales tax has in been in increasing and producing positive receipts for Placer County. Uh, Placer County's allocation share has increased this year, which has led to dramatic increases in Prop 172 revenue. However, our newest projections for allocation percentage for fiscal year 22-23 has decreased slightly, which will flatten revenue for next fiscal year. The general fund uh, transit occupancy sales tax or uh, transit occupancy tax revenue uh, received for this fiscal year to date is just over eight million dollars uh, in the general fund, generating a year-end projection of nearly thirteen point two million. Similarly, in the for TOT revenue for the Tahoe area, we've already have receipts of over ten point eight million dollars, which meets our fiscal year twenty one twenty two budget amount. And the historical amounts for the final quarter plus accruals is driving our projections to $17.5 million for this fiscal year. As expected, property tax, which is the primary discretionary revenue source in the general fund, is increasing. This uh, chart shows you about a 6.2% increase over the last fiscal year. And here we move into our year-end projections. For the general fund, the general fund projects a net use of reserves in the amount of about $11.5 million. I want to note that the general fund operational revenue, operational revenue and operational expenses are in line with each other and are in balance, and this is really driven by contributions to capital projects. In the HHS fund, growth in both revenue and expenses in fiscal year 21-22 over a prior year as due to increases in the, expand, in, ex, in the expanding laboratory capacity grant program and other health programs. Uh, both categories, revenue and expense, are, are lower than budget, uh, but they are in line again, and HHS is projecting to have a surplus of revenue of about $2 million at the end of this fiscal year. In the public safety fund, revenues are projected to exceed expenses by about $7.7 .7 million. This is primarily due to the increase in public safety sales tax, as mentioned earlier. Uh, the departments within the public safety fund are working on prudent use of those reserves for capital and other one-time purchases, including uh, offering up to $12 million towards the SB 863 and SB 844 capital projects. In the library fund, the library fund is projected to end fiscal year 21-22 with revenues exceeding expenses and increases in both revenue and expense compared to fiscal year 2021. The expected increases in allocated property taxes account for the revenue increase, and capital expenditures made this year account for the, the expenditure increase. The Fire Control Fund, again, will have revenues projected slightly higher than fiscal year 2021, again, to allocated property tax revenue and these will exceed ex uh, budgeted expenditures. Uh, yeah, revenue will exceed budgeted expenditures. The expenses show a $1.3 million increase over the prior year, due in part to more costs being absorbed by CAL FIRE for the unusually long declared fire season in 2021. Our highway users tax and RMRA revenue, our year-to-date revenues for RMRA already exceed the totals for fiscal year 2021 and both sources are on track for these higher estimates in the current year. Sales tax projections for fuel have increased by about 30% over the prior year as more fuel is being used, as well as the increased fuel prices. In the fiscal year 2021 capital fund, uh, facilities presented its mid-year CIP update on March 8, 2022. And with the support of general fund capital reserves, here's a, just a, Q, a few key projects that are moving forward. Criminal justice facilities, the Health and Human Services Center, PCGC phase one infrastructure, and our Atherton tenant improvements. 
And coming back to the general fund, again, operational revenue and expenses are projected to balance this fiscal year. We see revenues exceeding expenditures overall by about $11.5 million. This use decreases the overall fund balance from $151 million at the end of 2021 to projected $139 million at the end of fiscal year 21-22. And again, that decrease of $11 million is due to investment in capital projects. The American Rescue Plan Act allocated nearly 70, or about $77.3 million to the county. We received our first installment last May, on May 19th of 2021. We were expecting to receive the other 50% sometime before the end of this fiscal year. Our reported expenditures from January 1st through March 31st were only $169,349. But as a reminder to the board, we have approved an allocation model for the use of these funds and uh, projects are picking up pace as we speak. Um, some of those projects are listed there, Lincoln Sewer Project, PCGC Tier 1 Infrastructure Project, HHS Mental Health Adult Crisis Respite Center, the HHS Public Health and Mental Health Program Expansion, affordable housing projects, and broadband infrastructure. Which brings us to this table. And this table is a reallocation of funds from what the board initially uh, approved back in August of 21. Uh, the primary reason for this is, is the new final rule from the Department of uh, Finance, I mean, from the Treasury Department, has uh, increased our revenue replacement category uh, from a calculated methodology to a up, we're up to $10 million without having to calculate the, the actual loss. What that does for us is it doesn't give us an additional $10 million to spend. It allows us to reallocate and use that $10 million for the provision of any government services except those explicitly um, not allowed under ARPA, which are really depositing into a rainy day fund, putting it into a pension fund, et cetera. So we'll ask your board today to approve this new reallocation which essentially moves the money from at the affordable housing and homelessness bucket into the revenue replacement with the balance coming from the HHS request. And as the, as the, the board will continue to receive updates on ARPA funds and have discussions about how to allocate that $10 million accordingly. And with that, um, that concludes the quarter three fiscal update. Um, we will be back in front of the board expected on June 14th with a public hearing for the 2022-23 recommended budget and June 28th for the adoption of the fiscal year 22-23 budget. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions the board has. Okay, I see a couple lights on. Supervisor Holmes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, on your American Rescue Plan Act, the uh, affordable housing uh, and homelessness is $500,000. Where is that money going to be spent? Do you know where that's going to be allocated? Supervisor Holmes, that money was allocated to a, a project in North Auburn that came before your board in one of the prior two meetings with Haldeman Homes okay. um, yeah. to offset some sewer costs there for to help increase affordable housing inventory. All right, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Supervisor Gore? And to follow up on that, Daniel, I understand the reasoning behind moving uh, the, the funds out of that um, category affordable housing homelessness to the general sort of general fund mm -hmm. but I want to advocate that I want to see that we use those dollars for that purpose um, we have homeless needs and affordable housing needs and um, as we move forward I want to um, track that and I want to advocate that we use some of those dollars for those purposes thank you any other board member comments I had a question, Daniel, because I, I just like to look at charts and graphs and try to add the numbers up and understand them. On the general fund, uh, slide number seven, which is the general fund comparison. Uh, yes. Um, so I see the jump from uh, fiscal year 21-22 to 22-23, about $12 million in um, general fund. Is this just property tax general fund, or does this include the TOT general fund? And so this would include all sources of revenue within the general fund. So it includes property tax, sales tax, um, the TOT tax revenue for the general fund's share of that. Um, 
uh, miscellaneous fees for services, charges for services, anything like that. But yes, it does. So include. that's where I get confused because the general fund property tax itself is up 12 million, almost 13. Right. TOT is up six or seven million. So it would seem like that should be a higher number. In some of the other so, revenue sources, intergovernmental revenue, for example, mm -hmm. could be decreasing. Could be yes. decreasing. And, as well as fees for certain. It, it, it all balances out into this is um, comprehensive of every department cost center we're within to, the general fund. I appreciate that because when we're trying to give a snapshot of how we're doing economically mm -hmm. to our constituents and understanding these revenues are up and they see the increases in property values and therefore you know what we're receiving as well as transient occupancy tax they want to understand you know how those numbers add up so I try to be able to explain but then I ask them to call you so <laughs> make problem. sure I get it right and don't confuse them further um, and then my question I also had a question on the expenditures of the ARP funds um, can you remind me on the health and human services 11.4 million uh, what uh, is that for services is that for capital I, I'm forgetting on that. Supervisor, uh, Chair Gustafson, I believe that's for a little bit of both. Most of it on the services side. They were allocated into some additional positions during this, the course of this fiscal year currently. Um, there, I believe there was some capital expenditures related to the Kirby Hills facility um, for mental health treatment programs. Um, but the majority of it, I do believe, is service related. Um, substance, substance abuse disorder treatments, mental health are primary categories. I know earlier today we had quite a bit of public comment on, on the situation we face at uh, the government center with the homeless group and I get asked quite a bit how much is the county, you know, what are you spending money on, how is it working and not feeling that we're doing enough and yet, you know, there's I think nine items or 11 items on our agenda today on health and human services to supplement funding for trying to help folks um, and I just, I think we skim over that quickly because they're typically routine items and you know here's another one of 11.4 million uh, to try to help in this situation so important for us to point out to our public that we're really doing a lot in this space trying to help people get on their feet and recover from situations unfortunately that are sometimes with it not within their control so I just wanted to make that point I didn't have any other questions. I don't see any other ones from the board. I would open to any public comment on this item. I'm seeing none. Okay, so we have a number of actions and County Council advises we should take individual motions uh, for these five items that you're seeing here. Um, so do I have a motion for number one to, uh, well actually number one, we've received the report, but now number two, uh, approve the consolidated budget amendment for the various county operating and proprietary budgets. Do I have a motion? I have Wygant on the motion. Will I have Holmes on the second? All those in favor? Oh, I'm sorry. Roll call on each one. Gore? Aye. Wygant? Yeah. Holmes? Yeah. Jones? Yeah. Gustafson? Yes. Then on number item number three, approve the consolidated budget amendment for lighting districts uh, lighting and landscape districts, benefit assessment districts, and the whole long list. Do I have a motion? Thank you. Roll call. Gore? Aye. Wygant? Yeah. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Gustafson? Yes. Item number four, approve the purchase of fixed assets and delegate authority to the purchasing agent to execute related purchase orders, including those in excess of 100000 Roll call. Gore, Wygant, yeah. Holmes, yeah. Jones, yeah. Gustafson. Yes. And then finally, approve a reallocation of American Rescue Plan Act funds that Daniel just reviewed with us. Roll call. Gore, Wygant, Holmes, yes. Jones, yeah. Gustafson. Yes. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Board. And good news on the budget front. Okay, we're ahead of schedule. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, we'll move to 14A. Thank you. 
And this is found on page 229 of your board packet. Devin McNally is here to present this item. Welcome, Devin. Good morning, supervisors. All right, once again, Devin McNally with the Community Development Resource Agency. Uh, the ordinance before you today is amending the subdivision ordinance, that's chapter 16 of the Placer County Code, related to Senate Bill 9 lot splits. So a quick review of Senate Bill 9, uh, passed last year by the state. Uh, it has two actions. It allows by right, so requiring a, only a staff level review, residential single family zoned parcel in urban, urban areas as defined by the US Census are now allowed to have two primary dwelling units and are able to split into two parcels, what they call an urban lot split. So this ordinance only affects the urban lot splits um, and is addressing that piece of it. So under the state law, urban lot splits uh, are allowed uh, and we have limited abilities to deny these lot splits. Uh, we have to make sure that we are applying objective health and safety standards. They can go down to a minimum lot size of 1,200 square feet. However, we can make sure that they are proportional. So the larger kind of biggest difference would be a 60-40 lot split. So you can't just carve off a tiny bit of your property under this. They have to be proportional lot sizes. We can also make sure that they have access to a right of ways. Uh, we can also make sure that there are easements for public services and facilities such as sewer and water. Uh, and we can also require parking spaces as well. So this is a quick example of kind of what these lot splits might look, look like. Once again, uh, they have to be roughly proportional. So if you have an acre property, uh, you would want it to be about a half acre each. Um, so where this applies is in any census, desig or census urban area. Um, this is a map from the 2010 urban areas. The U.S. Census Bureau has not updated this for 2020 data. Uh, that should be coming later in the summer. So we anticipate these areas to grow. But as you can see, most of these urban areas in the county are located in West Placer, uh, generally around our incorporated cities, um, and then up in North Auburn. In East Placer, most of the urban areas there are located in TRPA, which has different rules regarding subdivision, so SB9 doesn't apply at the moment. Um, so under this, we did an analysis. Uh, generally, uh, we found about 13,000 parcels that would be allowed to split under SB9. Uh, most of these are located in the Granite Bay community and the Auburn Bowman communities. So what we are doing is creating a new section in uh, Chapter 16. It's called the SB9 Land Division. Uh, what it is doing is laying out the process and pointing back to our objective standards and state law related to water, sewage, and right-of-way access. So using our existing standards that we already have related to parcel splits and just pointing back to those and laying out that process. So the way the process will work is a planning application will come in. Once it's deemed complete, it will be circulated to our parcel review committee, which is a number of staff uh, representing uh, sewer, uh, engineering, other departments like that for comments uh, to make sure that it complies with all of those objective standards. When that is uh, deemed uh, either to complete those or there is a finding made that the parcel for whatever reason does not meet those standards, it will then be uh, transmitted through a memo by the planning director, and that will be when the parcel will get its tentative map. Um, once it has its tentative map, it can then apply for a final parcel map, which will still be the typical surveying parcel process. So they will have to create a final parcel map that is drawn to the specifications uh, and then, only then, will the new lot be created. So what we are requesting today is that you introduce and waive the oral reading 
of an ordinance to amend Chapter 16 of the Placer County Code, Article 1620 pertaining to S. Senate Bill 9, find, and find the proposed amendments to be exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act, also known as CEQA, in accordance with the guidelines sections 15061 and 15268. Great, thank you, Devin. Are there questions, uh, board members? Yes, Supervisor Jones. Um, thank you for that in introduction. Um, I have a couple of questions. Can you go back to the slide on um, the uh, page three, it's slide number six. Mm -hmm. um, you spoke about the area up around the Tahoe Basin, and you said that SB9 doesn't apply to that? So TRPA, TRPA ha, is a bi-state commission, um, and so has different kind of standards. Um, they have generally interpreted it that they are not subject to California law being a bi-state commission, um, and they control their own subdivision. So it is a very different process. Does it make sense to me legally how a portion of California SB9 is not applicable when it is to the rest? Within the TRPA area, which is really the basin, mm -hmm. we are subject to the TRPA regs. And even our area plan, which we have, is, is subject to TRPA approval. So it really does tear off of TRPA with approvals. Um, we've, we've had discussions before on various items with TRPA about the fact that the county does have to follow state law, but we've consistently uh, met with a response from TRPA that because they are a bi-state um, entity that they don't. So it, it is somewhat of a rub of, of how we approach this, but because our area plan has to comply with the TRPA regional plan, we really do uh, work within that parameter so yeah it's um, and if I could go further it was established by federal mandate the controls of growth in the Tahoe Basin so it takes amendment to that federal document so neither state can over, we don't have to comply with either state's laws or we have to comply with both states laws so <laughs> it's very confusing as to which items um, but let me assure you that there's a lot of discussion on that um, in, in our desperation for needing more housing. Um, and so we're pushing on, on those interpretations to see if there can be amendment to the, to the code for that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and then on slide on five, the, the lot splits. Is this an example of how lots can be split? Yes, these are general examples, yes. Okay, and it says that, um, so you split your lot, you have your home on it already, mm -hmm. and you split your lot, now you can put an ADU on the lot with your house. So it doesn't make sense to me, what do you do with the other parcel? Can you then build a primary residence and an ADU on that residence? Correct. Okay. Okay, and then their description of, of urbanized area or urban cluster, what is that? <laughs> so these are designations by the United States Census. Uh -huh. um, it represents different concentrations of population. So urban clusters are a little bit smaller, urbanized areas are larger. Um, they are created by the census using their own kind of methodology. So I thought Placer County was mostly rural with the exception of the cities. So what is our you know, if I could inter interject here, yeah, the, the census definition of an urbanized area, an yeah, urbanized area is a continuously built up area with a population of 50,000 or more. That's the definition we have to go by. Okay, well, Granite Bay, what's the population Granite Bay? Roughly 24, 25,000? Do you mind going back to the map? <laughs> Here you go. Well, our build-out was supposed to be 24,000. I know we're a Sure, so that. if you kind of look at the map and you see the, the yellow areas on the map, those are the areas that have been designated by the census as those urbanized areas, even though they're in an unincorporated um, jurisdiction. And so in those, those yellow areas, it's approximately the 50,000 um, in population when you add up the various different census blocks or tracts. 
um, and then those are then designated by the census as that urbanized area. As Devin pointed out, those are from 2010 uh, census. Mm -hmm. um, we are expecting the 2020 census information to be out this summer. Um, and the expectation is that those yellow areas will slightly grow because of the increase in uh, density that we've had. Well, I can tell you that Granite Bay is not anywhere near 50,000. The, the lines of that the designation areas goes beyond kind of the Granite Bay area. But if they're using census areas, how are they clumping Granite Bay in with the rest of unincorporated Loomis, Penryn, and et cetera? They're, they're taking uh, the census blocks and tracks, pulling them together, adding them together, and then deciding they're, to designate. They're forcing yes. them to be 50,000 when in reality they're not. So it, sure. it includes Granite Bay, Lou, and that whole area, which has then at least 50,000 people. Correct. So it's not just each individual area, but it's that whole area together because they're contiguous. Is that, would that be correct? Correct. Okay. But they're using census blocks, the definition, census. And tracks. Okay. For me, they're scrambling things. They're scrambling the definition because when we did our rezoning, I mean our, our uh, re redistricting drawings, we had to use census areas and, and et cetera to, to decide that. So they were smaller when we were doing the rezoning and now they're bigger when we're doing this. Well, and, and this is frustrating. A lot of people did <laughs> not want to see this happen. There was a, a lot of pushback when this bill came before mm -hmm. the legislature. Lots of folks, um, um, in our communities did not want to see this happen right right and so now we're at this place of it the, the state spoke and now we have to adhere to this mandate which is frustrating especially for a lot of res a lot of our own residents right um so i i hear you right i just don't agree with their redefining things that's where my my problem is if we didn't redefine these things then the state wouldn't be able to force some of this on some of the local jurisdictions i mean the rural areas are the rural areas anyway so the other thing too that i'm wondering is that it says that the applicant is required to sign an affidavit stating that they intend to be the owner occupier of the units on the resulting parcels so now if they build an additional a primary resident on the second half the, after the parcel split they have to reside in both they only have to reside in one so once they split if they reside in one parcel they can sell off the other parcel <clears throat> okay and what if they don't live in it for three years after they sign so that would be uh, something for our code compliance and we we have the affidavit something more for code compliance to deal with okay any legal ramifications besides just code compliance if they swear they're going to live there for three years and they don't uh, it, it what is legally uh, um, included in our code um, as far as meeting um, uh, I'm sorry <laughs> so that was a bad start um, so it would just be code compliance and any of the um, the results from that code violation would be they would be held accountable for Okay, um, let me see if there was anything else. Those were kind of my primary concerns. Um, and I did review the law. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> okay, I think that's really about it. Um, it. My concerns. Thank you very much for. Thank you, Supervisor Jones. Supervisor Gore. Thank you. And would you remind me? It's been a little bit. So, one of my issues has been making sure that residents are aware of what's happening um, next door to them, right? So, when it comes to this, process of splitting lots and a, um, a property owner choosing to do so and doing an application um, where do we have some public notice so that their neighbors are aware that this is happening so the way that this is written and the way that kind of the, the state law has said is this needs to be a ministerial process so there is this this has to go through a staff level review Right. Currently, Which, the ordinance does not have noticing requirements um, as it stands today. Yeah. And, and I understand what the state law is. The question that I have is, 
Is there something that we can do to make sure residents are aware? Not that, you know, we've, and we've had this conversation with some other items, right? And so I can just imagine, especially, you know, maybe um, somebody who's got a quarter of an acre or a half an acre and splits and is building and, you know, the neighbor right down the road is like, what's going on, right? And what's the process and why am I not even aware? And so uh, that that's just super frustrating when you think that land is owned a certain way and then um, there's this by right opportunity for the parcel next door, right? So I, I don't know if there's a way we can do that, but I think that even even a notification of this is what's happening, I think Yeah, can we have a helpful. page on our website that has SB9 updates and or SB9 parcel splits, and then as they come in, they're just posted there. We can't stop them from doing it because under state law, they'd have, they could just ignore our code and do it, correct? Correct. But at least we could keep it posted somewhere obvious for people to look? Is that what you're Well, thinking? not, I mean, not really. If I live next door to you and you're going to split your lot and it somewhat yeah. affects me, right, I'm not going to know that it's SB9. Yeah. You're just going to say I have the right to do it. Okay. I'm not even aware. I'm not even aware. I've had that property for 30 years. I'm not even aware that that's something. And usually the regular process in the county is going through Right. noticing right. right the 300 foot noticing and now that is no longer applicable because of the state law right so I, I just wanted to clarify the item before you is on chapter 16 of the code which is really specifically to the subdivision the, the physical map um, activity that's required to do that generally our noticing requirements are in title 17 and um, they're there uh, very well may be additional amendments to Title 17, which may be able to consider some kind of at least a notification similar to what we've done with the Housing Code amendments. Um, but that would be a subsequent um, action uh, for your board to take today is, okay. is just really on that Chapter 16 for the, the Mapping Act of SB 9. Thank you for that clarification. And I, I, I would like to talk with you further about are there ways to do that in a way that's not super onerous for county staff um, but at the same time, is giving our residents a, head, a heads up of what's happening uh, with the property right next door to them. Because typically, that's what we do, right? I mean, that's actually regular process. And I understand why the state's doing what it's doing. But at the same time, you know, I, I want to be uh, making sure our residents are aware of what's happening right around them. Any other comments or questions, Suzanne? Yes, I have another. Um, so my question on, we spoke about this last board meeting about um, getting identify, uh, identifying properties in, in Granite Bay that can be split. Is that a possibility? Can I get, I know you gave me that big list with all the assessor numbers, but. <laughs> um, so okay, so this, is, this is kind of uh, the list in terms of an analysis that we did under the 2010 map. Um, and so. In Granite Bay, there are a little over, you know, 5,500 parcels. Um, generally speaking, it is any parcel that is zoned for residential single family in that urbanized area as defined by the U.S. Census. And, and so what we've done on our side is um, we have a, a platform, Gridix, that provides an online kind of uh, map and property information that you can see whether or not it's in an urban area and then also what your zoning is. Um, and this has been part of our, our kind of uh, work to clarify what zoning exists in the county. Mm -hmm. Wow, Granite Bay's got the most. Mm-hmm. With mm -hmm. <laughs> small Community plan area. Okay, so it says each lot is required to be at least 1,200 square feet. So together, before you split, that's a 2,400 square foot lot. What is that approximately in acreage? Oh, gosh. Not much. You're asking me to do math really on the, on the fly. <laughs> yeah. so, as they um, often so, say, that's yeah, an acre, school, so a, an acre of, of land is 43,560 square feet. So if you've got uh, 2,400 square feet of that, it's a very, very small section Slip. of that acre. Okay, um, so are there any mandatory requirements that anybody split their parcel, or this is totally mm -hmm. voluntary? It's completely voluntary. Okay, good, thank you. Great. Any public comments on this item?
Hi, Jennifer. Hi, um, I'm back. Um, so, I'm Jennifer. Um, my question is this. I know our state has like this incredible foresight to make sure things run smoothly, but are our sewer systems and water systems going to be able to handle extra hookups and people as well? And I am now very confused because I know when I bought my land, it had a minimum amount of what the property could be. Um, so um, I guess the state law supersedes what we've bought into and what we've paid for, possibly. Um, so just some things to think about because um, I don't think inflation's going down anytime soon and to do these giant projects of redoing a sewer system or water lines to add people to things. Um, also, I don't know if we've had any studies done on what it does to the property values. I would imagine it increases some, but what if you've lived on an acre land and next to you, all of a sudden there's now two houses where there used to be one, what about noise, traffic, all these other considerations um, that don't really sound like they've been taken into account. So um, I don't know that you can actually say no to this, but um, I think these things, um, I don't know if we could, as Placer County, not participate in this or write a letter to the state stating this doesn't work for us because the cost benefit wouldn't actually work out um, I, I think this is something very serious to consider because many people move out here to not be in a small city, to have space around. Um, and I, I think our rights are continually taken away from us in so many ways, and, and this is just like another small way to, to take them. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Any other public comment on this item? Yes, we have one on Zoom. On Zoom? Linda, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Hi there, Board Hi there, of Supervisors. Sorry. Hi there, Board of Supervisors. Linda Rich, Placer County. I've been listening. Am I echoing there? Yeah, can you, if you have the board meeting displaying in the back, can you turn it off, please? Oh, I don't know how to do that. Oh. Let me try something else. I'm sorry. Linda, are you with us? Linda, are you? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Is that better? Yes, thank you. I apologize. No problem. Um, I've been listening to SB9 and um, like the previous speaker, I'm concerned by quite a few things. First of all, let me say that this is new from the state, and um, I don't think we should jump into um, adhering to this bill from the state. I think there's a lot of things to consider. So first of all, I would suggest that we do not move ahead with um, um, accepting this um, the biggest, there's a couple things I see listening to this. First of all, my concern is environmental. There's a lot of people that have one acre properties and for whatever reason, there's environmental concerns, wildlife. Okay, that's one point. The second one is that um, splitting these lots without any consideration from, for anybody that lives near you I think is a huge concern, although it's voluntary on the owner, none of the people around them are aware of it or have any input. And I don't think that's really what a lot of people would want. That's not what this bill was really designed for. It was designed to increase um, for housing because we do have a housing problem and a, and a, and a density problem in certain areas. But um, I think this really needs to be um, thought about more, discussed, and have way more input. Um, it's disturbing in some ways that there's no environmental review um, and that there's no notification requirements. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. 
No further commenters. Okay, no further comment. Uh, Supervisor Jones? <laughs> yeah, just one more. Um, Jennifer made me think of something. Um, being that this is all perfect, uh, purely ministerial as to whether, you know, we split properties and add more residences on it. In an area like Granite Bay where we don't have the, the sewer, sewer systems and stuff uh, like Roseville does, what is their requirement or can we just keep going until we overload the uh, water sewer? I mean, we're on San Juan water. We don't have PCWA, PCWA. So do you know anything about that? So public, uh, so all property splits still have to meet uh, county standards. Um, and they have to meet health and safety. And as part of that is also um, uh, access to um, s public sewer and or uh, adequate uh, sewage um, requirements. So um, the, the split still needs to meet those standards. Okay, so it is, it's not an automatic split. Okay, they so still have to meet the standards. So if we don't have the sewer capacity at some point down the road after we add a bunch more homes, requirement would be either to upgrade that sewer capacity as a part of the the project to meet mm -hmm. the standard to meet the health and safety standards so is water the same of the correct. same concern correct. is yep. that there is adequate water supply correct yep. okay thank you okay any other questions or comments board members so I'm going to just come back to trying to have some clarification, right? So the public noticing part, which I think is important, can can we do public public noticing as a part of this chapter 16, um, or is that part of 17? Because um, I, I do think that that's an important item, right? I mean, this is a state mandate, and you know, one way that at least we can be responsive to our residents is to make sure we're noticing. Um, in, in some shape or form. So can it be addressed under 16 or does it need to be addressed under chapter 17? Generally our noticing is in chapter 17. Um, I think I, I think we need to go back. Yeah, I think staff needs to look at this. We need to take a look. Just because it's a map doesn't mean there aren't noticing requirements. I'm also a little concerned about the code enforcement and how we're going to enforce something if a parcel is sold. Um, personally, I, I'd recommend we continue this item so that staff can come back and, and adequately answer the concerns of the board, but that's just my recommendation. Okay, um, and hearing that, I would ask staff, um, what happens if somebody comes in tomorrow under the state law and says, I wanna do this? What we are still, you faced you would, with? We would still need to process that. You still Correct. need to process Correct. it regardless of, of us delaying our actions. Correct. Correct. Okay. okay. So I just want to make sure mm -hmm. so that we're clear that um, it, it, depending on what we choose to do, that you're still in this dilemma of having to approve these as they move forward. Well, and just to be clear, we have on the books under Chapter 16 um, minor subdivisions, which this is. Mm -hmm. Rossville is a minor subdivision. What SB 9 does, it takes away discretion and mm -hmm. says you must approve these uh, and provides just minor, uh, I shouldn't say minor, it, it's a discrete list of requirements that, that we can look at. You know, adequate sewer, be it um, in ground or um, connecting to the public sewer, uh, one parking space. Uh, so it does tighten what you can condition, but I would also submit that under the Subdivision Map Act, we are already restricted as to how we condition a lot split. Um, this simply re restricts it even further based on the lots that fall within SB 9. Okay. Well, I'll look to the pleasure of the board, Robert. Um, <clears throat> just as a comment, I'm comfortable uh, continuing this. I get the big picture that we're complying with a state uh, requirement. But I think the relevant questions that have come up are uh, interesting. So for example, uh, part of the impact here, what we're dealing with is the state determined incentive to provide for more affordable housing. And we can either agree or disagree with that, but uh, that is what it is. But there could be some interesting provocative questions about uh, compliance internally with state law. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that have been raised and then also some options just locally as to things that we might prefer or support like uh, public noticing uh, whether or not uh, it has any impact on our discretion. And I think uh, both of those things are valid questions to bring back in addition to really it connects back to our state advocacy. Uh, but certainly if there are internal uh, uh, potential conflicts with like potentially the California State Land Map Act, if that's accurate, uh, and this, um, then we should at least know that and at the end of the day um, our discretion may be limited, but I think a full discussion about that would be helpful and constructive. Okay, um, so I'm hearing interest in, in continuing this item. Um, we haven't yet taken that action. I would just ask staff, can you somewhat follow and have some guidance from some of these as far as the proportionality issues or is that all dictated by state law? That's dictated by state law. Okay. Do you need any direction from us on how to handle those in the meantime? I, yeah, I think we would probably. do what uh, we're currently doing, which is when an application comes in, we are deferring back to our objective standards. Okay. Um, Great. Okay. And so I would entertain Cindy, a motion. One more, one more. Okay. Point, one more point to make. I know in your description was that the, the land split has to be proportional, but there's no actual definition of what that proportion is. It's 60-40. It's okay, so it cannot be greater than 60-40. Correct. Okay, and it's specific in the... Correct. Okay. In the state code. Okay. Great, well, I know we're anxious to um, encourage those who can and should um, uh, because the whole point of being in an urbanized area meaning developed with water sewer roads versus sprawl that just goes into ag lands and other areas and new housing developments and i know that that's the rationale behind sb9 whether i agree with it or not that is certainly the intent was to intensify uses of residential where there are services and existing fire services and roads to serve them but um you know, we need to get this right and need to do everything we can to be creative in how we implement the state law. I'd encourage County Council and you to get together as soon as possible so that we're not spending a lot of public time up here when we're not in agreement yet on uh, at staff level. So that would be great. Okay. Okay, I have a motion to continue, continue this item. And Supervisor Gore seconds. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you for Thank the you. time. A good discussion. Okay, with that, we can go back to our timed item in which we have two lovely people here to present to us on our artists. Let me get to my agenda back um, to our Placer Artist Tour presentation on the 21, uh, 2021 Placer Artist Tour. And we have Janet and Karen here. Hi. Yes. Hi. I think we know most of yes. you. I'm Janet Nicholson, Nicholson Blown Glass. I lived in Auburn 42 years with our business and always active in the arts community. And my co-chair of the event this year, Karen Killebrew, who is also very active in the arts community and supporting other community things. Things. <laughs> She's very active in the, in the community. So we um, are very happy to be here and able to say thank you very much for your um, revenue sharing support last year. Um, as you know, we were, are no longer hosted by the Arts Council of Placer County. And so we formed our own organization last year. Um, we're now, we have a fiscal receiver for the last two years, but we're now transitioning into a 501c3. So we're moving forward, and this year, um, our goal is uh, sustainability. Um, we've just had fabulous support from the community. I think last year, a number of organizations came out to partner. Uh, we partnered last year with the Auburn Symphony, um, which was very important. And all of our grants, cash, and in-kind that we <laughs> we work on obtaining covers our operating budget. So we're doing well, I think, moving into the next year. Um, we did a survey on, that's online um, 
plasterartisttour.org. Uh, we're trying very hard to now collect data and collect um, emails and try to, oh, I think you do have the copy of the survey. I'm not sure if you have that, but it's, on, it's online. I want to change it. Oh, I'll let you do it. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what we're supposed to do. There it is, okay. Aha, uh -huh. so our survey. Well, last year we had 112 artists showing in 66 locations and six galleries. Um, we did a survey out to the public and had people sign into the studios. So we estimated um, over 5,000 attendees over the three days. Um, the fun part for me was really to discover the zip codes. We had 20 um, California zip codes. Uh, people who attended and three adjacent states. So this is now in its 29th year and it has such support from all over well beyond Placer County that we are um, hoping to continue to be a legacy event that actually helps the economy and draws uh, people into, into our communities. Um, we have 33% first time attendees, 74% made art purchases, um, $258,150 um, is what we estimated in art sales through um, surveying our artists. 97% uh, planned to attend the tour again. Uh, we had um, close to 50% um, who uh, attended our um, local restaurants and bought lunch on the way. So we're trying to, trying to collect data of that kind so we can be Ongoing support. <laughs> Go ahead, Karen. And one of the most important things um, that this tour has done over the last 29 years is to develop our artist community. We have artists, last year on the tour, we had four sets of artists showing with their adult artist children, which means we've literally raised a generation of artists with this tour. And many of the artists have moved to national. Um, accomplishments as a result of this tour. Many of them now work only on commission. They don't need to be on the tour anymore. So we are literally developing artists as we go. We mentor them along the way. Um, last year we had a real emphasis on a regional focus. We had eight regional leaders that helped mentor artists, especially artists new to the tour. We do inspect their studios. We work with them on the amount of work they have available to show and just really make sure that they are on a professional development path. Um, the, Janet mentioned the economic contribution. We've known for many, many years um, that this tour does make a big economic contribution. Uh, and, and this year we have a new sponsorship category called Dine and Drink. We're going after some of these um, restaurants and wineries and breweries that we know people go to and asking them to uh, spend $100 on a co-op ad in our tour guide and on our website. We think that'll be really successful. So as Janet mentioned, we, we have documented this. People do eat, drink, buy gas, and stay here during this tour. So I really, um, looking ahead to 2022, for years, we've been wanting to do two weekends on this tour. And for years, artists have been 50-50, yes, no. We're doing it. <laughs> we are doing it this year because the public survey was overwhelmingly in favor of two weekends. So we have made the first weekend, which is a traditional Veterans Day weekend, mandatory for our artists. The second weekend, we're calling an encore weekend. And we expect about 50% of our artists to participate that weekend. Not only does that allow more time for people to visit artist studios, but it also allows time for some of the artists to go out and visit their fellow artist studios. So we're really excited about that. Um, this year so far, we are equal to last year, 111 artists, six galleries. We have a new art school category. We have six art schools that have signed up for the tour. Two of those participated as galleries last year, which really was not a perfect um, way for them to participate. So uh, the other thing we have on our artist directory this year, we're going to have a teaching category. We've surveyed our artists and their application. Do you teach? Do you teach children? Do you teach adults? And that will be available on their artist directory profile because that's one of the questions artists get asked really almost more than everything else. I'm sure most of you have attended the Taste of the Tour preview show and, uh, and the reception at Blue Line Arts, the preview show 
will be on exhibit November 4th through the 20th. The Taste of the Tour reception is November 5th. You will all be receiving VIP invitations for a 4.30 special event for the Taste of the Tour reception. And this is really the way people start to plan their tour. They come to Blue Line. There's one piece from every artist on the tour. They pick up their tour guide. They start looking at the artists. They start looking at the map. They start planning. And literally, artists have people coming say, oh, I saw your piece at Blue Line. I'm here to see more. So this is really um, our you know, premier introduction to the tour each year. Um, this is our, our new website, placerartisttour.org. The survey that Janet mentioned is posted on the website on our homepage. I, I really encourage you to go and look at that and get a few more details about what we've done. And really, more than anything, we so appreciate the county's support on this Thank tour. You. It really is a very, very important thing for our community, and we just appreciate all of you so much. And I thought of one more very important point for all of you, is that this is a county-wide tour. Uh, 29th year, so it began in Auburn. Most of our artists are in Auburn, but we've made an extra effort this year to reach out to um, the under, uh, served communities. Um, for example, Lincoln last year had two artists. We're up to, I think, 10 artists this year in Lincoln. So we've been out recruiting in the different regions to make sure it truly represents the whole county. Any questions? Um, I don't have any. Just a, a couple of comments, if I may. Um, last number of years my husband and I have gone on the tour and done exactly what you said where have we not been before I've seen areas of the county I've not traveled to before uh, and last year we did do our part to spend a little money not only with an artist but a local farm stand stopped and I made my husband um, buy some items as well so I, um, I really appreciate the work you're doing this is such a wonderful benefit to our community. Uh, everyone out on the tour, as we met folks, just enjoyed it so much. Um, so I just really appreciate the work you and your team are doing to Thank you. really promote and, the and arts. Really, you're, you're absolutely right. It is the best way to get out on the back roads of California yeah. at Placer County in California. And my favorite thing is just discovering these creative um, places that artists have chosen to live and create art. You know, that is just so inspiring to me. And Karen and I are both extremely passionate. <laughs> Can you tell? <laughs> to, to make this continue and make it happen and, and go into our, our future. So we are working hard. We have uh, a tour coordinator and a strong staff and regional leaders. I shouldn't say staff. Steering Contractors. committee. <laughs> steering committee and a couple of people helping us on contract too. So we are in it to stay. So thank you very much. Thank you for thank your you. Yeah all your efforts and and Robert wanted to make a comment yeah, just here a couple well. one congratulation on your progress and um, Two weeks and uh, dealing with the change the transition and then um, really appreciate the data collection that makes it a lot easier for us uh, mm -hmm. to assist which it's I think, really important yep it is yeah um, and just look forward to, to more great work but thank you thank you we had a pre-registration uh, on our website for attendees, and that helped us build our um, email list and know who's going on the tour. So we'll continue that as well. We'll be back. <laughs> Great. Thanks for coming, Thank and thanks all. for being patient till we got to you it's today. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Is there any public comment on this item? Great. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask that we move to item. Uh, 14D, because Rebecca's sitting here, and start hopefully ready to go on 14D, Placer Vineyard Specific Plan, Property 1A, Phase 3, Construction Inspection Services Contract. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Gustafson, members of the board. Rebecca Tabor, Deputy Director for the Engineering and Surveying Division of the Community Development Resource Agency. I'm going to kick this off with an introduction of a familiar face uh, in a new county role. This is Alice Atherton. She is a senior engineer in our division now. She is responsible for facilitating our many specific plan projects during their construction phases. And today she will be presenting this item for additional consultant construction inspection services. 
Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Gustafson and members of the board. Um, I'm here today requesting your board, um, one, authorize the purchasing manager to award a contract to TRC Companies of Sacramento, California, under an existing master services agreement, SCN 101518, to perform construction inspection services for the construction of the Placer Vineyard Specific Plan Property 1A, Phase 3, improvements in the amount of $425,600 and to execute contract change orders in an amount up to 10% of the contract amount, $42,560, and also to approve and authorize the Community Development Resource Agency Director or designee to execute a construction inspection services agreement and any amendments thereto with the ex excuse me, the constructing developer, Lennar Homes of California LLC, to fund both consultant inspection services and a portion of county staff time for the inspection and to manage the contract. So property 1A is located south of Baseline Road and west of Wallerga Road. The phase three improvements include the construction of Stargazer Drive, that's approximately 2,000 linear feet, the extension of Town Center Avenue, approximately 1,700 linear feet, the Village 3 subdivision, which includes 246 residential lots, and the Lot 14 Class 1 trail. That's approximately 2,400 linear feet of meandering path, and that's located south of the two roadways and subdivisions. TRC Companies of Sacramento is on the county's qualified list and responded to the county's request for quote to perform inspection services for the aforementioned improvements. The execution of the construction inspection services agreement with Lennar Homes will allow the con constructing developer to pay for the inspection services and then as well as pay for county staff time to manage the contract with TRC. So for pro projects of incredible size which have construction going on for a multitude of improvement plans. We don't have the internal staffing resources to cover the inspection, and because of that, we consistently enter into these agreements, as is our intent here today. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Alice and Rebecca. Um, Bonnie, you had questions? Uh, no questions, but uh, thank you. I had an opportunity to uh, drive out there last weekend, actually see some of the homes, um, and it is going like gangbusters. I was surprised to see how much has been accomplished and there are folks already living out there. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is obviously needed, and so I'm very supportive, but it's quite something to see, um, and it's a lot to keep up with. So appreciate the hard work that you and your team are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or question board members? Any public comment on this item? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion. Supervisor Holmes and Gore, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to see you both. Um, and I am going to skip temporarily 14 B and C and come back to those a little later and try to get through some of our other items because one of those calls for discussion. Um, and so we'll go on to uh, 15A, Facilities Management, SB 863, Mental Health Facility, and SB 844, Vocational Training. And they're both on Zoom. Good morning, Good Lisa morning. Jane. Uh, Chairman, members of the board, Lisa James, uh, Facilities Management, Senior Project Manager. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. The items we're seeking action on are the adoption of a resolution authorizing the issuance of a notice of a conditional award for the design build contract for the SB 863 mental health facility in the amount of $18,928,625 and the award of the design bill contract for the SB 844 vocational training and medium security facility in the amount of $37,161,742. Both to Clark and Sullivan Construction and Broward Builders. 
We are also asking your board to adopt two resolutions for the approval of an increase in the county's cash, con cash contribution to an updated amount of $13,085,040 and the SP for the SP project and a $13,543,234 increase for the SB 844 project compatible with state lease revenue bond financing. Next slide, please. So a brief overview on the progression to get to this point. In August of 2015, the county applied for 40 million in state funding. And in November of that same year, we were conditionally awarded 9.5 million in state funding for the construction of the SB 863 project. We then applied for additional funding in February of 2017 and then in June of 2017, the county was conditionally awarded 30 million for the construction of the SB project. Next slide, please. In May of 2017, the county entered into a project delivery and construction agreement with the State Public Works Board and BSCC for the SB 864 project. Then in November of 2018, the county entered into a PDCA for the SB 844 project. In September of 2021, your board adopted two resolutions to execute the required agreements with the BSCC to lease and have access to the Santucci Justice Center for the development and construction of these two partially state funded projects. Next slide, please. Also on September 14th, staff reported that the RFP phase resulted in the recommendation to move three design build entities to phase two of the RFP, the proposal phase. As part of this item, your board authorized the Director of Facilities Management to issue stipends to the two unsuccessful proposers in the amount of 50,000 each, totaling an amount not to exceed 100,000. Staff reported that the RFP inf um, informs proposers that the county intends to award two separate construction contracts to this successful DV entity, and the staff would return to your board for the contract award. Prior to the release of uh, the RP, one team withdrew from the competition. Procurement and facilities management staff decided to proceed with the current process with the two remaining entities, considering their qualifications rather than reissuing phase one, leading to further delay and significant cost escalation. Consequently, the two competing entities were each allowed three confidential meetings with an evaluation committee to review and provide feedback on the development of their proposals. The evaluation committee, a seven member panel, was made up of representatives from the sheriff's office, county executive office, sheriff's consultant, and facilities management. Final proposals from both entities were submitted on March 4th, 2022, with formal presentations on March 23rd, 2022. Based on the best value criteria, CS Broward Builders with Arrington Watkins Architects was selected as the top print team. Next slide, please. So just to reorient everyone with where these projects are going to be built on the Santucci Justice Center, um, in the upper uh, right-hand corner is the minimum security building, and this is where the SB 844, the medium security and vocational training um, facility will be. As part of that project, we're also adding um, some paved staffed parking, which is the site to note on this map. And the SB 863 project, the medium security, I mean, excuse me, the mental health facility, will be at the um, connected to the existing jail, which is shown in the bottom right corner. Next slide, please. The design of the SB863 project will provide a single story, approximately 16,000 square foot building, consisting of three 15 bed pods, totaling 45 beds. They will be constructed with 12 inch precast concrete panels containing individual cells, day rooms, recreation yards, a central officer custody station, multi-purpose counseling interview rooms, exam rooms, a rear plumbing chase for maintenance, and miscellaneous support spaces. A separate and secure corridor will be built to connect the new building to the existing jail. The new mental health facility will provide acute mental health treatment, as well as expand treatment for those that are deemed incompetent to stand trial in the jail-based competency treatment program. Next slide, please. So unfortunately for security reason, we're unable to show the proposed floor plan design, but this slide here shows an example of what a day room environment would include along with the exterior of the new building and how it will connect to the existing jail. 
The new, the new precast concrete panels will be finished with elastomeric paint to match the existing campus buildings. And the rear chase plumbing design mentioned in my previous slide decreases the disruption to the programming and day room time for the inmates and will allow maintenance staff easier access to conduct their preventative maintenance tasks. The, the building shown at the top right-hand corner is the new building and the, the building shown in the middle is the existing gel and it shows you the connection between the two buildings. Next slide, please. The design of the SB 844 project will provide a single story, approximately 38,000 square foot building constructed with 12 inch precast concrete panels. It will include two new housing units with cell housing for 120 inmates, single and double bunks, day rooms, recreation yards, and multi-purpose classrooms for programming. The building will also include vocational shops, in-person and video visitation, a public lobby, office space for administrative staff and, or excuse me, administrative and staff support, and new staff parking. Once released, the new vocational training facility will provide job training for employment opportunities with the goal to help reduce recidivism in Placer County. Next slide, please. The vocational shops will include a welding shop. The welding will be a hybrid of virtual and hands-on, a vinyl printing shop, construction multi-use, embroidery and vocational programming support. So, next slide, please. So at this time, I'm going to turn over the presentation to Captain David Powers, and he will provide you with a sheriff's staff, staff operational update for the two projects. Good morning. I see Jeff on the line, but I don't see David. Oh, there he's coming. I see Dave, yeah. OK. He's there. We'll give him a minute. Dave, are you able to join in? Mm -hmm. He said his computer locked up. Okay. Well, uh, are there any questions for Lisa while we're waiting for Dave to join us? Yeah, I think we were all briefed on this extensively, so. Yeah, I mean, I can I continue appreciate. on if you want, and then we can come back to his operational update if you like. Sure. Okay, if we could proceed to the next slide, please. So project inflation and escalation, there's been a significant increase in costs due to inflation and escalation um, since the county entered into the PDCA with the state. Um, the California Construction Cost Index that the um, Department of Finance has been utilizing for the public works projects increased 37.1% from January 2017 to March of 2022. In 2021, it increased by 13.85% and another 7.18% in the first three months of 2022. If the, current, the trend continues, it would be 29% by the end of this year. Several public works projects have received bids in the last part of 2021 and early 2022, up to 41% over their budget. Typical escalation is around three to three and a half percent. So if we'd stayed in that range, the project costs would be what they were originally estimated at. But being that the state's um, share is a fixed amount, the county is forced to absorb that escalation. Um, next slide, please. So this chart shows the original construction cost estimated at 10 million with the current estimated construction cost at 18.9 million. The total construction pro um, costs were originally estimated at 13 million the current estimated construction total project cost is 22.5 million with the state's contribution remaining the same at 9.5 million. The county's cash match was originally 3.5 million and the current estimate is 13 million. Next slide, please. For the SB 844 project, the original construction estimate was 26.3 million. The current construction estimate is 37.1. The total project cost was originally estimated at 33 million and the current estimated total project cost is 43.5 million with the state's contribution remaining the same at 30 million. 
The county's cash contribution contr cash contribution was originally 3.3 million, and the current cash contribution is 13.5 million. Next slide, please. So the funding for the SBA 63, there's um, again, state funding of 9.5 million, and then general fund capital reserves, public safety fund, capital facilities, in, uh, excuse me, and the American Re uh, Rescue Plan Act. The funding for SBA 44 is coming from, again, the 30 million for the state funding, general fund capital reserves, public safety fund, and the capital facilities impact fees. Funding for the fiscal year 2022-23 for the SB863 mental health facility project is available in the capital projects fund through pre previous contributions from general fund capital reserves and pending state reimbursement. Mm -hmm. Funding for fiscal year 2023-24 will be received through the annual budget process from the public safety fund and state reimbursement, including ARPA. Funding for the fiscal year 2022-23 SB 844 vocational training and medium security facility is available in the capital projects fund through previous contributions from capital facilities impact fees, general fund capital reserves and pending state reimbursement. Funding for fiscal year 2023-24 will be received through the annual budget process from the public safety fund and state reimbursement. There is no additional funding being requested from the general fund for either project. Next slide, please. The design and permit process is anticipated to start in July of this year with construction starting later this fall, depending on state fire marshal and building department approvals with construction completion in early, July, early 2024 for both projects. Next slide. To receive state lease bond revenue from the state, the county is required to provide a resolution for each project to authorize and approve an increase in the county's cash hard match in an updated amount of $13,085,040 for the SBA 63 project, an increase of $9,575,040 and $13,543,234 for the SBA 44 project an increase of $10,209,901, compatible with the state lease revenue bond financing. The state also requires a resolution authorizing the issuance of a notice of conditional award to CS Broward for each of the SB projects. This resolution also authorizes the Director of Facilities Management or designate to execute the two proposed design build contracts with CS Broward for the SB projects upon receipt of all Department of Finance approvals to take all necessary actions to finalize the design bill contracts and receive state lease bond revenues towards the SB projects and approve any necessary change orders in an amount not to exceed 210,000 per contract. These resolutions are attached, require the, the re, these resolutions as attached require your board's approval. Both design bill contracts are on file with the clerk of the board with your board's approval of the actions requested today and Department of Finance final approvers, approvals and State Public Works Board will initiate interim financing in June, followed by the issuance of lease revenue bonds in July. Based on this schedule, staff will award and execute the design build contracts after the notice is issued by the state. So this that concludes our presentation, um, unless Dave has got his... Great, thank you very much, Lisa. Um, board members, questions or comments? Bonnie? Thank you, so I appreciate the update and I do have a question and I'm glad to see Daniel in here. So I certainly, terrible to see the increase in costs, right? And that we have to fund this out of our own, well, it's coming out of the public safety fund. So I, I really appreciate that. But Daniel, there was a slide, slide 12, that has the possible project inflation escalation up by 29%. And so my question is, like, have we included what we anticipate those inflation rates to be on this project? Because if we say yes to what we're at now, do we anticipate that we're gonna have to include more money um, as the cost of the project escalate over the next year or two? Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> good morning, still, supervisors and Supervisor Gore. I actually think that question is better uh, posed to Lisa James as the project manager who scoped the cost of the project. Okay. So the, the costs for escalation have been included in the, the costs from the contractor. So they have built in escalation in their project costs. Okay, so we're, we're hopeful that we're not gonna have to pull even more dollars out of that public safety fund in the future. Yes. Okay, thank you. And you know, thank you, Daniel. I guess my other question too is, I'm, I would anticipate that there are other counties who have some approval of dollars from the state of California um, and may not even be able to actually pull the trigger on these on these projects. So do you have any background on that? Or maybe somebody in the sheriff's office might be can, aware. Can you hear me, Supervisor? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, yeah, so I'm sorry, I think Dave's having some technical issues. Um, I don't have the exact staffing numbers in front of me. I know there's a question about that. Uh, for 844, the existing minimum security staff would be moved over to um, staff the area for the vocational training center. Uh, staff for the 30 bed 863 um, facility would be fully funded through the Department of State Hospitals. Um, and regarding your second question, yes, we did put something out through the uh, email exchange to the California State Sheriff's Association. We found multiple counties that were struggling with the same issue. Um, a few of them just abandoned their endeavors. Um, and I know, I believe one, I believe it was Santa Clara actually um, just walked away from it and funded it fully through their, I'm assuming general fund dollars or however they fund it. Thank you. And I, I think we might've had this conversation that there might, I don't know, would there ever be an opportunity to come back to the state and ask for, I mean, I'm thinking you already yep. asked for the dollars, but if there's an opportunity to go back to the state and ask um, for these additional dollars, we certainly want to make sure we can do that. And I might jump in here because I don't, I know in my briefing I suggested um, staff has done everything they can at staff to staff level and whether or not we need to elevate it to our electeds to say you've got a state surplus, you've held this up, the inflation is rampant, you want these facilities, please, you know, jump up your contribution. So I hope we can get a letter like that out on behalf of the board because I do think we need to elevate it and stand behind our staff to try to support more state funding for these projects because i agree bonnie that it's they've stood in the way and now we've got this huge state surplus and these are very needed facilities robert you had a comment yeah, and then, well, based uh, on i just Sam? want to amplify uh support of the last two comments by cindy and bonnie um but kind of taking a longer term perspective i think i want to congratulate staff sheriff's office particularly facilities uh, for the success with our grants. Um, I think the direction we're taking actually is the wave of the future and I would only comment that um, if we can build on a solid uh, public protection system and endeavor in these kinds of things, particularly with grant monies, uh, in the long run I think we might have much better outcomes and even uh, more reduced costs. So that last part is a pitch to uh, communicate back to the board over some years in the future, the data and the success that we do have with this program. I, I have high hopes for it and, I, and great expectations. Great. Suzanne. And I would like to express my opinion on some of the state funding because I'm disappointed that the state is only funding 9.5 on mental health facilities and yet 30 on the uh, vocational training I think the state is short-sighted in that having served for 10 years on the County Board of Education, they bring vocational training in, they take it away. They bring it in, they take it away. If the state would spend some money on vocational training in the high schools and get these people on that track before they become incarcerated, we wouldn't have to be back throwing all of this money. So I just wanted to express my concern of the state's priorities. I think we need a lot more money going into the mental health facilities, especially if we're going to try to solve some of our homeless problems um, in the county. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know Dave has joined us. I don't know if we have any staffing, further staffing questions on this item. Did any board members want? I don't think it's needed. Um, is there any public comment on this item? 
none on Zoom and none here in the room. Uh, so we have a number of uh, actions to take uh, on this item and they will require individual votes, so bear with me on item number one, adopting a resolution authorizing the issuance of the notice of conditional award for the design build contract. I won't read the whole thing again. Do I have a motion? Wygant and Jones. Roll call on each of these. Gore. Aye. Wygant. Yes. Holmes. Aye. Jones. Aye. Gustafson. Yes. Item number two, adopt a resolution authorizing and improving an increase in the county's cash contribution in an updated amount of 13 million and change. <laughs> okay, Supervisor Wygant and Jones again. Gore. Why can't? Yeah. Holmes, right. Jones, yeah. Gustafson. Yes. Number three, adopt a resolution authorizing the issuance of the notice of conditional award for the design build contract. Why can't and Jones again? Roll call. Gore. Why can't? Yeah. Holmes, right. Jones, yeah. Gustafson. Aye. And finally, adopt a resolution authorizing and approving an increase in the county's cash contribution of 13,540,000 compatible, I won't read the exact number, compatible with the state's lease revenue bond financing. Second. Wygant and Jones. Gore. Aye. Wygant. Yeah. Holmes. Aye. Jones. Yeah. Gustafson. Aye. Complicated to do that. Well done, staff. Thank you to all yeah. who worked Thank on this. You. Um, and now, because I was neglectful before, we are going to move to item 18A, uh, because they've been waiting here patiently in the room, and uh, I skipped over them on that last one. I apologize. Thanks for being patient with us. This is 349 of our board book, and this is the budget amendment to allocate park dedication fees to the Auburn Area Recreation and Parks District. Well, thank you very much for moving us up. Andy Fisher with Parks and Open Space again here with Kale Muscott, District Administrator for the Auburn Area Park and Recreation District. And the item before you right now is to appropriate to uh, pass a budget amendment appropriating $445,000 from park dedication fee uh, area number five and authorizing the Director of Parks and Open Space to execute an agreement with Auburn Area Park and Recreation District to spend those funds to develop their 24-acre park, uh, which is adjacent to Regional Park in North Auburn. So I'd like to just talk about the park dedication fee program briefly and then turn it over to Kale to talk about the worthy project that they're requesting funding for. We talked earlier this morning about uh, various assessments, uh, lighting and landscape, zones of benefit. Those are ongoing annual property tax-based funding. Uh, park dedication fees are one-time funds. They are a fee paid at the time of land division or building permit, so it's a one-and-done fee. They are collected for capital improvements uh, to build up the infrastructure of recreation for increasing population. And we divide those fees into 16 different geographic areas. District uh, um, park fee area number five uh, represents Auburn, North Auburn, and the Meadow Vista area, so they're centric toward projects in that area. And, um, and the, uh, let's see, what else do I have to say about that? Recently, um, quite a bit of funding has come into that district from the Timberline Development, just across Bell Road from the Placer County Government Center campus. Uh, if this project is approved, if the funding is approved, we would still have a balance in that account of $195,312. Um, I will mention, too, in terms of just balances and, and cash flow in that account, uh, over the past five or six years, um, Kale has met with our department. We've discussed our, relative, our respective capital improvements. Uh, the, most of the use of those fees is used by Auburn Recreation District. We've used some and recently appropriated 200000 to the Hidden Falls Expansion Project. We also uh, occasionally have school districts that ask for some of those fees for some of their projects. But um, we have, over the past six years, tried to um, pre-plan projects, cash flow, and it's been very productive. We've been able to appropriate funds, make those recommendations to the projects when they're needed, and fund, I think, everything that's come before us in a timely way. Uh, and that's the case here today as well, even though it's a pretty big ask of $445,000. It is something that we've been planning for quite some time. I'll mention uh, finally that the Meta Vista and North Auburn Max uh, both heard this item and expressed their support. 
as well as the Parks Commission that recommended approval of this item on March 17th. They recommended that unanimously. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Kale Muscott to describe the project that's before you today. Great. Welcome, Kale. Thank you. There we go. All right, thank you, and since it's lunchtime, I'll make my presentation uh, just like only 30 minutes. Uh, just joking. Okay, so real quick, starting out, uh, th actually, there's a, a change in this. It's no longer called the 24-acre property. It's now Marriott Meadows. We went through a park naming process. I know that supervisor homes can speak to the Marriott family, but they used to own, own all the land that mm -hmm. the current park sits in, the church, the uh, a bunch of stuff up there. So anyways, it is now called Marriott Meadows, and if we could advance uh, the, the slide here real quick. Oh. Right. So just a real quick where it's at. You can see it's kind of the North Auburn next to the existing regional park. Uh, there's a little bit more of a, a close-up of it. So this one, one screen should say, instead of 24-acre parcel, Marriott Meadows. And there is a um, master plan for the, the property with a little blow up in the corner, basically, and it's on your list, but um, the, the uh, amenities at the park will be a dog park, open turf area, uh, central uh, plaza kind of pavilion area with a splash pad, um, picnic tables, um, uh, shaded picnic areas, uh, there'll be some bocce courts, um, of course some restrooms, and one of the best features up there is just the walking pathways that will go through that property. It's a um, nice kind of oak woodland, and we're going to try to keep as much of that as possible. There's already existing trails up there. We'll um, just enhance them, and it'll be a great place for folks to go walk. As opposed down to the park, where can, which can get a little warm, uh, this is a, a nice cool area. Uh, you can kind of see some of the, that's an existing trail that's up there. So and once again, the, the amenities. And what makes this all possible is the fact that we, after our third, this is our third time that we applied for um, uh, California Statewide Park Grant. Uh, we received it for uh, to the tune of $2.389 million. And we're gonna leverage that with um, some of our own funding, um, some of our reserve funding, um, some funding through the sale of an existing um, park property that we're not using and the mitigation funds that it's about a $3.5 million project that we will put out to bid this winter with the hopes of getting started in April of 23. And besides that, what did I want to say? Um, since this has been our third time we've gone for this, we've worked extensively with the neighbors in the area um, on the park design. Um, and we've got it down to the point now where whenever we do talk to the neighbors, we're talking about fence design and gate design. So uh, we've got it down pretty, pretty narrow. So That's you're going to cede your other 27 minutes? Yes, I will. Okay. <laughs> okay, any questions or comments from the board? Jim. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Kale. I uh, just want to make a couple comments about the Marriott family. They don't own hotels. Okay, not them. Not that Marriott. But it's a longtime pioneer uh, family in North Auburn. Uh, owned quite a bit of property over the years, particularly when the property wasn't worth anything. Uh, but they uh, were very instrumental in the Parkside Church uh, on uh, Richardson Drive. Uh, and if you go down on the west side of uh, um, the west side of 49 down Dry Creek Road, there's several uh, rental properties that they built many years ago that in, in good, good standing. But uh, a great community uh, advocates for Placer County. So I'm really pleased to see them get that recognition. Uh, did, uh, I thought I saw that there was going to be a uh, disc golf course. No, not on that property. No, not on that property. And I am very pleased to see that there's going to be a dog park. And yeah, there's no dog, dog park, park in North Auburn. What's so funny about that? I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, I didn't know if there's going to be any opportunities uh, to name that dog park. Doug Park. Uh, I've got some people that uh, would like to get, be involved in naming, if there's an opportunity to name okay. the Doug Park. We don't have any plans right now, but that's not to say we won't in the future. Um, next up, we are going to be working on naming some other aspects at Regional Park, the existing park, okay. um, based on some interest from um, UAIC, um, who also, by the name, when we, went, when we went through the process of naming the park, they approached us. Um, the ball field that's, uh, this ball field, right, 
well, you can see it. I'm pointing here like you guys can see. Up there, um, with this pointer, you can see is, there's an existing ball field where it says Field C. Yeah. That is now Ridge Runners Field. Oh. And that name came to us from UAIC, the, your, their baseball team they've had since the 30s. All right. Um, on and off, up through the 90s, was called Ridge Runners. And oh. they just thought it'd be great if, Absolutely. you know, they asked if we could yeah. get that ball field name for their their baseball team. We've got some really cool photographs that we're going to use for a, a kiosk up there, like a, a picture of the team from the 1930s. Oh, so, yeah. Oh, that's an exciting project. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any other public comment on this item? Seeing none in the room and none on Zoom, then I'd entertain a motion. Motion Holmes, second Gore. All in favor? Oh, roll call. Sorry. Megan, you're earning your keep today. Why <laughs> can't? Yes. Holmes, Aye. Jones, yes. Gustafson. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that's a much better name than 24 acres because we still live with 64 acres in Tahoe City, and I don't know why. Okay. Um, now we're going to go back, and I, I apologize for all the jumping around, but um, I'd like to go back now to item 15B. Uh, found on page 325 of the board packet. This is the Atherton Tenant Improvement Project Change Order Approval and Authorization with S.W. Allen, Construction, Inc. Uh, yes, good morning, uh, Chairman Gustafson and uh, fellow members of the board. I'm Bill Lardner. I'm an architect with facilities management uh, here at the county. And uh, the item I have is on the Atherton Tenant Improvement Project and <clears throat> requesting your approval for construction change orders. Um, when we first uh, got your approval for award of contract, we had included uh, just $210,000 for uh, designated specifically for change orders, which is uh, a very small amount. It's less than 2% of the contract value. And uh, knowing that it was um, so small for a large remodel project such as Atherton, um, we included uh, additional contingency money within that original budget approval. <clears throat> so this, uh, this would not require any additional funding for the overall project. Uh, so the items I have are for you to approve change order number three for the SW Allen contract uh, for Atherton in the amount of $216,303 and thereby increasing the uh, total contract amount accordingly. The second item I have is um, with, with caution, I've estimated uh, that future change order items uh, will require approximately $290,000 more. And I would ask that your approval uh, allow our director of facilities management or designate to approve the potential remaining change orders uh, that will finish out the project. So um, with that, I'd also like to give a small update on the project. Uh, we're in uh, month seven of a 13 month uh, process. So construction is still uh, very much happening and uh, the roofing of the main part of the building has just been completed uh, as of yesterday and we're moving on to the second floor area upper roof uh, actually today uh, and <clears throat> i'm very happy to report that we were able to provide a uh, the new elections warehouse in phase one with uh, complete with lighting power painting new insulation and uh, in time for the uh, basically the number one need of the clerk reporter at this time was so that they could make preparations for election day. That'd be June 7th and uh, of course in November as well. So there it, the uh, facility is providing that same elections warehouse uh, as per the uh, remodel design. So that was very uh, timely for us. We, we had been thinking that we'd have to have a temporary spot in the building for that but uh, the contractor was able to uh, to uh, complete the work and make it uh, usable for uh, as an elections warehouse 
So, uh, and the work is progressing. We're doing the phase two work and as well as uh, fairly extensive site work, which uh, is uh, to enhance the area, but also to uh, mainly to provide accessibility upgrades for the surrounding site, parking, et cetera. So with that, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Great, thank you, Bill. Appreciate your patience today until we got to your item. Uh, any questions, board members? Any pub, oh. I do. Okay, I do. thank you, um, Supervisor Jones. You bet, thank you, Chair, Madam Chair. <laughs> um, so my question is, um, so originally um, we authorized this contract and originally not to exceed 11,232,391, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And now with all of the additional increases, the change orders, will the final contract be 11,932,391? Yes, that's correct. The, the contractor's uh, total contract value for SW Allen will be the 11 million. 932,391. If there are more hiccups, though, will we have to approve additional change orders? Well, that's, that's including uh, roughly $290,000 more at this time, so that we still have that authorization to expend that money. And I'm very cautiously optimistic that that will finish the project. Okay, great, thank you. We'll keep our fingers crossed. I'm not seeing any other questions. Is there any public comment on this item? Not, okay, not seeing any. Then I'd entertain motions on the change order and direct, okay. Great, thank you. Holmes and Gore. And all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. All right. Uh, we have quite thank a few. You, board. Thank you, Bill. Uh, we have quite a few items before uh, lunch break. Or do you want to try to get through them all, board members, uh, before the lunch break? Or take. Um, we've got some people waiting here. We have people on Zoom waiting to present to us. Um, so I'm just going to ask what you'd like to do. I would say not all. <laughs> <laughs> It is a lot of items. So we, um, you want to break at 1230? Okay, so let's try to get through. Uh, let's go back to 14 B and C. See if we can get those in. Hmm? I know, we have uh, three items for DPW, and then we have nine items for HHS. I've counted them all. So that's why I was asking what we should do. Okay. Not hearing any suggestions, let's go to 14B on the fireworks. Oh. As I say, I, what I would suggest your fastest items are going to be your DPW items. Go ahead and clear in all of DPW, let them go out. Okay. Uh, Cedra knows that they're holding and they're totally fine. Okay. And they're comfortable with that. So, that so thank you for communicating with Cedra <laughs> that they're totally fine waiting on their two items for a while. Okay, so Kevin, I guess you get to get up. And we're going to take these in which order? We want to go to the supplemental first? I would suggest going just in, in order. In order? Okay. So we'll do 19A, the Forest Hill Road High Friction Surface Treatment Project. Phil is going to present this? Yes, he's Zoom. Yes, good afternoon, uh, board members and Madam Chair. Phil Vashon with the Department of Public Works before you today. Uh, we're going to talk about our high friction surface treatment project, which we're excited about. And I was trying to get my video working, but I guess it's not working. So you'll have to look at the black screen. I apologize. Uh, so we have two actions before you today. One is to adopt a resolution awarding construction contract number 001286 to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, Truesdale Corporation of California, Inc. of Tempe, Arizona, for the base bid of competitive bid number 20263 for the construction of the Forest Hill Road High Friction Surface Treatment Project in the amount of $2,769,769. $769. 
also to execute the contract with risk management and county council concurrence and authorize the director of public works to execute change orders consistent with the public contract code up to amount of $150,988 as needed. Uh, this is a great project, in my opinion, for public works. Uh, high friction surface treatment is a special type of surfacing that uses a very coarse and jagged type of aggregate called bauxite, which is designed to keep tires on the roadway in curvy conditions especially when the pavement is wet. So that's uh, really wet conditions is ideal uh, for this stuff to be working uh, as well as it is in the past for other projects that we've had. The primary focus of this project is to reduce and minimize runoff the road or center line crossover collisions along five locations on Forest Hill Road between Lower Lake Clementine Road and Spring Garden Road. And in addition to that, we'll be doing some dynamic variable speed warning signs and key locations and also guardrail and a small amount of drainage improvements. On December 7th, 2021, your board approved the project plans and specs and authorized the Director of Public Works to advertise for construction bids. Uh, the Department of Public Works enlisted Procurement Services Division to develop bid number 20263. We received three bids. Uh, Truesdale Corporation of California, Inc. out of Tempe, Arizona was the lowest responsive and responsible bidder with a total bid of $2,769,769. And we had no bid protests. And therefore, we are requesting that your board award and execute the contract to Truesdale Corporation of California. Uh, and procurement also concurs with the recommendation. I will throw in the fact that uh, the 2,700,000 bid was about 30% higher than our engineer's estimate. We are using a uh, road fund and our capital improvement program funds and some rural exchange funds to shore that up along with the 2.1 million in highway safety improvement program funds that we already received from the state. We wanted to keep moving with the project because if we don't, we will lose that safety money. And so therefore we uh, bring this project to your board. Any questions? I can answer them. Great, thank you, Phil. Appreciate that um, and great project. I know the Forest Hill community is very excited about it. Is there, are there any questions? Yes, Supervisor Jones. Yes, I, my only question is, I noticed in the, on the board report is Truesdale Corporation of California, but are they from Tempe, Arizona? Yeah, they're a California corporation, but they're based out of Tempe. So yeah, it's kind of a, an unusual situation, but that, that is the, the case in this, for this project. Okay, great, thank you. Good catch. Yeah. Any other questions? Any public comment on this item? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion. Second. Okay, motion Wygant, second Gore. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. And we'll move on to item Thank 19B. You. Good afternoon, uh, chair and board members. I'm Kevin Bell, the assistant director of public works. Um, I'm here today to request that your board approve a budget amendment to increase the spending authority of the fiscal year 2021-22 Environmental Utilities Capital Improvements Fund by $1,985,187.30 to return unused capital project balances to their original funding source or to transfer the funds to other projects. So we use a, the, this capital fund to fund our capital projects and we'll transfer money from our districts into the capital project fund and then fund the capital projects out of that fund. Um, we had a number of projects that were completed and didn't anticipate spending any more money because they were completed. Um, but we need this budget amendment so that we can actually take that, that leftover money and return it to either the districts or to uh, put it into other capital projects. So we need that, the amendment to increase our spending authority to move those funds. Um, and with that, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. The, the movement of the funds is as the table shows in the staff report.
Hearing none, uh, the board will entertain, the chair will entertain a motion. I'll move approval. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, Gore moved, sec uh, second by Wygant. Will the uh, clerk please call the roll? Gore? Aye. Wygant? Holmes? Aye. Jones? Estefson? You're welcome. And we are on to item 19 Supplemental agenda for the sewer maintenance district, Kevin. Yes, thank you. Uh, again, Kevin Bell, Assistant Director of Public Works. Uh, this item, we're asking the board to authorize payment of $2,652,245 from American Rescue Plan Act funding to the City of Lincoln for the Lincoln Regional Wastewater Treatment Reclamation Facility Aeration Project, which includes the lining of the maturation pond. And we're also asking that the board approve the aeration project funding agreement that's attached to the staff report uh, that authorizes and authorize the chair to execute the agreement upon county council and risk management approval. Uh, Back in 2013, uh, Placer County uh, entered into an agreement with the City of Lincoln to construct a pump station pipeline and expand the treatment plant at the City of Lincoln, um, and also for the city to treat wastewater from SMD1. Uh, as part of the treatment plant, there's an aeration system that is, that is part of the, the main component of treatment at the facility, uh, and that equipment has reached the end of its useful life. Uh, so the, the cost to rehab that is $6,231,759. And per the agreement with the city, the county's portion or proportional share of the, the cost of that rehabilitation is $1,707,623. Uh, staff is also recommending an additional amount of $944,622 uh, be contributed to that project to facilitate the project being completed and also to facilitate conversations that we are currently having with the City of Lincoln uh, regarding a potential joint powers agreement um, that would establish a JPA uh, operating the treatment plant um, and essentially have all customers, whether they're in the city of Lincoln or Placer County and, and SMD1, uh, be essentially represented as customers of the JPA. Um, those discussions are progressing uh, well. Uh, we are very close to reaching uh, agreement at the staff level on a, on a draft of the JPA agreement. Um, which will also be discussed this week at the two by two meeting uh, that is held between uh, City of Lincoln elected officials and Placer County uh, two board members here. Um, so with that, uh, all, all this funding is proposed to come from uh, the American Rescue Plan Act funding and was included in the presentation earlier today. Uh, with that, uh, part of the agreement that is included in the staff report is uh, Lincoln's acknowledgement and commitment to comply with the ARP uh, requirements, funding requirements, bidding and construction requirements, and monitoring and all of those things um, so that uh, the project would be eligible for those ARP dollars. Um, and since they are funded, since this is all funded from the ARP dollars, it does not impact our ratepayers or the general fund. Um, and with that, I'm uh, happy to answer any questions that your board has. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Are there questions? Any comments from the board? Not seeing any. Are there any public comments on this item? Okay. I accept a motion. Um, and I'll second. And I um, just want to say that uh, Supervisor Holmes and I have been serving on this two by two for it seems like quite a while as we're working with the city of Lincoln to address just making sure that the sewer um, in these two areas are appropriate and um, work well for the, the needs that our community has now into the future. Um, and so I really appreciate the work that the city has been doing with the county. Um, Kevin, you and your team, the work you're doing to get us to a place of actually having a JPA with the city of Lincoln um, so that we can have stable, reliable sewer services into the future. And I think this is a um, a use that will benefit our 
our community in those areas, North Auburn um, and the Lincoln area. So I am seconding the motion. But I just wanted to, to sort of give an update that there's just been a lot of work behind this request to get to this point. Absolutely. Thank you for your efforts, both of you on that committee. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Okay. Um, we said we'd try to break at 1230. If you give me a little patience, both Amy and Twyla have said they could come back, but they do have some meetings they have to reschedule. So, huh? So power through is what I'm hearing. Okay, we have nine items. <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, all routine. Okay. Just a lot of money that's routine, right? A lot of routine money. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So well, we're on 16A. We're we'll start with. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Good mor uh Good morning, Chair Gustafson and Chair uh, and sorry. This is Amy Ellis with the Adult System of Care. That's how I feel today. <laughs> Here with an action item to approve an agreement with Crestwood Behavioral Health Incorporated for mandated medically necessary mental health services for Placer County residents in need of long-term residential psychiatric care for the period of July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2024 in a total amount not to exceed $2,600,000 and authorized the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments up to $100,000 consistent with the current agreement subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. Placer County Adult System of Care provides mental health services to over 7,000 adults each year through a continuum of services. A small percentage of that number have acute and chronic mental illness and are unable to provide for their own basic needs due to their mental illness and therefore require a higher level of care in a residential facility. Long-term service needs are provided at any of the multiple Crestwood secure treatment facilities. Crestwood is our largest provider and serve many of our most chronic and complex clients during fiscal year 21-22. They are a vital partner for this level of care. Um, funding for this two-year contract includes 40% in state funding and 60% in county general fund and has been uh, budgeted appropriately. Any questions? Any questions, board members? Not seeing any. Any public comment on this item? Not seeing any, so we'll move forward with a motion. Second. Okay, motion Holmes, second Wygant. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Okay, 16B. Okay, good morning again. Amy Ellis with the Adult System of Care with a request for this board to approve an agreement with Compassion Valley LLC doing business as Garfield Wellness and Recovery Center to provide adult residential treatment services and medication support services for mentally disabled adults for the period of July 1, 2022 through June 30th, 2024 in a total amount not to exceed $1,898,000 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to execute the agreement and to sign amendments not to exceed $100,000 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. Garfield Wellness and Recovery opened in 2020. This location is approximately 10 minutes from Kirby Hills Clinic and our psychiatric health facility in Roseville, California. This is the first renewal of this contract for services. This social rehabilitation residential facility continues to provide support and recovery service to, to six of our very acute and chronically mentally ill clients. They have had positive outcomes with our clients and being close to Kirby Hills allows for better coordination of services by our, by our treatment providers as well as proximity for family members. The structure and services offered by this organization allow us to seek Medi-Cal reimbursement for many of the services provided, therefore reducing the impact on county general fund. This um, is comprised of 75% in federal funding, 4% state, and 21% in county general funds. And all has been budgeted. Any questions? Any questions, board members? Not seeing any. Any public comment on this item? Hearing none, motion Holmes. Second, Gore. All in favor? Aye. Any abstentions? Oh, any no's. <laughs> and then any abstentions. Okay. Motion passes. Okay. And then we'll move on to 16C. 
Amy Ellis, again with the Adult System of Care, to request uh, approval on an agreement with Davis Guest Home Incorporated for residential board and care services between July 1st, 2022 and June 30th, 2023 in an amount not to exceed 480,000 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the agreement and subsequent amendments not to exceed 48,000 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and County Council concurrence. So David Davis Guest Home is located in Modesto and it provides an alternative service for mental health clients requiring long-term residential care. This transitional housing setting for adults um, is to help them transition to lower levels of care. The primary utilization is for individuals who have an identifiable mental, identifiable mental health condition or on conservatorship and reside in a long-term locked facility. This level of care provides an alternative to those locked, in, locked institutions. It provides less restrictive environment in a community and is more cost effective. We have been contracting with this organization for over 15 years to serve some of our, of our most complex clients with chronic mental illness and it's critical to us to maintain. The agreement includes 67% in state and federal funding and 33% in county general funds, and all has been budgeted. Thank you, Amy. Any questions? Any public comment on this item? Seeing none. Holmes and Gore, all those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. So, okay, 16D. Okay, last one. They all have a similar theme here. Uh, Amy Ellis with the Adult System of Care uh, with a request for your board to approve an agreement with California Psychiatric Transitions um, called CPT in the amount not to exceed 550000 from July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2023 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments up to 55000 consistent with the agreement's subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. CPT has been a partnering contracted um, IMD provider with Placer County since January 1, 2013. These locked facilities offer services directed at providing essential life-saving care. Um, in addition to providing the necessary and required services, CPT offers a specialized competency restoration program and diversion unit that provides intensive and additional services to persons who have been deemed incompetent to stand trial for a crime that they are charged with and are often served in the state hospital system. CPT accepts individuals with a high level of need and therefore are an important contract for us to maintain. This agreement includes 67% in state federal uh, funding and 33% in county general fund and it's included in our budget. Thank you, Amy. Any questions? Any public comment on this item? I'm not seeing any. I'd entertain a motion. Holmes and Gore again. All those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Motion passes. Thanks, Amy. Okay, Twyla, you're up. I am not sure if I can talk quite as fast as Amy, but I will do my very best. So for the record, Twyla Abrahamson with the Children's System of Care, and good afternoon to all of you. And we'll try to make these brief. I am actually um, presenting for this first item on behalf of the Adult and Children's System of Care. It's a shared contract. So the Federal Community Mental Health Services Block Grant has funded services to children, adults, and older adults uh, with serious mental illness in Placer County for over 20 years. The children's system leverages these resources to help deliver counseling, social skills training, and peer support to youth from either probation or child welfare services who have been at risk of entry into foster care. In fiscal year 21-22, 104 of these youth, many of them who would otherwise have required expensive psychiatric hospital-based care, were served and received these resources. The adult system of care, in collaboration with advocates for mentally ill housing, utilizes this funding to provide secure and stable housing to adults and seniors with serious mental illness, but they also provide support services such as psychiatric assessment, referrals, and counseling, which also aids these clients in improving skills that allow them to live independently. In fiscal year 21-22, 62 adults have successfully obtained stable housing and or received community referrals, outreach, and assessments. So the county's Mental Health, Alcohol, and Drug Advisory Board is expected to review and recommend this application for approval at its next regular meeting, and the application itself is in a process of being completed. But your board approval is being requested today to permit the application to be submitted by their new required deadline of June 2nd, 2022. 
So we are requesting that your board take the following action, which is adopt a resolution authorizing the Director of Health and Human Services, or designee, to sign and submit a renewal grant application and all resulting documentation, including reports, agreements, and certifications as required for the Community Mental Health Services Block Grant in an amount not to exceed $1,632,000 $32,154. This is from July 1, 22 through June 30th, 24. Sign the subsequent agreements not to exceed 100,000 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. And these are federal revenues. They do not require any county general funds and they have also been budgeted appropriately. So thank you for consideration and be happy to answer any questions about this item. Thank you, Twyla. Any questions? Any public comment on this item? Okay. Holmes and Gore again. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. We'll move on to uh, F. Twyla Abrahamson, Children's System of Care again for the record. In order to best need the, meet the needs of Placer County's youth who experience severe and serious mental health challenges, the Children's System of Care and its partners deliver a combination of intensive in-home counseling, crisis stabilization, and mental health services to children and families. One element of this approach includes a state-mandated specialty in-home crisis services designed to prevent the youth from entering inpatient hospitals or other institutional settings, which are often difficult to access and are often, on average, many times uh, more costly as inpatient care. Under this agreement, up to 70 children each year with significant mental health challenges will receive this effective and cost-saving service and avoid this out-of-home care. A legal action brought in another jurisdiction against the state, which was settled in 2010, resulted in a requirement that counties make additional accessibility to this service available each and every year. You may recall this as the Emily Q lawsuit. So we're requesting that your board take the following action. Authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to exec uh, execute an agreement with Uplift Family Services in the amount of $568,350 for therapeutic behavioral support and specialty mental health services for July 1, 22 through June 30th, 23, authorized the director to sign subsequent amendments consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. And this contract is included in the department's budget and is funded 95% uh, is funded in state and federal funds and 5% in general, uh, general fund match. So again, thank you for your consideration. And I'd be happy to answer any questions about this item. Thank you, Twyla. Any questions? Any public comment on this item? Not seeing any? Second. Motion Holmes, second Gore. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Seeing none, go ahead, Twyla, on item G. This is a second agreement with Uplift Family Services, and they've provided federally mandated intensive mental health specialty and psychoeducational services for children and their families, and have done so for at least the last six years for us and many, many more years um, through other counties through in the state of California. They also provide through this contract shorter term wraparound stabilization and case management services to appropriate non-system kids and families that have been referred for formal intervention in order to keep them out of the child welfare and probation systems. So Uplift is one of the largest, most comprehensive nonprofit mental health treatment uh, programs in California. They're continuously updating their approaches to children and adolescents with complex behavioral health challenges, and this helps them to recover from trauma due to abuse, severe neglect, addiction, and poverty. For Placer youth served by their most intensive service types in 2021 at discharge, 85% remained with their families in the community and were not required to be placed in foster care or other out-of-home care. 99% were not on formal or informal probation and 100% were attending schools. Approval of this contract renewal will allow them to continue to achieve these outcomes while serving the more behaviorally challenged youth in Placer County. So we're requesting that the board take the following action. Authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to execute an agreement with Uplift Family Services to provide these mental health, psychoeducational services, crisis intervention, and follow-up in a total amount not to exceed $1,908,412 for the period of July 1, 22 through June 30, 23. Authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the subsequent amendments 
uh, consistent with current agreements, subject matter, and scope with risk management, county council, and concurrence. And the total expenditures are included in the department's budget. This one also consists of 95% in federal and state funds and 5% in the county general fund match. So I'd be happy to answer any questions about this. Any questions? I'm not seeing any. <coughs> any public comment on this item? I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Not seeing any, then motion passes. Item G, I'm sorry, H. <coughs> See how long my voice lasts. <laughs> so Twyla Abrahamson for the Children's System of Care again. Um, again, we're mandated by the State Department of Healthcare Services to provide a range of mental health services. This one includes psychiatry, counseling, and social skills training to children and youth, as well as some additional uh, intense mental health services. These, however, are most often delivered in group homes or, as I've talked to you about before, short-term therapeutic programs. I have talked to you and uh, this whole board about continuum of care reform before, and this is, has been in an implementation phase over the past several years, and it's still anticipated to lessen the overall numbers of children statewide. And by the way, it has done so uh, right now up to about 50% reduction statewide of children who are then required to be placed in short-term residential therapy uh, programs. However, even during this transition, uh, to having a more uh, specially trained resource families based in the community, there's still a need for this kind of service for some of our children. So these programs, as I said before, the STRTPs, effectively served approximately 49 Placer County youth last year, and these were from child welfare, probation, and mental health sectors. <clears throat> these contracts, however, assure that timely and effective intensive mental health services are delivered to youth in those STRTPs. So it, we are trying to limit the time and the duration of residential care and help these kids acquire the uh, skills necessary to return home into the community as quickly as possible. The STRTP providers responsible for these services are enlisted in your attachment A, and all providers added to this annual list under the director's amendment authority will be published to the board in next year's list as well. We've been doing this for many, many years, and we always publish the list of anybody that we have provided before and have added to the list. So we were requesting the board take the following two actions. One is uh, authorize the umbrella agreement for these S uh, STRTP providers from July 1, 22 through June 30th, 23, in a maximum aggregate amount not to exceed $1,500,000, approve the provider list, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign provider agreements, subsequent amendments, with, uh, it, with the subject matter and scope with risk management and county council concurrent. And the second action is to authorize uh, uh, the Director of Health and Human Services or designate to amend the list of providers as long as any amendments are placed again on that list and brought back to this board. And funding has been in the department's budget, um, and this one includes funding of uh, federal and state funding of 87%, and the required county general fund match is 13%. So if you have any questions, please, I'd be happy to answer them. Great, thank you. Twyla, are there any questions? Not seeing any. Any public comment on this item? Okay. Motion Holmes, second Gore. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. One more, Twyla. All right. And again for this one, Twyla Abrahamson. Uh, from the Children's System of Care, I'm presenting on behalf of both the Children's System of Care and the Adult System of Care for this shared contract as well. So we've talked about a lot of mandated services by the state. This one includes psychiatry, counseling, crisis intervention, social skills training to adults and children in community, clinic, and outpatient settings. To meet this particular mandate, Placer County employs a nationally recognized model that utilizes a network of private counselors, therapists and psychologists to maximize the availability of necessary specialty services while limiting the need for more costly hospitalization and residential care. So this mental health private network provides outpatient services to youth and adults and the contract ensures that flexible, timely and effective mental health services are delivered to approximately 500 children and adults each year, resulting in better outcomes for children and families and with the adults and lower out of home uh, placement and hospital care. So after submission of the staff memorandum, I decided and discovered that we cannot add. I discovered that the memo lists the current number of providers is 27, and attachment A lists 29. 
which is actually the correct number. This is a very fluid list, which is why it, it comes back to your board every single year. So we're requesting that your board talk th take the following actions. Approve three-year agreements with multiple provi providers for mental health services in an aggregate amount of $4,500,000, which is $1.5 million annually, from July 1, 22 through June 30, 25. Authorize the Director of Health and Human Services or designee to sign the provider agreements and subsequent amendments uh, with risk management and county council concurrence. And then secondly, authorize the Director of Health and Human Services or designee to approve the 22-23 network provider list and amend the list of providers as we add them and we subtract them as they retire and move off of the list. Um, as long as any of these amendments are reflected in the 23-24 and 24-25 network provider lists. And funding was already approved for this three-year umbrella last year, but it's also been included in the subsequent two years going forward. And this is also 87% in federal and state funding and 13% in required county general fund match. So again, thank you for your consideration and be happy to answer some questions. Thank you, Twyla. Any questions? I'm not seeing any. Any public comment on this item? <laughs> All those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, Twyla. And Thanks thank you. for wrapping those up so quickly. And thank you very, very much for service. allowing us to do so. We very much appreciate it. And thank enjoy you. your lunch. Well, before we break, we're going to try to go back and take 14 B and C. I hope these are short items. Um, oh, I'm sorry, the 17 A, I thought we announced at the beginning of the meeting. We did announce it. Yeah. But we did need a motion? We do need a motion for, okay. it for the record. But That's okay. We announced it, so let's take a motion to take that off calendar and come back with that. Okay, motion Gore, second Jones. All in favor? Oh, I'm sorry, any public comment on that? None. Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. And, uh, you know, I'm seeing 20 minutes on this one item. Uh, and I was going to go ahead and try to push through, but um, I will defer to the board if we want to come back. We need a little over an hour and probably 20 minutes for closed session, so say an hour and a half. So we come back uh, at a little after 2, 2.10 2 for those two items. Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it, yeah, that's why I kept it pushing it off because I thought we need a little more time. Okay, so we're going to go to closed session. I'll let County Council do that, but if we can alert Cedra to coming back at 2.10. The board will now adjourn to closed session to consider four items of existing litigation, one item of anticipated litigation, and one item of labor negotiations. For the record on the labor negotiations, uh, Todd Leopold is absent and in his, his place. Jane Christensen will be uh, part of the negotiating team. Great, thank you very much. We'll see you back here at 2.10.
closed session. County Council, will you give the report? The board met in closed session to consider the following. Under existing litigation, Charles Wilson versus County, the board heard a report and provided direction. Miskwitz versus County, the board heard a report and provided direction. Deputy uh, Placer County Deputy Sheriff's Association versus County, the board heard a report and provided direction. And in uh, France Germain versus County, the board heard a report and provided direction. Under anticipated litigation, one potential case, the board heard a report and provided direction. Finally, under labor negotiations, the board met with the labor negotiation team, heard a report, and provided direction. That concludes the report out of closed session. Thank you, Karen. And we did return a bit late. We are still going to try to go back and, and capture Cedra's items 14B and C. So we'll start with 14B, Emily Setzer on the fireworks ordinance amendment. Hi, thank you. Let's see, I'm just waiting for the presentation to show. Here we go, thank you. Okay, so uh, I will be talking about our fireworks display code amendment today. Next slide, please. So we are proposing to change the fireworks ordinance from risk management to seizure responsibility. That is the biggest change proposed with this amendment. It also refers to our water-based fireworks requirements, and that is the best management practices plan that your board heard um, two years ago. And then the ordinance also includes an increased lead time. So the current ordinance requires 60 days submittal um, prior to a land-based event or 30 days prior to a water-based event. And so right now we are proposing the change to 135 days prior to a water-based event. I'm sorry, in 60 days prior to the land-based event. So that gives more lead time for other coordinating agencies to review the applications as necessary, as particularly for the water-based events. Additionally, we are proposing including public noticing. The current ordinance does not require or requires 10 days noticing. Um, sorry, does not require noticing. And the proposed ordinance requires at least 10 days prior to the event via newspaper. Um, agency director may also include additional requirements as necessary. So that is a summary of the changes for this ordinance. It is a relatively minor amendment. Next slide, please. We have updated our applications and our online permitting system to reflect the new application permit for fireworks displays. Um, so that is already reflected online. And we've updated a checklist to help better serve applicants and navigate them through the various requirements. We've also updated our universal application. So that now includes the fireworks display permit option. And then we've included some supplemental questionnaires to cover the additional requirements and best management practices. Next slide, please. We have done outreach to the previous applicants who have submitted fireworks display permits in the past. We've also done outreach with the Tahoe City Downtown Association and North Tahoe Business Association. Um, the Resort Association, as well as familiar with these changes. Um, Monty Foundation, which has uh, been the applicant for other fireworks at the lake as well in North Lake Tahoe. And then we've contacted all of the fire districts and countywide and additionally. So everyone is aware we have received very limited feedback about this ordinance. And we, since we have updated the um, online permitting system and our applications and forms, we are going through staff training. We've already completed front counter staff training for this. And then we have two planning staff who are dedicated to process any fireworks permits that come in um, countywide, including North Lake Tahoe. I will just add if uh, the board members are not familiar with the changes proposed for North Lake Tahoe this year, 
um, Tahoe City Downtown Association and North Tahoe Business Association have decided to proceed with um, drone shows this year instead of fireworks displays over the lake for 3rd and 4th of July. So this will not affect them this year. Next slide, please. So today we are requesting that you adopt a resolution to continue the current fireworks fee, which is $300 subject to CPI increase and introduce and waive the oral reading of an ordinance to repeal and replace chapter nine, article 9.33 of Placer County code to regulate fireworks. And I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Emily. Uh, board members, any questions? Okay, I have to be the one this afternoon. Start us off. Um, Emily, one of the um, items you, you're sh sharing is uh, public noticing. And obviously, um, the, 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 sh the fireworks displays that I've heard the most complaints about are those that are private parties and weddings that occur um, uh, randomly, not on dates you would expect fireworks. And all of a sudden, there's fireworks going off in your neighborhood, and it's frightening to some, or they're alarmed. They haven't taken care of their dogs or their pets. And often, those are visitors or second homeowners who don't necessarily we don't really even have a local newspaper on North Shore, so um, I'm just concerned that maybe some additional posting near the property or something else should have been considered to alert people that there's going to be these uh, random shows that can occur with weddings and birthdays and those sorts of things. Do you, did you get any feedback from anyone else on that? Because those are the complaints I've heard in my office. Mm -hmm. um, that's good feedback. I haven't heard that actually from anybody, even after we submitted emails and have conducted some outreach meetings. Yeah, I, I know a lot of our second homeowners and visitors aren't around to have gotten your notices and, and participated in those discussions. Well, um, if you haven't heard that from others, I would just urge us to be flexible and see how this year goes and maybe come back with those changes because this year, uh, since many of the shows are going to drone shows, we won't have an issue with the typical July 3rd and 4th uh, uh, shows. It's those other ones where we might have those uh, situations that occur where we need uh, some other type of posting. We do have the vision in there that CEDRA director can require other um, noticing requirements as well. So that gives us a little bit of flexibility. So if, in particular, if there are um, events that we think should have public posting, we could consider that. Yeah, I think um, especially typically where these occur is obviously on our lakefront properties and uh, sandwich board signs or some sort of sign on the highway alerting drivers and neighbors that there is going to be a fireworks show um, or, or some other so, sort of signage uh, requirement would be quite helpful, I think, for the neighbors and visiting public. So, yeah. who knew? Oh, yes, they can, and they do. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, I don't see any other questions from the board. Is there any public comment on this item? Okay, uh, with that, I would accept a motion to take the, adopt the resolution and introduce and waive the oral reading of the ordinance. I'll take motion Gore, second Holmes. All those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, it passes. Thank you very much, Emily, and thanks for being patient with us. We'll move on now to 14C on the proposed revisions to the Workforce Housing Preservation Program. And this is a, um, we're gonna receive a, a presentation and then provide some direction to staff. Um, I believe this item is coming back to us in June at the Tahoe meeting. Uh, and so uh, I hope we can expedite and beat the 20 minute time frame on this. How's that? I would urge staff to consider beating the 20 minute time frame. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can we can work on that. Uh, Emily sets a receiver. I'm also here with Devin McNally. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just go through a quick 
overview of the program as it is today. So just a refresher, this is a down payment assistance program that provides up to six or 16% of the purchase cost up to $150,000 to home buyers in exchange for them agreeing to deed restrict the property so that it can only be occupied by households with at least one local worker. Our goal was to create a secondary market for local worker housing. The deed restriction runs with the land for 55 years and it renews with each sale and transaction. There are no appreciation caps on the property, but there is the idea that in the future, if it has to sell to local workers, there is a natural slight appreciation that's just natural part of the economic cycle. And then current eligibility for people to apply right now is that the household has to earn less than 245% of area median income. Just a reminder, that was based off of what TRPA set as their achievable income limit. And these workers also have to be, or at least one person in the household needs to be working full time within our Tahoe Truckee Unified School District geographical boundary. Next slide, please. So just this was a refresher on the goal that we presented to you a little over a year ago. The program launched last July. We, our goal when we launched this program was to deed restrict um, 30 houses per year for a full year. The first year was five houses. Um, so far, we have one person going through this process um, who got an offer accepted. We have 25 applicants right now. Um, most people are having a, a challenging time getting offers accepted in this market. So we are behind our goal at the moment. We still have $500,000 in the budget right now. That will be less after this first close. Um, but our goal was $3 million a year, so we, we are trying to make this program more successful and figure out ways in which we can catch up to achieve that goal. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So our current program status, um, like I said, we, we got this approved in February of 2021. We launched in July. We have 24, it might be 25 applicants as of now, and nobody has purchased a home yet, but like I said, we have the one going through it's in the process right now. Next slide, please. And next. So I'll go through some of the community feedback we've done. Um, first, we wanted to understand what the challenges were for our applicants and for the greater public, people who haven't maybe heard about the program or haven't applied yet. Um, so first we reached out to our current list of qualified applicants, so those 24 people, and we conducted phone interviews and talked with them. Um, we've also answered a lot of emails and, quest and phone calls just over time from people trying to apply to the program or buy a house. And so the findings we found were that 67% of these applicants believed they are currently priced out because prices have gotten so high. So they have uh, decided to not actively search, but still 33% were still looking for a home. And just to note, uh, we, between this program and our Hopkins Village development, we have a majority of our applicants are one or two person households. So for this program, it was 55% of our applicants, but combined it's 88%, which really shows a need for more of that starter home type of product. And that's what a lot of people are looking for. Also probably based off of the, the lower price for those products compared to a three or four bedroom home. Next slide, please. The second thing we did was we posted a survey to the general public online. We posted that between April 10th and April 20th. We got 220 responses from the North Tahoe area, which we thought was pretty good actually. And we, just in a summary of these responses, I'll go into some of the questions in more detail, but 75% of the respondents are interested in purchasing a home in the North Tahoe area. And this was just general public. So this was posted online. 22% um, were likely above the current income requirements though. And that's that 245% area median income. And then 25% thought that their landlord or another local homeowner might sell directly to them. So we were kind of trying to gauge how strong is that pocket listing inventory, but those who don't have to compete with everyone else on the open market. Next slide, please. 
So when we asked how many people were in their household, this is um, just reflecting what I spoke about previously, that the majority of respondents were one or two person households. Um, we had we definitely had some three or four percent four person households as well. Um, but we definitely have a need for that starter home type of product. Next slide, please. And then if they had been pre-qualified, we were curious to know how much they had been pre-qualified for. And you can see the majority had not been pre-qualified on the left, but that darker purple at the top shows the majority of uh, those who had, and that was for, between 450,000 and 550,000. Um, so then it decreased slightly going all the way up to 850,000 and above. So uh, just to let you know, in comparison to our housing stock, only about 16% have been pre-qualified for homes in prices at the lower range of today's market. Next slide, please. And this provides a little more detail on the homes that actually sold in this price range last year. Um, we are noticing that the prices are even higher this year. Next slide, please. When we asked if they have had offers rejected in the past, 30% um, said yes, 70% said no. And we asked if they knew why their offer was rejected. And a quarter, about a quarter said they had been outbid and about 30% said they couldn't compete with cash offers, so similar. Next slide, please. When we asked how likely you are to use the Workforce Housing Preservation Program, about 26% said yes, 50% said maybe, and 23% uh, said no. So this was really a question that um, is important to us in trying to get more people to use the program to really achieve that goal of creating a secondary market. Uh, next click, please. And so then when we asked if they would use the program if income requirements were removed, but we still relied on that local worker requirement, we had a majority that said yes. So that bumped up from 26% to almost 80%. And next click, please. And then when we asked if they would use the program if they could present as a cash offer, we also had a majority say yes. So next slide, please. I will pass it over to Devon. I think I ran through that pretty quickly, but we'll both be available to answer questions at the end of the presentation. Thanks, Emily. So I'll go through really quickly kind of the five areas that we have kind of identified as some challenges going forward. Um, so the first is uh, the fact that the 245% of AMI price cap is just not in line with prices at the moment. Uh, you can see there, these are the sales prices in 2021. Uh, only 4% were under $600,000. Um, most of them, nearly 70%, were over a million dollars. Um, and so as a result, we're just not, there's no inventory available um, at that level. Um, another challenge was our requirement that they cannot have owned a home in the last 12 months. Uh, we do have workers who work inside the geographic boundaries of the Tahoe Truckee Unified School District, but they own a home, say, in Auburn or Reno or outside of the area. And so as a result, uh, they aren't uh, available to start the program. Uh, there's also been a difficulty competing with cash offers. Uh, there has been nearly 40% of the homes sold in 2021 in North Lake Tahoe area were done through cash offers. Um, there's also an interest from employers who would like to participate either through uh, purchasing a home and leasing it to their employees or uh, layering funding from them directly on top of our WIP program. Um, and then finally, there are some employers um, who have full-time employees who uh, by virtue of kind of their work schedule don't meet that 30 hours per week standard. Uh, a great example is teachers. They'll work during uh, the year, but because they have the summer off for summer break, technically they don't meet that 30 hours per week standard. So we have a number of proposed changes. Um, 
as we go forward. Um, they're all laid out, um, so I'll quickly run through them and then get into the details very quickly. Uh, the first is to remove the income restriction and rely solely on the worker, uh, local worker requirement, uh, getting rid of the requirement that uh, the participant have not, uh, not owned a home in the past 12 months, adding language to allow employer-funded purchases or employer contributions. Um, then uh, creating a cash offer program uh, to allow the county to kind of be the front for that cash. And then finally, uh, allowing a full-time equivalency alternative through an employer verification process. Um, there are some future considerations that we might uh, consider later, such as expanding the program to sellers, uh, but that would be brought forward at a later date. Um, so really quickly, uh, regarding the income requirements, uh, we had talked earlier about how a majority were uh, one to three person households. Um, oftentimes, both of the adults are working. Uh, so what we did was we took local mean earnings uh, for typical kind of uh, workers up there. So for example, a nurse and a teacher, and we found that even in a three person household, they were still above that 245% AMI limit. Um, which means they wouldn't be eligible for the program. However, based on the median sale price, they were still well below the ability to afford a home. And so uh, similarly, we're looking at this, uh, removing it. The Mountain Housing Council and TRPA are also looking at removing their income limits from their achievable housing definitions. Um, and so this would allow us to get more uh, homes uh, deed restricted by expanding those uh, the pool of eligible applicants. The second change would be to allow current homeowners to be eligible. Uh, right now, nearly 60% of the people who work in the Unified School District uh, live outside of it. Um, they have uh, expressed interest in moving to the area and having a shorter commute time. Uh, and this would allow them to do that. Uh, we've also heard anecdotally from, for example, the hospital, they've had a difficulty recruiting doctors because the doctors are not finding a uh, place to live. Um, and so this would allow them to kind of come in and purchase a home with the help of the county. Uh, additionally, uh, it could also help free up supply through um, moving up. So say a family of four is looking to move up from a two bedroom to maybe a three or four bedroom, they could now utilize the program and that starter home could then go to a local worker. Um, another revision would be to allow employer owned housing or uh, employer contributions. Uh, so the first part would be allowing employers to purchase with assistance from the program to then lease out uh, to their employees. Um, and access more homes in the market. And then the second would be to uh, allow employers to contribute. So in addition to the 150,000 maximum that we would offer, the employer could kick in additional funds to help uh, bridge that gap. Um, another option is a cash offer program. Like I said earlier, nearly 40% uh, of the homes sold were sold through cash offers in 2021. Uh, the way this program would work would be the county would come in uh, in the first escrow and there would be a second escrow with the actual buyer that follows behind it. Uh, the county would have the cash up front and then be reimbursed through the close of that second escrow minus that grant amount. Um, this is something that we're still working the details out on. Uh, because it would require a source of contingency funding if, for example, the second escrow fell through um, and we had to purchase the home. Uh, so it is something that we're still having to work, in, work through with council and we've started those conversations. Uh, the final revision is an allowance for full-time equivalency. So this would modify the language requiring an annual average of 30 hours per week uh, to allow for a full-time employee with employer verification. Um, and so this would allow for teachers and some others, for example, to meet those requirements. Um, and we would do that through a kind of letter of certification from the employer. So the next steps are, uh, we're looking for feedback from your board. 
um, and direction to kind of make these revisions. And then we will bring these back tentatively on the June 28th board meeting uh, for adoption into the program guidelines. Uh, there are some revisions that will uh, be adopt, uh, brought back at a later date, such as the cash offer program, which still needs some time to work out how that would exactly work in detail. Great. Thank you, Devin, and thank you, Emily. Um, are there questions, board members, or comments? Because I can go right through them right now. And <laughs> um, I agree with all your recommendations, and in my briefing, I brought up two points. One is, if um, we were to do an all-cash program offer, does it make more sense to try to use the housing trust to avoid the county being on title at some point in some way and creating more complications. If the housing trust can be more nimble, we give them a lump sum, they buy the cash, they did the deal, and if not, they can lease the property or do something else with it, and we're not directly taking title as county. I just think that would be a, a better way to accomplish that. That's, you know, my, my thought. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And then on the, the own, prior ownership, I think some of you were with me the night I heard from a firefighter who lived in Carson Valley who said, oh my gosh, I love this program, but I already own a house. He, he went home, he looked at it, he emailed me the next day, and he said, I already own a home, so I'm not qualified. Those are exactly the kind of people we want to get back in our community to live and work at Lake Tahoe. So, um, so I do agree with... Um, they, they could have owned a home pre previously. The whole point is we're buying a deed restriction. We're not validating who goes in there at what income level. We're buying a deed restriction on a piece of property that will always stay for our local community members to buy into. Um, so I, I like that program. And then on the employer-owned housing and employee contributions, I mentioned this to both of you. I, I could see matching their dollars. I, I don't know. Um, we have plenty of our own employees who would like to acquire homes, and I would like to see these employers with more input into the program. Um, and I, or I would like a lease to own situation, because the whole point of this particular program was home ownership to really build back up our community of people uh, who live there as well as work there. And just leasing doesn't give those those young people and young families the opportunity. I mean, they're renting. They can, you know, we're doing the lease. We will also hear about our other programs coming back uh, on leasing. Um, but this one is really about home ownership. So I, would, I think I would prefer not to mix up employers leasing property, but if they wanted to facilitate a purchase of their one of their employees through a lease option within a certain period of time I think that might be a way to to facilitate that otherwise I think these are great recommendations I know our AMI looks high but when you look at our housing prices and what you failed to say is in those four percent I guarantee you those were like studio cabins that were almost uninhabitable and so a young employee buying those or young family buying them would immediately have to spend a ton of cash to even take that $600,000 studio cabin falling down and make it habitable to get any sort of mortgage on it. So I think that's that might be missed that, yeah, there were 4% that sold at that price range. Nothing that anybody in this room would want to live or in immediately without a lot of work. So any other feedback, board members? Sorry to... <laughs> okay. Uh, direction. If we think of other things, if you think of other things when it's not right uh, after lunch. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. If there are any other items um, that come up or, or concepts you want to consider, as was mentioned, um, this item is uh, scheduled to come back to your board on June 27th. Uh, 28. 28. See, I knew I was going to get it wrong. Um, on June 28th for action. So thank you. Great. Right. I do think if employers, I, I keep tossing this around in my head, let's set something separate up that we can really watch for the employers to help them purchase homes. I, I really do think this is about getting our workforce being able to purchase homes. There's all the other programs we're working on. So Absolutely. why not throw another one in for employer-based leasing or whatever Absolutely. that one is? Yeah. 
Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Emily. Emily and Devin, especially for the great work on this. Okay, we will move on now. We have a 2.30 timed item. We're only 20 minutes late for our Community Development Resource Agency Code Compliance Services Update. And George and EJ are coming up, so I think it's a team effort here. EJ threw me, I expected you to go left. <laughs> uh, good morning, Chair. It's afternoon, I, I apologize. Good afternoon, uh, Potts County Board of Supervisors. Nice to be before you today. Today I have a code compliance and enforcement update for you. So, with regard to a little bit of background, operations, code compliance services in Auburn, the tile unit is separate, is staffed by one supervising code compliance officer, three code compliance officer twos, it was four, one recently put in their notice, so this Thursday we'll be back down to three. One part-time hazardous vegetation officer, one senior clerk, one administrative technician. Both of the clerical positions, excuse me, are vacant at this time. Um, code compliance services generally operates Monday through Friday between the hours of 7 a.m. and 5 p.m. So, as always, if you have any questions as I move along here, feel free to interrupt. So, with regard to our current caseload, when planning took over code compliance and enforcement in April 15th of 21, we had 314 open cases. Since that time, we've gotten 269 complaints. Our current caseload is 166 um, since uh, April 15th of 21. We've referred 82, which means that uh, the complaints that came in weren't necessarily going to be handled by code compliance. They'd be handled by a different agency. Um, unfounded, which means they didn't have any merit. 48, uh, we've resolved 287, and we've abated five vehicles. It's, it should be noted that we do vehicle abatement on private property, not within the public right of way. That's within the jurisdiction of the California Highway Patrol. This is another program that's part of code compliance, hazardous vegetation. So we have one part-time hazardous vegetation officer and we have one of our code compliance officers who splits his time between regular code enforcement, cannabis, and hazardous vegetation. In the last year, we've made 600 contacts. We've completed 218 inspections. Uh, 201 of those properties is self-evaded. 15 properties in the process and nearly completed. Um, waiting on the remaining two properties to see if they will abate. We've only had to do one abatement process in the Alta area, actually go through the abatement process. So our compliance percentage is 98%. It's interesting to note that this is a very positive program, especially since it's part of code. People are very excited to see our code, um, well, our hazardous vegetation code compliance officer come out. Um, when he shows up in a neighborhood, people will approach him and ask him to come on their property and do an inspection to see if, uh, you know, what they need to do to become fire safe. So people are very, very, very concerned about fire, rightfully so in the last three years. I think we've all sort of gotten that way. So this is very, very positive. People seem to, to have embraced it and we get very high compliance and that's not through any citations, that is simply through education. And all the time this has been going, we've done one abatement. Cannabis. In 2021, we got 14 complaints from the public. All of the complaints that we get from the public happen in the fall, about the time it really, really starts to smell. So those complaints were either resolved by direct intervention from code compliance or, frankly, by the harvest of the crop because by the time we show up out there, you talk to the grower and he's like, well, I was going to harvest two days from now, but I'll harvest today, no more problem. And then you tell him, don't do this next year. So we really don't get much in the way of cannabis complaints. There are a lot of cannabis issues. Um, they tend to be of a much larger scale, like the cartel grows in the national forest and some of those things. Those things are generally handled by the sheriff's office, not by code. 
With regard to complaint categories, and I'll run through these very, very quickly. Every complaint that we uh, investigate and act on has a written complaint form associated with it. Citizens can make complaints. Law enforcement agencies can also make complaints. They can call us and ask us to make the complaint on their behalf. We'll fill it out and put the officer's name down who asked for the complaint to be filed. Same with fire departments. Um, Placer County Department uh, complaints. Placer County employees in their capacity as a county employee can make a complaint, but they either need the uh, approval of their department head or their supervisor. The Board of Supervisors, Planning Commission, and CEO can also make complaints just like the police departments and fire departments, they can call us and ask us to fill out the form and we will put down at the request of District 5 aid, whoever. Uh, we do not accept anonymous complaints. So once we get a complaint, we prioritize it into five categories. Priority one being the most eminent, that would be sewage coming up on the ground, people living in illegal, unsafe buildings, uh, unsecured pools. Priority two would be reoccurring verified violations, working in a wetland area, things of that nature. Priority three, this is where most of our complaints fall. Um, this would be things like someone's built a shed too close to the property line. The fence is in the front set back at eight feet. That's a three. A four would be an abandoned vehicle or an inop inoperable inoperable vehicle on private property. Priority five, these are just things like a deli put a sandwich board on the sidewalk and someone's upset by it. That would be a five. Probably not gonna get to that anytime soon. Uh, let me switch to my notes here for a second. So. With regard to our complaint process, this is our current complaint process. Sorry for the rattling paper. So we would receive a written complaint. We would prioritize it. We would look at the codes to determine if there's a problem. Um, within 15 days is our goal to get a letter out to the person who supposedly has the complaint or the, the issue on their property. We give them 30 days to respond. Um, hopefully by when they respond, we're able to get on the property within 10 days to do an inspection, determine if there's a violation. So that first part, just to determine if there's a violation, is about 60 days. So when we get on the property, and I'll give you an example, let's say someone has too many junker cars. So we go on the property, you have 15 younger cars, you need to take them off. They would say, okay, I can do one a pay period, which is one every two weeks. So we'd be like, fine. We wouldn't even issue them a notice of violation if they're forthcoming and we're willing to do that. Lo and behold, we show up two weeks and guess what? Same amount of cars, no one's removed the car. So then you tell them, it's like, okay, we're gonna give you a notice of violation, take a car off. How long do you need? They'll say two more weeks. Okay, wait two weeks. Maybe they took a car off, maybe they didn't. If they took a car off, good. If not, we would issue a second notice of violation. We're required to do two notices of violations. And then we give them a certain amount of time, probably like five to 10 days to take a car off. If they haven't taken a car off, then we would cite them. This whole process about the whole voluntary compliance, once we determine that there's a violation and we come up, come up with a timeline, we can get caught in that loop for months. Someone will take a car off, then you'll threaten to decide them, then they'll take two cars off, then they'll go dormant for a little bit. So it can go on and on. So ultimately in a case like that, we would probably wind up with an abatement. So, what I would propose, once we get a violation, 
We mail a courtesy notice in 10 days. We investigated in another 10 days. Um, if there is a violation, we immediately issue a notice of violation and give them 10 days to come up with either a timeline to fix the problem or um, come up with some alternative if it's acceptable to us. And the first time that they miss, we issue a citation and take them to a citation. So essentially you go from something that probably takes months to about 30 to 45 days to get to a citation and really bring them into the compliance process. Uh, I'll go through this quickly. These are our sort of remedies. Notice of violation, which is basically a statement that you're in violation. We also can issue judicial and administrative citations. Um, we don't do very many judicial, the courts are backed up and they don't usually hear our items very quickly. Nuisance abatement, which is actually a process by where we can go on your property and remove junker cars or other things of that nature. We can revoke permits or we can use an injunction, which in my whole time in code compliance, we've only done one time. It was very effective in conjunction with county council where they got an injunction to stop and illegal land use. Other thing that, that we would like some feedback on, our current fines are 100, 200, and 500, so 100 first violation. 200 second violation, 500 third. We would propose first violation, 1,500, second violation, 3,000, third violation, 5,000. This is in keeping with the STR ordinance. It seems like if we're going to, uh, in one compliance area, have that fine schedule, that we should have it in the rest. So we would like to get direction to process a zoning text amendment to Article 1762. Uh, and update our procedures manual to reflect those things we've talked about here today. We will come back and further evaluate our staffing needs as code compliance responds to wildfire risks, hazardous vegetation. We're constantly being asked to participate in other things, homelessness, fruit vendors, uh, cannabis, hazardous vegetation. It seems like it's coming from all angles. Today I understand that SB9 that we would be enforcing that as well. That was news to me. But uh, after receiving direction, return to the Board of Supervisors with uh, full-time equivalent requests for staff, associated costs, update ordinance, and revised procedures manuals. Obviously, these things would need to go out to Max and town halls as well. So that's where we're at. Is there any questions? Lights are coming on right now. Thanks, George. Appreciate yep. it. Supervisor Holmes. Thank you, George, for this uh, update. Um, so, you get a code. You get a complaint. Mm -hmm. You're going to send a letter to those that are in violation mm -hmm. within 10 days. That would be our proposal. That's your proposal. Yes. Yeah. And then, uh, in 10 days after that, you would go inspect. Hopefully that would be our goal to be out on, on the property in 10 days. And at that time you would uh, let the person that is in violation give, time, give them time to correct the... Yeah, we give you a written notice of violation, which is just simply, it, it doesn't do anything other than tell you exactly what code sections you're in violation in and what you need to do to remediate it. So you'd have that. And we would say if it's something simple, you know, like if you put two foot of trellis on top of your fence and it needs to come down, we'd ask, how much time do you need? Well, I can do it next weekend. Okay, fine. Um, some things are obviously gonna take longer. But the point would be to either you know, tell them you have 10 days or some other timeline, which we can agree to is reasonable. And the minute they don't make that timeline, no second chances. Uh, we should just issue, in my opinion, 
uh, citation. So the citation, the first citation would be $1,500? Yes. And uh, how would you collect that? Would you put a lien on their property? We or? can lien their property. Um, that's the most effective way. Okay. That's, that's the option that we have for abatements and um, collection of fees. And do you need more staffing to uh, if we go down this path? Yes, lots. What? How many? How many more? How many code enforcement officers? Yeah. Uh, you really, you want my wish list? <laughs> yeah, reasonable. Well, big. Nine. None. Nine. Oh, nine. <laughs> nine. Okay. All right. Nine and internal staff. Okay. Like two technicians and two administrative secretaries, and I'll tell you why. One of the problems that we have in code compliance is that when people call us. They can't talk to anyone or they they have to wait a week and a half to talk to someone so if we have internal office staff who takes all this information disseminates it out to an officer and can talk to people and explain what's going on and tell them this is what's happening this is what we're doing if the officer needs to call them they can call the officer and tell them that really is the bottleneck that we have we don't really have that in office staff because a code compliance officer can, can operate completely independently from the office. They have cell phones, they have computers that they can enter everything in a cella. They don't actually need to come in the office very often. They come in the office most of the time to return phone calls, find out what's happening, that sort of thing. So if we have people in the office to do that, that would greatly help our efficiency. So these uh, code compliance officers wouldn't be driving around looking for violations? No. Okay. I think we have enough complaints <laughs> that we can keep them all busy okay. all the time. Okay. Good. And not only keep them busy, but give, I don't want to sound smarmy here, but better service to yeah. the public. You know, one code compliance case, and a lot of supervisors have that special case, um, can take hours and hours. It can take 30 hours of, of an officer's time in a week by the time you talk to all the neighbors, by the time you talk to the board aides, by the time you talk to the violators, by the time. It can take a huge amount of time for just one case. Hence the $1,500 fine. Hence, I would really like people to understand that we're serious mm -hmm. and you yeah. can't wait us out. I mean, if you're doing something illegal, say you have an illegal event and you make $20,000, the fine's 100 bucks. Yeah. That sounds like a cost of doing business to me. <laughs> right. Then we threaten them with the second one for 200, oh. then up to five. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not conducive to making people stop and go, mm, maybe we need to pay more attention. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thanks, George. Supervisor Wygant. Uh, George, I'm um, reacting mostly these days to uh, people resources and the availability of code and compliance to be able to do a timely um, investigation. Um, and you're familiar with one of them for sure. But over the years, another example would be once I had a couple of families that were feuding by way of uh, motorcycle usage, uh, dirt bikes, on the properties and it seemed like that devolved to the point where one family was purposefully trying to irritate the other so you know that led to a lot of things we tried to adapt to it but um, s some code violations are not time sensitive um, to speak of much so let's say somebody has some kind of structure that's not compliant like a building that's too tall or a fence that is not appropriate usually those are going to take some time anyway and then some of them are kind of in between like maybe fuel abatement during fire season that's been standing for a long time some really hot windy weather's coming up you know that that can become more time sensitive but under normal circumstances i like what you described with um you know when can you get these weeds cut down i can get to it this weekend fine you know right. people can get on their way and most people I think want to try to do the right thing uh, but some of these complaints really need somebody to be able to respond like immediately and and um, have to have the right tools 
Um, and then I agree also that the, that the uh, incentive for the penalties needs to, if it's a business-based violation, then the incentives need to be proportional to creating a disincentive for them to not comply. Right. So have you done with all of that? Have you done an analysis of your violations um, and kind of, I mean, the nine staff, um, you know, in my view, we need to have what we need to have to right. be able to do a lot of the things that we're doing today that we weren't doing 20 years ago, like um, the breweries and the wineries, not mm -hmm. to mention other things. Uh, so we, I think we want to have those amenities. I think we want to stimulate those amenities, but we also want to make sure that they run and operate properly and conscientiously. So um, have you done, uh, you know, that kind of uh, resource allocation analysis to try to determine what kind of group would you maybe need 24 seven as compared to ones that can backfill, obviously stay busy 40 hours a week. Mm -hmm. But you know, maybe some people work on Saturday and Sunday also, because I would be very interested in that. Yeah, that is one of the things that, that we were hoping to have a discussion about and see if the board was interested in. And those are part of the things that we'd like to come back with analysis to find out. Do we need people working on the weekends and things? My sense is, my sense is at this point, I'm not sure that we need people working on the weekends on a regular basis. I think what we need to do is set a standard where we send people out on the weekends, like we've been doing. And the only reason it's kind of a problem at this point is staff fatigue. I mean, I essentially I have three officers. And um, I think once you set the bar that it's like, no, this is not an acceptable way to behave in this county, I think it will stop. And I, I, I mean, you could do it both ways. I think the most efficient way is to start with a little bit of overtime raise the bar a little bit and see what happens. And then if we need to, then we can put people on seven days a week. Well, personally going in, I'm happy to hear public comments, et cetera, but uh, I think going in, we actually need to have some resources that are sort of on demand during these potential peak peak hours. Because a couple of things typically happen. One is people go out uh, from code and they find out that actually the, the operation is functioning in compliance with our law. So then, you know, the board might want to ponder, do we need to change our thresholds or do we just need to actually express to neighbors that, well, you know, it is compliant and the board actually does want to have some of this within reason, but it's adaptive management, which we're right. going to have to be doing. So other than that, I'd, I'd say um, I strongly support our culture and history of having a complaint-oriented process. I, I don't want people driving around looking for problems Right. From the county looking for problems with the public. If somebody lives, I once lived next to a guy who collected Nashes and he had three or four of them and I think they can have two and I, you know, I just didn't care. Right. <clears throat> so if it's not a problem for me or anybody else, then I don't think it should, the county should decide to make it a problem. But um, I'll, I'll just, those are my comments at this time. Absolutely. <laughs> and I agree with you on the complaint driven issue. I think that it's, it's more than adequate if we can react in an appropriate amount of time and aggressively enough to, to get compliance. And also, we're happy to, uh, happy to look into when we come back about having resources available 24-7. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, 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 that's great. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. The, mm -hmm. I live next to a winery that's mm -hmm. one of our biggest wineries, might currently be our biggest winery. And, you know, it's just, I have never, uh, experienced a problem with that winery. I mean, there are times when I kind of think I can hear something from them. Our houses aren't very close to each mm -hmm. other, but but I'm out in the field enough during peak times that um, I've actually had to stop and listen to figure out what right. the strange noise was. And oh, they're having a Cinco de Mayo situation or something. Yeah. But it, but I, I don't care. It's because it's Gen not a, generally a farm breweries and wiring, wineries. The problems are either noise or people parking on the street. Right. Those are the two problems. Other than that, we really don't have very many problems with wineries and yeah. farm breweries. Thanks. Yep. Hey, Supervisor Jones. Yes, hi George, thank you hi. for all of that. Um, last weekend, I went to the South Placer Fire District for a presentation on their benefits assessment issue. And while there, um, one of the local um, constituents um, stood up and made her own little presentation 
on hazardous vegetation abatement. And she explained to me a process, and I wasn't sure if this is accurate or how it actually works. Okay. But she said that people, if there's an issue with somebody having, you know, like one of your pictures here where weeds are growing up as high as the roof, they fill out a complaint form to the county. Mm -hmm. And then the county gives that to <clears throat> the fire district to go out and verify or assess the situation. The fire district says they have 45 days to get back to you. Is that? So what happens is some of the fire districts do not want the county operating within their district. South Placer, Meadow Vista, Tahoe fire departments, they want to do their own abatement processes. So, and I'm not familiar with how they exactly do those inside internally. I get the impression that they're very different. Mm -hmm. So what will happen is if they can't get compliance, then if they do certain things, like they've tried to contact them and done due diligence, we give them a form that says, here's what you need to do before you give it to us. If they do those things and give it to us, then we will go out and try to gain compliance. Our success rate that way has been um, very high. The uh, local fire departments seem not to be much into the investigation aspect of it. And so when we give it to our hazardous vegetation guy, he generally runs down the person in an hour or two and usually gets compliance where they've kind of messed around with it for months. So very successful. So you're saying it's better to keep it with the county and not pass it off to the fire districts, in your opinion, just in your opinion? Uh, I would say we have a better track record. Okay. I yes. wouldn't, I wouldn't say that we should take over someone else's turf, but I would say we definitely have a better track right. record. I guess I'm just thinking about it. Would it be a value to reduce your workload if there was something that they could take over and, and let them do the fining and they, they make, you know, they recover if they have to go out and do the weed abatement themselves, they can give them the bill and all that action goes on there and they make the money off of that. It just as a matter of taking a workload off of mm -hmm. our code compliance, yeah, that would certainly that could certainly work. My experience tells you that most of the fire districts don't have the manpower, don't have the time, and aren't that interested. And we are much more of not I don't normally say this about the county, but we are much more effective and much more timely in our enforcement on, on hazardous vegetation. Okay. Well I'm gonna I'm gonna use your judgment because you know more about it than I do. Um, so then the other thing that I was, um, just a second, let me find it, is you have a lot of, you have had a pretty big backload of cases, uh -huh. and a couple of, of your problem children lie within my district. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> that we can't seem to solve. Right. So if we, if we get you more manpower, do you think, would that be helpful to solving it? I do think, I think what would happen is we could be, like I was saying earlier, we could react much more quickly and much more aggressively. Um, if you have enough officers, you could send someone there daily on their trip. Uh, when I said it could take 20 or 30 hours of an officer, when you have like what I call like the crisis complaint going on in a neighborhood where people are like, oh my God, it needs to stop now, blah, blah, blah. And you start getting phone calls from the neighbors, you start getting phone calls from the domes. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it's like, you don't have an option. You have to shuffle everything over to the side mm -hmm. and you have to deal with that issue. Mm -hmm. so those, those happen on a fairly regular basis. Um, yes, I think if we had more manpower, and when I said nine, I used my father's recommendation to ask for the amount that you're embarrassed to ask for. And then, <laughs> and then stop. But um, we'll come back with a much firmer number with okay. what we think we need with regard to manpower. But um, yeah, I think with more manpower, we could definitely manage and facilitate these situations much more effectively and quickly. Right, right. Well, I say dream big or go home. Right. <laughs> but there is one other thing I want to ask you about is, um, I don't know if you already have something like this, but I have to put it in my own terms because mm -hmm. I don't know what you would call it. It's like a customer contact software. 
where you have this program in, in the computer mm -hmm. and everyone in your department can see it from your administrative people and they probably deal more with it and your code compliance officer mm -hmm. so that when you get a complaint here's your contact this is the person and there's steps all along the way that your people can put in information this is what we've done for instance you know I have this the old the Eddie Murphy mansion up in the mm -hmm. hill that these people are constantly having big huge raves and concerts mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff so part of that issue that came about for us was do they have a permit or a license they have first have a license yes. to do business then do mm -hmm. they have a permit to have a big event like this so I mean those are other things now you have to go outside of your department to find those things out well licensing permitting blah, blah. we have a seller have you heard it's, it's a software program where um, you should be able to find all the land use entitlements that have been issued. There should be notes. The code compliance module of a seller, we use that and keep hard copies. However, the code compliance module is locked. You have to have, you have to be a code compliance officer or someone who needs access to it. But code compliance officers can go outside of that module and search everything that, that um, okay. should be available. So we do have it. Uh -huh. um, so what's the issue? Everybody needs their own little iPad or laptop, something that they can take with them out on. They have like, it. They have it. That's what I was saying. So they don't have to come into the office. No, that's what I was saying. A co-compliance officer, if we can get enough staff in the office to talk to people and coordinate things and push the work out in a timely fashion, officers can become much, much more efficient because they basically are a rolling office. They have cell phones, they have computers, they look like tough books, that they can do everything there. They can enter their stuff into a cella. They can do all that sort of thing. And, and be in the office very, very little time. Is there anything else we can do to support you on that? Do you have any needs for that? Any needs to improve it, increase it? Uh, we'll go back and look at that. I think that part is actually working well. Like I said, the problem is, is that the officers tend to be in the office more than they would normally need to doing, you know, just housekeeping. Where if we had the, in, the technicians and secretarial help, they wouldn't need to do that. Okay, that, that's about it. Thank you, George. Thank you. Supervisor Gore. Thank you, thank you, George. Um, I'm certainly supportive of boosting our code compliance, especially as our county is growing and we have lots of folks coming in from other areas that actually expect um, sort of quicker customer service when it comes to local government and complaints that they might have with neighbors. So certainly supportive, but I, I now hear that the proposed fines are similar to the short-term rental fines. Those right. are the same. Um, and so a couple of questions in regards to that, right? There are some that are, and the reason we did the short-term rentals, I mean, major problems, and we wanted to address those major problems very quickly. Absolutely. And you gave us a list of maybe five priority um, areas mm -hmm. of the violations. And so those higher priority violations might certainly warrant a higher level of a, of a violation, mm -hmm. but a, a sign violation or something that's much lower end, I don't know if it warrants such a high fee. Um, and I didn't know um, what the gradation or comparisons of fees to other areas. That would okay. be helpful to know, you know, what is a local county do? What does the city do? Well, I would tell you, I got, I got your email yeah. right last night. So I quickly scrambled this morning to see if I could see what other people's fines are. Um, what I was able to find out is Roseville and Rockland have very similar fine structures to what we have. 100, 200, 500. I think Roseville's 100, 250, 500. But when we contacted them, they were extremely excited to hear that we were looking at moving our fees up and their immediate reaction was, if you are successful, please let us know because we will probably try to follow in your footsteps. Um, I think we could write our fine policy in such a way that it could be the first violation up to $1,500, second violation up to $3,000, which would give the administrative hearing officer the option, for instance, if it, if it wasn't really a big deal, they could find them a lesser amount. You could also tier it, you know, if you're a priority one, you know, you could be fined up to 5,000. That seems like that might be the most complex way to do it because 
it's objective on staff's part how those things are prioritized. I think I'm, I'm much more comfortable with writing it in such a way that <clears throat> when the hearing officer finds out, the administrative hearing officer finds out, okay, it was a sign you balked for 10 days or 15 days, but then you took it down and we cited you for that and that's what got you to take it down. Well, maybe it doesn't warrant $1,500. Maybe it warrants like 250 or 500 but it would be at their discretion. I appreciate that. Um, and I know it's difficult to have a different tier for everything, right? That's right. challenging. But some of these lower items, it's like, really, come on, $1,500. And if somebody does comply right away, or you know, they get the violation, they comply, there might be an opportunity for some discretion. I don't know what my colleagues think, but I, mean, I certainly see that if we, um, if we actually address this we're going to get some compliance we have let we'll have fewer complaints right because mm -hmm. you don't have the same neighbor calling over and over and right. over again uh, so I, well, I just i i i'm concerned about those higher fees for right. those um lesser infractions right and they do so, have an opportunity to correct before they receive yeah. the fine and we are not so for like a sandwich board sign you warn them they take it down we don't fine for that so you know I mean on, honestly at the staffing levels that I have the sandwich board is probably not going to get looked at honestly so that's then, the we should, it's have, not, then we shouldn't have a rule about them right yeah I, I mean it's, it's kind of like it's like we just don't have the staffing so we usually get to all the threes and some of the abandoned vehicles and all the ones and twos and, and maybe discretion for the yeah. officer would be appropriate. I think that that might be appropriate. Yeah. Um, Y'all, it's just a suggestion. Yeah, yeah. And then I, following up on that, um, one thought I had, uh, some jurisdictions I know do daily fines if people really get egregious so that it really starts to accrue because otherwise we have to, keep, somebody has to keep calling and complaining, correct? No. After I, the I would... third, I would tell you that if, if you were like, let's say you're running an illegal event center. Well, that I want to get into that in a minute. Say okay. it's a, um, a structure that you've illegally constructed mm -hmm. uh, or a, a, a fan, what I don't know, mm -hmm. something that was I, done without permits. I'm unaware of people who do it on a daily thing. My understanding of the way it usually happens is you'll go out and you'll be like, look, you have 20 days or 30 days to tear this down because that's a reasonable amount of time you come out on day 29 they've done nothing you would cite them you'd be like i'm going to be back in three days i need to see substantial progress on this being removed if it's if it's not removed you set them a second time and that's so, the way you so would go let me ahead ask you if the if the structure or the improvement is worth more than five thousand mm -hmm. dollars and the maximum we're going to then we've cited them we lean their property I guess in the leaning process, there's uh, penalties and interest that accrue before we lean. I'm just saying, if uh, if the improvement is a forty thousand dollar improvement, maybe that's also a cost. Then I, I think you would move. I don't to think you can lean on penalties and, and fines only on that. The, administrative. Yeah, on the, yeah. Okay. I think I th I think you would move on if something if if you could tell that the fine wasn't going to be enough like you had an illegal oh. structure that was worth much more than that, I think you'd move directly to an abatement process, okay. which takes about 90 days. And the abatement process, you basically tell the people, you have 30 days to remove it. If you don't, then we go for a notice of nuisance abatement. And then 30 days after that, we can actually go on your property and take it down. Okay. Um, and then going back to the, the, the events, because we've heard a lot um, mm -hmm. both through um, testimony here as well as early on on some of our conditional use permits where we gave a limited number of events through planning department we put that in their conditions of approval mm -hmm. now it's up to their neighbors and it's been a pet peeve of me to keep track of those events mm -hmm. because none of and nobody can file a complaint till the 12th event now we're taking their word for it that this event center had more than 12 events or 90 events or 59 events was the one I remember the most mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and and so we're not tracking that with additional administrative support could you start to track these items and make them submit their list of special events 
so that they could be visible to the neighbors and we would know here are the 12 events they're going to have this year here are the times they're doing that and it can be visible to the neighbors and the public is that something that the administrative I, mean, I guess what i would say is you just have all the planning services first uh <laughs> but you know we those projects would have to be conditioned as such to post those events so i mean if they were conditioned then i think we could it could fall on code compliance mm -hmm. and have you know from an administrative process track those events i, I do have thoughts on that i know that um we went life. through it with the trap club too right right and doing yeah, my do. research it, it normally doesn't fall to code compliance i'm going to put yeah. my planner hat on for a second yeah. a lot of times the planning department who entitled the property will monitor it i know like in sonoma county they actually have a computer program that has each event center listed that can have an amount of events and they have to go in before that event and say i'm having that event so anyone can look code compliance can look planning can look neighbors can look neighbors yep. can look board of supervisors can look and see mm -hmm. where they're at it's very good it's kind of a self-service thing it's like jesus aren't they past their 12 events yet and it's like okay this is the 12th one yeah so that's how sonoma county deals with it they also do it in such a way to try to alleviate gridlock mm -hmm. so if someone goes in and says oh i'm going to do this event first and then there's three more people on that street it's like oops someone better hurry because only one more person gets to do an event that weekend right so they use it that they use the tool that way too to alleviate some of the um issues associated with too many event centers or wineries or things on in, in one area yeah since we're getting we're growing in the numbers of wineries and breweries mm -hmm. and and these sorts of issues we might need to emulate some of our yeah sister and brother counties that have been in the business longer than we have and maybe have had more experience with yeah we can situation. certainly uh we can certainly contact sonoma county and ask what software i hope it's not proprietary yeah i hope they didn't make it themselves <laughs> but um work with us. yeah my favorite supervisor gore in sonoma county is my buddy so <laughs> Yeah, really I, I think that's one that I've heard consistently. I think yeah. from the very, you know, because it started with, as you know, the Trap Club, and then uh -huh. it was Newcastle Wedding Garden. Right. It was a number of those events right when I joined the board that I was like, wow, who, how could you possibly begin to track 59 events? Or I really do think if you yeah. want to learn what to do, Sonoma. Yeah. Because I, I've talked to Sonoma County before, and they've had the exact same problems that we're having and the growing pains, and they've already figured out what to do. And I think it's simply we could just look at what they have and maybe copy what they have. Yeah. Well, you know, it's really unfortunate that we, you know, that we're, that we as a society are so um, not kind to our neighbors <laughs> and that we need to escalate with code enforcement in order to get people to be good neighbors. But unfortunately, that's where we're at and we need to. I support the larger fines because uh, with, you know, unless we see egregious actions by somebody, uh, I, I think you need the teeth to make people take it seriously, right. that we're not messing around. Plus, just our time of sending people out to remote locations to check on them. I mean, $1,500 doesn't go far in salaries and, and benefits and time spent going out to, to look at those sites and, right. and check on those things. Right. So I, right. I definitely support it. And then... I know uh, both Supervisor Holmes and I have had one where somebody's just having parties in their house. They're not an event center. They're just having noisy parties all the time. And I don't know specifically on our noise ordinance, you know, if that one is actually. No, we can enforce that. Yeah. But we can go out in the neighborhood and we can take our sound meter. Sound gauge and see yeah. how it's transmitting and yes. what's going on. Yep. Okay. Um, Supervisor yeah, Jones. My, my only comment was that um, it's the teeth, the teeth and the pe penalties that's not working. Um, the people in my district, as George was saying, you know, they're making thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of dollars on violation, I mean, doing their activities in violation of all of our codes and everything. So if we just find them $100, even $100 a day, I mean, that's like, you know, a dollar to us. Yeah, or to me anyway. Yeah. Um, and if you don't have the teeth, just like the STRs, I was in full support of having yep. 
having penalties, you've got to have some teeth in it. And parking is, is parking is an issue like, well, with both the Eddie Murphy house, people are parking all the way up and down Auburn Folsom Road. They're parking, they're parking now in the Raley's parking lot and buses are busing them up to this event. Other cars are following other cars in and um, they're very hard to touch them because this home is behind a gate. So you can't even get on the property. The police have tried, they, they can't even get past the gate. And then with the wineries is the same thing because they were told at this point in time right now they can only have 10 cars. Then they load up the whole property with cars and their excuse is, well, what, what can we do? We can't turn them away, you know? And so if we don't have teeth in what we say, then that's what they give us back. What can we do? We can't, we can't just turn them away. Yeah. They have to. Uh, I see that. And I, I would support also what Supervisor Wygant suggested with at least initially having some weekend shifts planned into the rotation. Um, just so that we we are out there when some of these events are happening. I know we had to do that with STRs too. I mean, Monday through Friday, nine to five, isn't when most of these things occur, unfortunately. And so, right. you know, figuring that out and then using your discretion. If we're not getting, if we make headway, then maybe we don't need a constantly dedicated staff. But you're rotating shifts just to keep eyes on some of these uh, repeat offenders and issues. Yeah, there's, we could certainly look at doing um, shift, like a shift at night. We could look at having people on call who can go out. Um, I really do think, though, I think the perception of code compliance at this point is you can kind of wait us out. Mm -hmm. You can kind of, you can kind of oh, yeah. string us along a little bit. And I think if that perception changes, I think a lot of the, the issues that we see will change as well. Great. Any other comments from the board? I know we have some public here, I think, for this item. So we'll take public comment. Hi. Hi. Ooh, geez. Can I start over? I was yes. Polite. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, and welcome back. Thank you. Um, that's that's really what I have a lot uh, to say today. Is thank you to each and every one of you. Um, we found out just before we are coming up here that while we have worked with code enforcement for the last year and a half, George, I didn't know that you're George. I would have said hello sooner. I'm not sure who you are. EJ, pleased to meet you. My husband, Doug McDougall. Doug McDougall. Um, so we've patiently worked with code enforcement, documenting our neighbors' poor behavior through the complaint forms and having you guys come on our property and do the sound recordings and all that. And we now understand uh, code enforcement has really followed the procedures that George outlined today. And now we understand that we didn't understand that. We just kept being patient and, and working with you guys. So um, we also understand that um, the vineyard has received four citations as of today as a result of their um, behaviors on Mother's Day. And we really thank you for that. So we believe that code enforcement has a legitimate need for staff. And we would like to say, especially on weekends, because our neighbor events are on weekends and they are advertising them as events, we've just noticed. And um, in order to monitor it, we need either someone on call or we can't always pre proactively be guessing, will this be one? And then this other thing is um, we really encourage the level of fines to go up because we did a little back of the envelope math and when you start getting to $1,500, $2,000, it seems like it might be nipping into 5 or 10% of profit, all speculation on, on our part. So um, that's it. We have thank you. We support going forward um, what code, com code enforcement is um, suggesting. More staff, especially on weekends, didn't know it was a problem in the office. We support that. Thank you. Thank you. Do you say anything to us? I don't know how this goes. No, but thank you. Thank you <laughs> okay, for thank taking you. the time to be here. We appreciate that and sharing your 
story. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, further comments or direction to staff? Uh, I just want to say great feedback. I think this is what we were looking for. Oh, uh, I think everybody recognizes that Placer County has changed in the last, you know, 5, 10, 15 years as far as events and uh, different types of facilities, whether they're wineries, breweries, or other things going on out there that, you know, there is a need for, you know, nighttime or 20 service, 4 7 code compliance services, and we just have to figure out how to make that work from a staffing level. So uh, I'm happy to hear that. The fines, we did want to get some feedback on that. The, the level of fines, your idea, George heard that from me uh, not too long ago uh, regarding the priorities and tiering it and how we do it. So we may put together some options of different ways we could assess fines, but you know, knowing that the board is uh, you know, engaged in applying something that's gonna make a difference, uh, I think that gives us the direction that we need. So uh, other than that, George, any other feedback? I, I don't go anywhere idea. I missed our zoom callers so we have a couple more public comments uh, that Perfect. so pause wait and we'll see what else comes up caller can you go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments Caller, can you unmute your mic and give your comments? Your hand is up. We can see your hand up. I wouldn't hesitate. I will hesitate to try to pronounce the name that we see on the screen. <laughs> yes. We'll move to the next caller and see. Okay. Cheryl, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Hi, thank you. Cheryl Bergama. Um, I live in Granite Bay. I, I would like to kind of uh, put out there that um, in the corporate world, whenever you ship a product, you line up support first. So you don't just throw, for example, an Apple iPhone out there and then go figure out if you have support people. The same should be true, in my opinion, with um, any ordinance that you have. So as uh, Supervisor Wagan said, um, you have new businesses such as the winery ordinance. When you use, um, when you open the floodgates to winery ordinances, there should be some projection of how much staff will be needed to support this new ordinance. Um, that didn't doesn't seem to happen. I haven't seen it, and the, the fact that we have to ask the question after the fact, and we need all of a sudden nine people, and we can't really quantify what we need those nine people for in terms of what is the weight for wineries, what is the weight for events, what is the weight for different types of um, call rates that you get in. It, it would seem that before you sign an ordinance that you would know that, um, and that would include like trees. We, we've had uh, recently with Rancho Del Oro, we have um, not enough code enforcement. They admitted there wasn't enough code enforcement. So rather than keep signing ordinances in place, it would seem like there every time you ship something, you would have a, a tax on code enforcement to say, we need X number of people if, if we want to sign this off or we can't support it. So that, that would seem obvious. The other thing is there doesn't seem to be a feedback mechanism, any loop from um, complaints to code enforcement and all the way up to the Board of Supervisors. So by that, when, when you get, um, the recent one was Bayside, you had a room full of people complaining that they've made complaint after complaint for years, and while well, they're not complaining to code enforcement. Well, whose job is that? It's like, do people know in the, in the real world that, oh, it's a certain number you have to call? They call the Sheriff's Department. And so it would seem like, there would be a way to close the feedback loop from the sheriff's department to code enforcement to the board of supervisors so that people know that these are real problems it's not the consumer's fault that they don't know what number to call so it would seem like those loops are broken they need to there needs to be some mechanism put in place where 
um, where the right hand is talking to the left, and, I, and that seems sorely lacking by the number of complaints okay. that are out there. Um, I, would, I would mention that Jim Holmes one time said that he would give his phone number out to be support. Well, the public's not going to know that number either. So I think, I think that those two mechanisms, just planning for support and closing that feedback loop would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. We have no it, other callers. Our other caller has dropped. Okay, I'm sorry, EJ. So I think you concluded your remarks. I, I did. I just said last, I just wanted to actually thank our code compliance officers. You are out there in the fields in probably what are not the most pleasant uh, or safest conditions. So, you know, with the high volume of work that they do do, I just want to give thanks to them because uh, they're the boots on the ground. So. Great. I, I would echo that too. Bonnie, did you have a... Yeah, just one point. And I appreciate Ms. Berkema's comment about sort of that loop with who is complaining to whom, right? So if the sheriff's office is getting the complaints, uh, is there a mechanism to for them and them to know to um, contact code, um, code enforcement or the sheriff's office letting these residents know who to contact? I think that's really important because a lot of times people think that they're they don't really know, know who to contact. And so maybe there's an opportunity to work with yeah, some of those could, entities. <clears throat> we certainly work on that, um, especially since because in our noise ordinance, the sheriff's office is a first responder with regard to a noise complaint. So um, if if the deputies knew that like, okay, I've, I've had a complaint about Bayside three times this week, here's right. where you need to make it go to this web page and fill out a complaint. That would be very helpful because yeah. it'll allow us to actually have a much better understanding. You know, if somebody is complaining about a, um, a location and you all don't hear about it, but they've been complaining to a different entity for quite a while, then there's just a disconnect and frustration with those residents who didn't know what the process was. Mm -hmm. Okay, Supervisor Wygant? Yeah, just uh, one closing additional thought. One, I think you've heard broad-based board support for additional resources, and in that vein, and the budgetary impacts, I think it was smart to, in that we have a flexible and changing landscape. So, for example, when I got here, there was no winery ordinance, and now, of course, there is, and there are going to be different things in the future that we're going to need to adapt to. But I think we need, one, additional resources. Exactly what those are, I'm not sure we know. So I would recommend maybe working in concert with the county exec's office so that we can right size the budget and at least get started. But I think minimally it includes um, having some 24-7 resources right. one way or another in light of, again, the range of different kinds of code viol violation issues we have to right. deal with. Um, and we'll probably have to adapt uh, to that even in the beginning just to make sure we size it properly and then over time know that there are going to be things that we haven't anticipated that will occur that will need to change. Sure. Wait, um, go ahead, Supervisor Jones. And then I just Jane wanted to, to add on to what Bonnie was saying. We had that issue at our, um, at our MAC meeting when we were hearing uh, the Bayside fields. And of course, we had many people coming and complaining about um, the noise violations and the things that, that have been going on and calling them bad neighbors. And so when we get to the, to the root of the cause, what happened is when it was loud noise going on until 11 or 12 o'clock at night, people would call the sheriff. And the sheriff would come and he would shut them down. But what they didn't know was they should follow up with a complaint to code compliance. So when we found that out, it was like they were saying, we made all these complaints and, and we went to George and it's like, well, we don't have any on file, you know, or had very few on file. Yeah. And so um, we tried to educate our folks that please, the sheriff are going to respond, right? And then right after that, let's say they get a call to something else more important. They're not going to think about, oh, I should contact the county and tell them, you know? So, I mean, I don't know if you guys have enough hours in the day to call the sheriff and, you know, ask if they've had complaints that you could just log in. I think that's a lot to ask of you. Whereas we're trying to re-educate our constituents to please at least make a formal complaint to the county so we have something to follow up with and and create a history of whatever conduct is going on we we definitely contact the sheriff's office i have some plus i've we been can dealing find with them, some, right what <laughs> plus we can find them. yeah yeah so um we will contact the sheriff's department and ask um if 
there's anything that we can do to, to coordinate better. Thank you. And then I know Jane wanted to make a couple of comments. Certainly. I would, I would only add um, kudos to EJ and to George, who took over this function some time ago from another division and have been doing quite a lot to clean up the backlog of code compliance issues. But I think we recognize quite clearly, especially in light of your comments here today, that we do need to adapt our code compliance service model for evolving county needs. Uh, I know we put together some information not too long ago on how to proactively address quality of life concerns in urban areas. And with the 2020 census data, we know that service level expectations are becoming more urban, which necessitates a different code staffing model. So we look forward to bringing that back to you. Great, thank you. Appreciate it, appreciate all your efforts and patience uh, with us as we try to juggle our constituents' concerns that we hear from at odd hours, all times of days and nights, correct? <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have one remaining item, am I correct? That would be our parks and open space mass, huh? Yeah, Placer County Parks and Trails master plan. And Steve, welcome. You've been in and out all day today waiting for us patiently. We're only 50 minutes late. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and members of the board. Um, you know, you all have been here all day doing all the hard work. We've been able to go in and out. So I, I appreciate your patience and appreciate the opportunity to come and visit with you today and present the uh, new parks and trails master plan to you for hopefully for adoption. Um, this has been a long time coming. I think that we're here today again to ask the board to adopt this plan. This plan is going to hopefully give us a roadmap into the future for our development of our trails and our parks as we move into the future as the county continues to grow and the population continues to demand these services. So this has been an, an exciting process for us. Um, I've come in at the tail end of it so I have to give kudos to staff and everybody who's worked on it before me and they're actually going to do the majority of the presentation. So um, with me is Andy Fisher from the Parks and Open Space um, Department and also Stephanie Grigsby from the Design Workshop who's been helping to guide us through this process for the last five and a half years. Um, this plan, as I mentioned, kind of gives us that roadmap that we've been looking for. It includes our improvements to our existing parks and trails, so it's not just all about building new things. It's also about taking our existing parks and, and increasing the level of service we have there. Um, it also gives us a roadmap for trail connectivity, which is a huge demand across the county. If you look at the, look at the uh, at least the phone calls I've had in the six weeks I've been here, um, so it gives us that, that future facilities also. Um, it's based on constituents' input and park user input. Um, it's not a request for any funding um, because you look at it; it's a 20-year plan, and w like any planning document, if it's a good planning document, it should be a living document. Because those needs, you know, when you project something out 20 years, those needs might change. The residents might want something different. Um, there might be other opportunities that come up as we go through the process. However, it does give us that guide into the future, um, and it's, that's what it's meant to be. I guess just to review the process a little bit, and this is a part that I can cover because I can read the slides. Um, <laughs> there was a huge, and I, will, I have been in parks and recreation for 30 years, it's been my, my entire career, been through a couple of master plan processes with different communities, helped with them, not gone through one personally. Um, and the amount of time and input and effort that was, was done to make this a public process really impressed me. Um, I think that when you look at the number of surveys that were completed, that tells you that the demand for the services are out there from the residents. Um, so this was, you talk about a multi-year process. It inventoried our existing parks and trails again so we can address our needs there. We had over 50 public meetings, the MAC presentations. There was over 60 focus groups and organizations um, that came in and gave us feedback. From all of that public input and all of that, that um, discussion, this plan has gone through two previous drafts and iterations where all that input was taken in. The plan was adapted and changed to try to meet the needs that the residents were, were discussing with us. And it comes to the, where our final draft is today, which is going to be presented to you um, right now. And I'm going to turn it over to Andy Fisher. Thank you, Steve, and welcome for your first presentation. <laughs>
Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm going to begin with one of the slides that I think has garnered as much excitement and intention in this process as, as any, which is the overall trail map throughout the county. And to add some observations on the process to what Steve was just talking about, I think as we began this process, I, I, you know, I think about a, a cold fall uh, board meeting up in Tahoe in late 2016 where you gave us the go ahead to enter the contract with Stephanie and Design Workshop uh, that started all of those meetings and all of those connections with focus groups. And we began talking about service levels. That's how our general plan today talks about parks and rec service levels, how many acres of parks per capita, how many miles of trail per capita. And so we began talking about those things and people, they kind of their eyes rolled back in their head and they're important metrics for us. But when we talked in public about those kind of things, what we hear back from people is not, they don't think of them things in service levels. They want a pickleball court in their park. They want the trail to connect from here to there. And so really, um, as much as anything, I think what we did is compile a lot of work that had already been done and, and listened to what people had said and really reinforced a lot of what had already been in regional plans and community plans and what people had already been talking about and raising money for. And, and even a lot of the projects that are in our capital improvement plan uh, have been uh, given momentum by your board through funding, through environmental review and things like that. Uh, you might just say literally, we just connected the dots. Uh, we've had community plans for years that have had trail plans within them, but they don't talk to one another necessarily. So people in Granite Bay didn't see how their trails would connect to uh, the Forest Service lands out of, um, out of Forest Hill, or uh, people west of Lincoln and Rockland never were able to see how their uh, trails might be able to connect to regional trails around greater Sacramento metropolitan area. In the Tahoe area, you can see, and on this map, just to describe the legend, the black lines are paved trails. Uh, all of the solid lines are trails that are already there, so you can see how much work's already been done. And the, the uh, dashed lines um, are planned trails. Green and brown trails are, uh, are dirt trails. The brown trails are regional trails. You recognize those names, the Western States Trail, the Rubicon Trail, Pacific Crest Trail, Tahoe Rim Trail. Um, and so it really was uh, part of the goal of this plan to connect all of those, just to say how many missing gaps are there uh, within these, these uh, regional trails that people have put so much momentum into already. Uh, up in Lake Tahoe, you can see that the Placer County section of the trail all around Lake Tahoe is the most developed portion of all of it around Lake Tahoe to date. Um, a lot of that had to do with the foresight of Tahoe City Public Utility District and some of that under Cindy's leadership when, uh, when the chair was there. Um, looking at connecting trails into the other communities around Tahoe and that paved trail loop. Um, and I think people got very excited about seeing how all of it connected that you could actually get on a bike or a horse or walk from, from Roseville up to Tahoe and that there weren't, that there's still significant gaps, uh, but this plan could bring that all together. Some of the earlier projects within that greater vision that we've already been working on, the Resort Triangle is the name of the, the uh, project that we call the, the paved trail that, that connects all of the North Tahoe communities, Tahoe City, Kings Beach, North Star, Truckee, Olympic Valley, Alpine Meadows, all of those communities together. The Memorial Overland Immigrant Trail, a dirt trail that connects uh, Donner Memorial State Park over um, the route, basically the route of the, the Donner Party and the other early wagon routes over to Kingvale to be able to experience that. Dry Creek Greenway. Um, which I'll, I'll elaborate on in a, in a slide in just a moment. Some of the trails we've been working on just recently along Barton Road, we're just finishing a trail along Barton Road that'll allow kids uh, to be able to get off the road, not have to be on the shoulder of the road to get to school around uh, Tree Lake. Horseshoe Bar Trail connecting the Placer School out to the Folsom Lake State Rec area. And then the larger vision, probably the largest vision in this entire um, master plan is to connect a uh, trail all the way from Auburn to Kingvale or to Donner um, or to our to our trail to the Memorial Overland Immigrant Trail which would connect the west to the east it would be an alternative to the Western States Trail and that would be the longest range vision in this plan. <clears throat> the blow up of the area in North Tahoe you can see the uh, we're working on the Martis Valley Trail which goes from the label of Truckee out to uh, North Star Drive uh, that will be paved um, probably uh, this summer. In fact, for certain, it will be paved this summer. It's under contract. They're just coming back after winter break to finish that up and pave it. We expect to be inviting you to a ribbon cutting ceremony 
on that portion of trails, very exciting uh, job between uh, Public Works, Parks, and North Star Community Service District with the help of our Congressman McClintock's office and the Corps of Engineers. A uh, multi-year project, we're in the middle of environmental review right now on the portion of trail from uh, Olympic Valley, labeled their Squaw Valley, and renamed Olympic Valley, older slide up to Truckee along the Highway 89 corridor. That's an environmental review right now. I will mention some of the comments that we did get on the plan had to do with the, the specificity of the alignment along that Highway 89 corridor. And we wanted to emphasize and we changed how that looked in our plan so that people know this master plan is not the project that will determine the alignment. We just wanted uh, to outline the corridor in there. It will be a specific project with its own public process to describe that specific alignment as it comes along. This trail, the bottom of this green arc, the American River Parkway, that uh, very well-known parkway and trail that goes from downtown Sacramento along the American River to Folsom Lake and the vision of this plan that uh, is happening before our eyes is to connect that then from Folsom Lake through Granite Bay, through the city of Roseville and out through uh, West Placer. And then the uh, Sacramento County and city have already worked on the Dry Creek Corridor that takes that back down into Sacramento. So the American River Parkway will now become a metropolitan loop. People be, get, be able to get on their bikes from Roseville, Lincoln, Rockland, all destinations within Placer County, get down onto that bikeway and, and have a paved, separated bikeway to go all the way through anywhere within the Sacramento area. Development projects in West Placer are building most of that <coughs> project through, uh, through West Placer. Um, we have been looking at funding that trail for years as developments come along. In fact, the, uh, the assessment district that you um, uh, approved an annexation for this morning is part of the funding mechanism for ongoing maintenance and operations and capital replacement of that trail as it comes forward. So we've been, we've been thinking about how to raise money for that trail. We also the Granite Bay Lighting and Landscape District that you addressed this morning would be a partial funder for the trail going through Granite Bay. So these are trails that have been in the works for years and this plan really just brought it all together. Uh, the Placer County Conservation Plan that you're so familiar with that was adopted last year. Uh, we did think about that throughout the, the PCCP process that folks who are investing in the preservation of all of that land in Northwest um, Placer County would like to be able to visit it at least on some limited scale and so we have uh, included within our plan uh, trails that will go up through that preserve area, not high density trails like Hidden Falls is today, but some access for the public to go through that area and be able to enjoy the rice fields and the beauty of that Western Placer agricultural area as the PCCP matures out and protects those lands. And some of the park projects that we have on our list. Uh, coming up in the near future, the Hidden Falls Regional Park Trails Expansion Project, which the next slide elaborates on. Dry Creek Park is a park in West Placer off Alerta Road, fully funded uh, through park development fees and assessments that, again, you, you addressed this morning. We're also adding a trailhead project to that in our, in our Tier 1 capital project list. Folks have been asking for an alternative place to park along Cook Riolo Road and so that they can get on that Dry Creek uh, trail and have alternate places to get on and off of it and shuttle back and forth and so forth. Uh, Newcastle ball field is a great example of a public pri or a, a partnership between uh, Placer County and another agency. We're working with the Newcastle Elementary School District to redevelop a sports field to meet the need of uh, youth sports within Loomis and Newcastle. We'll be coming before your board shortly for a funding package for that project. Then Ofer Creekside Park is a piece of property we own by the Lozano's Bridge in Ofer. We've done a lot of fuels management work on that property and would like to be able to develop that as kind of a passive park as well now that it's cleared out and much more fire safe. Hidden Falls Regional Park, you can see in the bottom the portion that's already there in the dark blue line. Uh, we are now fully funded um, through grants um, and general funds and park dedication fees to develop the Twilight Ride parking lot. Uh, labeled there in green that will be under construction uh, bid out this winter under construction next year we expect to be have a ribbon cutting for that project to open up in sometime in 2024 that will be exciting an alternative parking area it will open up some of the most beautiful vistas that we have within that whole Hidden Falls system today we did have an opportunity to request grant funding for that area up to the north we call the Bear River backcountry the hatched blue area 
um, and kind of said, let's, uh, let's take it in stages. Let's open up a piece at a time. Let's make sure we can manage it in phases. So that will come along later. Um, but we are excited to be able to incrementally move ahead with the expansion of Hidden Falls. And that's a project, as you know, that your board weighed in on and approved uh, last March. It was a project that was so influential, both um, formal groups formed, uh, both in opposition and in support of the project, and it did cause us to pause the entire master plan project for, for about a year while that, uh, the discussion about Hidden Falls uh, made its way through the, pro through the process and we had an outcome so that we could put that into the plan and it wasn't uncertain. Many, many of the projects that we have within our capital improvement list are not new parks. In fact, other than Hidden Falls and projects that come with private development already funded, uh, mostly in West Placer, we're not proposing new parks. We're not proposing another Hidden Falls. Uh, we're not even proposing um, within the unincorporated area other than in new subdivisions uh, any sort of new park. Most of these are within existing parks. And in fact, since we made this list, some of these projects have been done. Loomis Basin. A uh, big part of the project we envisioned there was done by converting the grass to a, to a water-saving uh, hybrid Bermuda turf. So uh, that's already in the works. Some other renovations to be done there. Griffith Quarry Park and Museum, as well as um, Sheridan Park um, and Dutch Flat Pool are being funded through Prop 68 per capita funds. Those are going on right now. There will be bid and constructed this year and next. Um, Cisco Grove Gould Park, a uh, beautiful little roadside park on the Yuba River. Uh, we do have funding in place already for um, an interpretive program up there. So just give you a flavor of some of what's already within our existing parks. As Steve said earlier, we're not just thinking about what's new, but how to improve and make better what we already have. And then partner agency projects that are very important to us. Um, we we use on an annual basis about 1% of the county's general fund uh, to maintain the 43 parks that, and beaches that we maintain. Um, and the way that we're able to, to do that uh, largely is uh, one through the assessments and special taxes that we collect in subdivisions and through partnerships with other agencies where we invest development funding into these projects like the uh, Auburn Regional Park Improvements, the 24 acre park now named the Marriott Park that you uh, helped to fund this morning, where we put development funds into those projects and the agencies take them from there and maintain them uh, in perpetuity and they have the same mission that we do for providing public recreation. Um, I also, Supervisor Holmes will mention the Marriott family. I knew them as well. We carpooled the church when I was growing up. The Marriott family also had a masonry business and, and did all the masonry work at our Applegate Park. So a little fun fact about the Marriotts. Um, Moving on, the North Tahoe uh, Active Recreation Assessment, the districts in North Tahoe, North Tahoe Public Utility District and Tahoe City Public Utility District are tearing off of our plan and doing a higher level study of some of the more expensive amenities that folks have requested up there, uh, community centers, pools, things like that, and they're doing a higher level feasibility study to see the feasibility of where those could go, what they would look like, and the population's willingness to raise funding for themselves up in that area. So that's a plan going on uh, right now, spearheaded by those two agencies. Tahoe City Cross Country Lodge, another great um, public-private partnership of a cross country ski lodge, uh, private nonprofits already gotten that project through environmental review and they're partnered with Tahoe City PUD uh, for that project up there. North Tahoe Regional Park Improvements, one of the big improvements up there, again, already complete. Your board funded, I believe, a little over $800,000 for the renovation of the, and enlargement of their artificial turf field, and that was done last year. That was probably the biggest of the improvements in that park. They'll be following up with some other smaller improvements over the next couple years. And then also the, the, uh, the Colfax Skate Parks, um, led by the city of Colfax, that your board funded uh, $75,000 for is out to bid right now. So that project is, is underway. Aspirational projects were some of the projects through the process that we heard and we said they're good ideas. Um, we just don't see the funding, we don't see the means uh, on the table today, but we do want to catalog them. Uh, we do think they are good ideas. They're within the plan and as we find funds uh, come forward or other means, for example, Applegate Park is on septic and well right now. We would need to wait until trunk lines get closer before we could put it on sewer and water, but it's a great aspirational project. If that happens, we would really like to get that park 
on sewer and water, for example, but we don't know when that's going to happen and don't control it. So that's the kind of thing that we put some of these projects on an aspirational list for until in such time that more funding and means become available, we'll continue to just kind of catalog those projects. And I did want to mention the, the big place that private development is going to be playing in our operations over the next 20 years, with particularly with the specific plans in West Placer. Um, your board approved a new agency, the Placer Vineyards Park and Recreation District, to, to manage at least the Placer Vineyards, probably more, uh, of those, of those um, subdivisions, the recreation in those areas over, over the next years. Um, most, uh, each one of those projects comes with a full park, trail, open space, development and maintenance uh, plan and operation plan. It comes with, with um, development fees for, for development and ongoing special taxes on an annual basis for ongoing um, operations, maintenance, and capital replacement. So we've been thinking about that for all of these projects coming forward. That's the, the bulk of new construction will be in those larger West Placer developments over the next 20 years. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Stephanie to talk more about some of the big ideas and principles that came out of the plan. Thanks, Andy. Hi, Stephanie. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, Supervisor Gustafson. It's great to be here this afternoon. And as Steve mentioned, as part of a master plan, a piece of it is to you know, really serve as a guidebook or a roadmap for the county and the department. So in addition to those wonderful projects that Andy described, there's a series of 10 principles, or what we could call those objectives, that really are set forth that, uh, along with some nested strategies that the department can move forward to also um, continue to advance the, the parks, trails, and open space system. Those 10 principles are organized into these four categories. So the first category is really parks, open space, and beaches. The series of strategies and objectives within those categories are about allowing flexibility to respond to needs. Andy spoke a little bit about the service levels. Uh, you know, five acres of park per uh, thousand residents, but thinking about flexibility to respond to needs based on you know the different demographics within the county and then also the different geographics within the county it's a very large county so being able to have the flexibility to you know adapt that mix a little bit to be able to respond specifically to the different needs and different communities nested within the county Within the connect people to nature and open space, that's really about looking at opportunities to enhance some of the trailhead access pieces and then set, really categorizing open space so you can understand what the objectives are for each of those open space categories that the county owns, you know, a range of different properties that really serve uh, different, different needs in that realm. And then supporting recreation access to Lake Tahoe, uh, really looking at the county's role to be able to support different strategies for recreation access that really tier off of alternative transportation modes, looking at the active transportation system, trail system to allow people to be able to get to the beach without necessarily having to be in a car and then being able to support some of the, the partner agency projects within that area. Within the trails category, um, Andy talked about this quite a bit, but really that desire to create a connected trail system, we heard really early on within the process that trail connectivity was a priority need. Over 90% of the respondents of the survey that was uh, 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 started in 2017 said that they at, uh, either walk or bike on a regular basis and you can imagine that over time that has only increased today um, so really the importance of being able to provide that connectivity within programming mapping and communications one of the things that we found was that a lot of people didn't really recognize what the county had to offer there's a lot of confusion about you know where is the park where are the trails and then is it a county facility or is it a partner agency facility? So, you know, a suite of objectives and strategies about how you might be able to advance and um, improve the, how you communicate your offerings, um, wayfinding signage, digital uh, opportunities, and then thinking about how you can activate public spaces as well to be able to, again, help people make that connection between the great resources that you're providing and, and parks within their uh, daily life. And then a series of strategies about funding and maintenance, um, advancing partnerships, that's a, a very key piece within the county, maintaining what you have, maintaining those facilities and being able to provide the funding um, to be able to uh, achieve the level of service for maintenance that you are looking for. 
uh, opportunity to leverage funding, you know, private development and the, the new projects coming on through development is a, is a great source, but are there also other opportunities to be able to leverage funds through partnerships and other alternative uh, financing measures, and then to measure and track performance. And this is really about uh, moving forward as, as the plan um, and really recognizing that you know with data, you can be able to ha make better decisions. So continually understanding what are those needs and how are you meeting them? And then being able to set a level of standard for the department to uh, meet accreditation standards. So the national uh, uh, NRPA, the National Recreation and Park uh, uh, Association uh, actually has a CAPRA um, accreditation that the plan looks forward to being able to, because of you have a plan in place that you can meet um, that, that requirement and then be able to really dive into some of the details with some of that data and offerings. A little bit more about activating public spaces. As I mentioned, this is really about connecting people to your parks and open spaces and trails and helping them to make those, forge those uh, relationship with the outdoors and connections uh, within the lands that you offer. And when we, when we talk about partnering and being able to activate or think about programming, we're not really thinking about doing something, um, the traditional programming that cities and, and some other districts do. We don't want to duplicate those types of activities. We want to be able to, you know, think about how we can augment and really have a niche uh, within Placer County that really helps people, again, connect to the, the land. So are there opportunities for, that the lands can uh, have to be able to provide nature and environmental education or that your, your partner agencies and organizations use your facilities to provide those, those types of programming. You know, safety classes, hiking, um, trail racing, uh, astronomy, uh, you know, astronomy programs, so, so many different options that you can really think about. And finally, um, to end, uh, one of the important pieces of the plan was to really, again, as part of this guiding uh, tool to be able to Relook at the mission and vision so you can see the transition from the current mission, which is really tactical and uh, very day to day oriented, to pull up a little bit and think about you know what do we want to achieve, who do we want to be as a department, and then how do we get there. So, that vision in terms of what is that destination, what does the department want to be, that you want to be a leader in providing memorable outdoor experiences for generations to come, and that how do you get there? That mission is that on a day to day basis that the department and you know, the staff is really engaged in enriching lives by connecting people to the outdoor recreation and enhancing access to your natural resources. So it, it has been a real pleasure to be able to work with Andy and the department and all of the partners that participated and hearing people uh, and they're you know, coming out to the meetings and being able to participate and look forward to this moving forward. Thanks, Stephanie. All right, I'm going to wrap it up, but just as a side note to Stephanie, she doesn't know this, but just the other day I actually pulled up the CAPR standards and was looking at them and thinking about, you know, where we could fit in with, with those standards because it is a very, um, if you have not seen them, they're very excellent standards. They're put out by the National Rec Parks and Recreation Association, um, and it is, it is a map to building an outstanding department. Um, it's not easy to get the accreditation, but the standards are very high, and once you've, once you've reached that level, um, you know you're you're really serving your residents and your constituents very well so um, it was just, I didn't know that was part of the plan so um, just kind of in conclusion what we're asking for today and recommending to you is that we the board your board adopt the parks and trails uh, master plan we feel that this is going to give us a framework for our capital planning um, based on our five and a half year as a public input and process that happened um, this is going to will also the master plan itself will inform uh, future general plan and community plan updates throughout the county. Um, it'll also give the parks and open space department. I'm going to say it again, and I'll, I'll keep hitting this. It's going to give us a roadmap, um, and that roadmap includes maintaining and improving our existing parks and trails, as Andy mentioned. Um, it's our new parks, potential new parks and trail connectivity, and not just how to build them, but also how to fund them, and that's been addressed, I think, especially in West Placer. With the, uh, with the new developments and the agreements in place. It'll assist us with identifying and advocating for alternative funding sources. One of the things a master plan gives you when you go for grants and you go to people and talk to them is you can say, we do have a plan, here it is. Um, and that does help. It does help show that you had the forethought and the, you, know, you, you went through the process to get to the point where you're ready to move forward with some of these things. And then, as Stephanie mentioned, the, the principles to guide our future department growth and our public outreach. And that is something that, that we really need to get 
in the forefront as we move forward is reaching out to our public, our constituents and residents, and let them know what services we'll be offering and what we, we already do offer. Um, and continue to engage them. As I said, any planning document should be a living document, at least in my opinion. Um, and this, this plan should be a living document. We need to keep listening to our constituents and our residents as we move forward into the process. With that being said, I'm going to wrap it up and ask if you all have any questions. Thank you, Steve, Stephanie, and Andy for the presentation. Are there questions or comments? Yes, Supervisor Holmes. Yes, thank you, Chair. Wow, we're finally here. <laughs> uh, Andy, I just want to thank you and Stephanie for your team and the, the diligent work you put over um, uh, these last few years. Uh, and it all came together. I mean, it's just uh, unbelievable. I can't tell you how many different people have called me and say they wanted this or they want some kind of a trail here or a park amenity. And now we have a plan. And so now I can say, there's the plan. Take a look at it. So I'm really, really pleased that we're here at this, and you're lucky that you came in and get to implement this. Uh, so we're looking for big things from you. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm full support of this, and I just want to thank you again for uh, the great work. And I'm excited about uh, hitting some of those trails. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Gore. Thank you, thank you for the plan and I know all of the hard work. Um, something that really struck me as you were going through the presentation, which I really hadn't seen, and it's one of the big ideas, but I think it's something of real value and that's activating the public spaces. You know, I, I grew up in a, a city where we had, you know, regular parks and rec classes, tumbling and different things, which is great. But I also grew up in an area that was unincorporated and we had hiking classes and we had areas where groups of kids could go out in nature um, and we've got these open spaces we've got ag lands we've got these trails and the idea of having programs and partnering with groups to take our young people um, outside of the cities and get further into nature um, i just think is so valuable and so when i saw that i, I was that's something I really want to see happen in the future um, because it's not something that cities are equipped to do but we've got this space um, and, and an opportunity to introduce young people um, to things they may not have an opportunity to experience. Yes I, I think um, actually it, and again this was done before we gone through the master before I got really involved with the master plan process but I already have a kind of a staff working group for that public outreach piece I, piece I talked about and that community education is part of that. So identifying, you know, different partner agencies that we could work with to, to take care of that programming, whether it was talking about, um, I'll use an example, uh, the, the rice paddies down in the um, west part of the county. Um, when, I, when I flew in from Louisiana, there's rice paddies everywhere, right? It's rice in the rice one part of the year and craw, crawfish the other part of the year. Um, but I had no idea that rice was grown in California. Um, and there's probably kids here in Placer County who don't know that rice is grown in, in California. Well, there's opportunities for us to work with different agencies, whether it's ag or someone else, um, to, you know, disseminate that information. That's, and that's exciting times. And, and we're kind of uniquely positioned right now to be able to really start building that process as we move forward. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. Supervisor Wygant. Yeah, just again, I thanked you before, but publicly I want to thank Stephanie and Andy and welcome you to, uh, it's been it's great work, taking a lot of time with some controversy for sure, and I think we've learned a lot, but I think in the almost 28 years that I've been around, <clears throat> excuse me, this, this function, parks has evolved probably as much as anything and in a very positive manner, so the key was again to thank you for all of that. Um, but as we go forward, um, I like what seems to be the attitude of just keeping your sights way open and at the highest possible uh, vision. Um, things like, you, we talked about the Nigiri project and um, maybe touring farms, and I mentioned to all of you that about seven years ago I had a chance to go to Britain and I hiked on the South Coast Trail, uh, and big sections, after coming off of the controversy with the Hidden Falls expansion, um, it was striking to me that I was hiking on sections of trail where there were signs publicly dedicating easements across working farms. So there was connectivity to this trail, which I think is like 700 miles long in total. So I think those kinds of opportunities over time will actually exist here also. And maybe they start with um, tours out on farms to 
hike down to places like Dodu Ravine or Auburn Ravine or Raccoon Creek to watch salmon spawning in the fall of the year, which occurs throughout the county. Uh, and or talked about uh, PCCP types of opportunities where all of those acquisitions will be done for regulatory purposes, so they'll be very controlled, but there certainly will be opportunities for docent-led uh, activities as well as maybe trails on the periphery that connect the trail system from the valley floor into the foothills, which would be a unique uh, and special opportunity. So again, thanks. Uh, it's been great to see this come together. Very supportive and uh, keep setting our sights high. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Jones. Yes, um, thank you for that presentation, Andy. I want to welcome you aboard, and I know we, we briefed the other day together and let you see some of the insights of little tiny Granite Bay and how we have kind of a big voice. And Andy's been especially receptive. We have a, a subcommittee now of our MAC that uh, deals with trails mostly right now, but of course parks and open spaces are very important to my community. And Andy has given them the ears with which to work with him and I think in the end we're going to have the great the connectivity my people want to be able to connect you know to the commercial places they want to be able to ride their bikes to go have lunch ride their bikes have a cup of coffee that kind of thing get get out of their cars and I'm I see Andy's vision is it's, it'll happen one of these days but I just want to thank you Andy and 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 thank you for for joining us we appreciate it thank you and, and I will point out again like I started um, all the hard work was done by by Andy and the current staff um, hours and hours and hours more hours than I could probably ever imagine so um, all credit goes to the, the staff absolutely and I'll, I'll just add that I wasn't up here when this started and I was on the other side participating in surveys and meetings uh, back when so um, great job and I think when we look at the all of our residents all of our visitors want that connectivity want those that that's quality of life that's what makes Placer County so special and I think why we've all chosen to live here so I think um, this master plan is really outstanding we do need to take public comment Megan do we have anybody on zoom who has waited the day out for this item Tiffany, can you unmute your mic and give your comments? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So my name is Tiffany Vanderlinden. I'm the current president of Meta Vista Trails Association and also on the board for Backcountry Horsemen uh, and for the Motherload Unit. And I was able to be a part of this whole master plan from, uh, from 2017 uh, until today. So, and I want to say thank you to Andy and all the people in, in the parks division because um, it was a learning process for me. Um, I, I have used the old community plans in doing some trail things in Meta Vista and currently working on the Bear River Canal. Um, and so, and I know how useful uh, those old community plans from 1974 and 1992 and, um, and now working with the potential new master plan is for all of our uh, trails that we are, um, you know, trying to get, uh, well, yeah, you, in, into use, I should say. So I just want to say thank you. I, it was a pleasure to be a part, part of the process. It was painstaking at, at times. Um, yeah, and I'm hopeful to meet you, Steve, uh, in, in the future. And uh, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Appreciate it and all your efforts. Cheryl, go ahead and meet your mic and give your comments. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Cheryl. Hi. Um, I, first of all, welcome uh, Steve Gayfield. I, I really appreciate your um, perspective on living document. I think it's uh, refreshing to see um, in this day and age that people are willing to um, actually treat things as the iterative and living document. I think that's really important. And I wanted to thank Andy for um, meeting with us 
um, on the uh, trails and parks and and looking at things. Um, I've lived in Granite Bay approximately 25 years. It's a driving community, which is really actually kind of sad because we have such beautiful surroundings. Um, as Supervisor Jones said, we want to be able to walk our community, and much of it is unsafe. Um, we had mentioned, I know, the on uh, Eureka Road. My daughter w couldn't even walk to school, yet we live rural. Um, it's an unsafe, yet it's a fairly um, arterial road. Um, we, we recently identified the fact that with the developments that went in, there are actually only a few easements left, and we could actually have a trail. So having that iterative approach, I think, um, and having an, a forum, like Supervisor Jones said, with the MAC subcommittees um, to actually have the public have input and do some of the legwork and homework to, to say what is it we want to um, accomplish in our community. Um, I also wanted to mention, I just received uh, <clears throat> Sacramento Area Council of Government, SACOG's um, plan for parks including um, the American River Parkway, which will connect uh, through to um, Granite Bay and beyond. Um, one of the things I was curious about was um, how that works with funding, if you're part of a, funding and scheduling, if you're part of a larger trail system and you want to connect, how does that ever happen if, um, if you're not part of a larger um, grant, if you will, for, for those types of trails. So we, we certainly are looking forward to that. And um, as with the American River Parkway, they have a world-class trail system and world-class volunteers. They've gone out and they've made it happen for decades. And I think we can do the same in our community, but it takes those first steps to um, engage the community. So we're certainly looking forward to working with Andy and Steve on that. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay, and with that, are we done with public comment? We are, no further comment. Okay, then I'd accept a motion to adopt. Supervisor Holmes made the motion. Second. Supervisor Wygant with the second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> no thank you. opposition, no abstentions, and thank you very much. Um, before we adjourn for the day, I just wanted to take a moment. Um, there's been a tragic, another tragic shooting in elementary school in Texas today. Our flags will be at half staff. Um, and I just wanted to close in memory of um, those children. And actually, there's a couple of officers that are also injured, um, 14 children, one teacher, and some officers that have been injured. So if we can close in their honor. And thank you very much. We stand adjourned.